This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Joey Barton. Joey, how are we? I'm good, mate. It's good to see you. Yeah, really good to see you, mate. Like I say, it's a mad career, great footballer. who's played with some of the world's biggest teams. A lot of controversy in your life, which we'll touch on. But all in all, man, it's good to have you on. Well, I've been watching from a distance, watching you're uh, you're, you're growing and growing and growing, mate. You're absolutely smashing it, so I'm buzzing for you. Um, and as I say, delighted to pop down and uh, have, a, have a chat with you. No, no, I appreciate that, taking the time. But like I say, man, great career, a phenomenal football player, very tough. Um, I, I think... England career, what was it, one cap? One cap, yeah. yeah 18 minutes worth, yeah. yeah. It's mad to think, especially Man City, Newcastle, like a great fucking career. It's, um, yeah, like I say, good to have L- you Lucky, on. mate, you know what I mean? Lucky, lucky to play for some some great clubs. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, played in a great era. You know, grew up, as I say, wanting to be a footballer. And then, um, you know, my first World Cup, back in remembers, Italia 90, which was incredible. And then I've just loved football ever since. Like you know, get you down a bit now with with the the way it's gone. You know, the the, the money's kind of um, changed the game a little bit. But you know, still remember being a kid on a council estate, dreaming about changing my life and being on the telly. And um, was was one of the few fortunate enough to to make it. And and um, as I say, the cherry on the top of that, James, for me was was to to play for England, even if it was for only. 18 minutes in a friendly against Spain. For those 18 minutes, I was the best centre midfielder or one of them in England. Um, and, you know, as I say, you know, you know, you can't help but be proud of that. Like, my little lad winds me up now, says, you've only got one cap. And I'm like, when I die, it says England International. Yeah. There's not many people who can say <laughs> that. Before we get into everything, though, Joey, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, from... Um, a little place outside of uh, Liverpool, about eight, eight and a half miles outside called Heighton, um, which is, you know, kind of when the slums of Liverpool were cleared in the aftermath of kind of the Second World War, all the kind of families that were in all those um, kind of densely populated areas um, were, were moved out into the um, these new council territories of kind of Knowsley, which is kind of made up of a few different boroughs, but... Um, Kind of heightens one of them. St John's is is a, is a, an estate within that, and Kirby, and you know that's kind of, as I say, where a lot of the, a lot of footballers from Liverpool, come out of those two areas. You've got um, obviously Phil Thompson and 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 some big players who've come from Kirby, and obviously Stevie Gerrard's uh, the big the biggest probably Peter Reid probably the biggest two have come from Heighton. So fortunate to grow up in a a football household in a hotbed of football in a fantastic football and city so the die was pretty much cast for me James like, like yourself mm-hmm. how was family life yeah I mean it's you know you you just know what you know as a kid don't you we you know went to the to the local school um loved playing footy in the street 
but you know when we couldn't play football it was you know two man and you know uh, hide and seek and all that um we lived at the end of a bus terminus us and and beyond that bus terminus is um an industrial estate so there was a lot of space to get into you know climbing into trees and building dens and stuff like that and when I look back at it, you know, we had a fantastic childhood. We were never in the house. Um, you were either out at school, out with your mates, climbing in, you know, trees, parks, up to no good. And as I say, because we lived at the end of a bus terminus, um, we'd worked out relatively early. If you if you waited for the buses to finish the shift and go to turn around and go into the depot and you threw uh, mud at the buses, the drivers had to clean it before they clocked off and would give you an incredible chase. Um, so we spent a lot of time. So I, am, I was so fit and had a great engine as a kid, getting chased either by the busies or bus drivers on our mm -hmm. state for being up to no good. So, you know, you don't know any difference. Only now you look back and you think, you know, there was, you know, mad stuff going on around you. But at the time, you, you thought that's how everybody lived. You know, you thought everybody got up on a Sunday morning and you couldn't have a game of footy because there was a burnt out car on the footy pitch. You thought, oh, this must be happening, um, you know, to, to every kid this age because... Um, you know, it was happened to you and your mates. What were you like at school? I was always, I was always um, switched on. I was quite fiery in terms of. Um, I, re I remember getting sent home um, from school, or or I'd run home from school. So if, if the teachers didn't listen to me or stuff like that, I would occasionally kick the classroom emergency exit open and just go home. Um, to the point where I almost got expelled off the back of it because the teachers were like, you can't just get off every time you don't agree with what's going on because that was my thing because I got quite emotional about stuff. It was either do something stupid, um, you know, throw a chair at a teacher or stuff, stuff like that, which would happen in our school. I didn't do that. And I had to channel that anger into leaving the classroom. Um, and obviously, you know, it only got to, it got to the point where my mum was like, look, they're going to expel you from the school because... They, they, they can't account for your safety because like the third time you've you, you've left the classroom and, and this was before the age of, this is still in junior school, so this is before the age of kind of 10, 11. Um, and as I say, my grandmother said, I've, I've just always been dead headstrong. So I've always been switched on. Um, I've always found, you know, learning and school and stuff like really, really simple. Um, and I've always known I wanted to be a footballer. So I'd do my work quite quick and then I'd write out my World 11 and I'd make a footy kit and then I'd, be trying to coerce a few of my mates to do it and the teachers would come over and be like you've done your work you're now distracting them so then they'd put me in a separate table from my mates and I'd you know act up a bit more and then I'd get throughout the class and before you know it um my how easy I found school became a deterrent to me because if you ask questions and you you finish your work quite quick and you, you can get distracted. You know, this was before kind of ADHD or, you know, any any kind of stuff was um, was spoken about with kids. You were just seen as being a, um, a, a kind of energetic kid and their way of dealing with you was to send you out the classroom or isolate you, which um, I found strange. But as I say, I, I found school quite simple and I just wanted to play footy. So I'm constantly looking out the window going, can't wait to get on the playground at break time to have a game of footy. Can't wait to get on lunchtime, have a game of footy. I can't wait for school to finish to have a game of footy. I can't really be asked listening to these about RE and all that because I'm going to play in the Premier League. I don't need to be aware of, uh, you know, some of the stories in the Bible. And, um, you know, I came from a Roman Catholic background and, you know, singing songs in school was part of the curriculum. And, um, as I say, you know, f f for me, there was better times. I felt I could, I could be utilising this, singing uh, Praise Hosanna. You know, I could have an extra five minutes on the playground <laughs> to get a winner in a game of footy between me and my mates. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, that didn't make, it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, I'm a young boy. And, and I think, you know, now I'm a bit older, I think to put young lads in a classroom at that young age and not let them run wild is not great for them. Like, young lads need to be outside, like, because it's just such full of energy. Um, and I'm not sure the schooling system um, is quite designed, certainly on the council estates where I went to school, um, are quite designed to get the maximum out of the, uh, the the resources that the individuals have available to them. Like my, my belief is, and we were talking about this on the way over, because I've been to prison, and I told you I was in the Royal Enclosure, 
I believe everybody's got something that they're brilliant at that if they meet a good uh, mentor or a parent or a grandparent or a teacher, as I say, they can encourage that and coax that out of them. You know, for you, it's you thought it was football. It's turned out it's podcast and that. You don't know what it's going to be. Um, for me, I was lucky in terms of I knew quite early what I was good at and, and had good role models around me and, and people who kept me on the straight and narrow and gave me good examples. Um, and I managed to get an opportunity at a, at a football club and got a white tee and, you know, by the, by the skin of my teeth as well. And I was a talented kid. By the skin of my teeth, ended up to go on and have, and have an half-decent career, lad. Yeah, well, it was more than half decent career. Like I say, any footballer out there would bite your hand off to be playing in, like for Man Cities and Newcastles and playing with the best players in the world. That's an unbelievable career. But even with the schooling <laughs> system that we touch on, it's you're right, it's the system is there. Everybody's, it doesn't fulfill your maximum potential. Everybody's, I don't know, everybody's got a genius. I think it was Einstein that says everybody's a genius. Or, everybody's got so much potential but if you're sitting at a desk and you're looking out the window and thinking about the Premier League you're the one who's getting called crazy or not good enough or making you feel down and mm. eventually if that goes into your psyche you end up thinking that and where did you end up getting that belief system from though from a young kid from Liverpool to then thinking about playing in the Premier League where does that come from? I, I, I think you're a product of your environment um, nature nature kind of arguments you know do you have a certain constitution as a, as a young person you know wh where and when is your personality formulated I don't know I'm not smart enough to to answer those questions but I think I think you know having good people around you so the first port of call at your mum and dad isn't it they bring it into the world you know siblings family members um for me I always remember my, my, my grandmother Julia on my dad's mum uh, worked in she worked like four jobs to she wanted better things, you know, for, for herself and for for the kids. Um, and she worked in silver service. So she used to do the waiting on and she'd do, you know, all different functions. And she'd come back from all the different functions and she'd, uh, she'd talk about the characters she, that she'd met and, you know, people who were courteous and polite and people who weren't and the different kind of classes that were within this country. You know, she waited on the Queen a few times and always spoke about the fact that the Queen would kind of crumb up for herself and what a lovely lady she was and um, how polite she was. And she said, you know, they're no better than us, lad. You know, you know, they've been born into that um, world and, you know, they are nice people, but it doesn't make them any better or worse than, than us. You know, we, I'm from a family that were kind of um, abattoir workers in Liverpool. You know, as I say, we, we kind of moved to Heighton, which is a little bit outside the city centre. But all my kind of family are all, you know, kind of Saltney Street and, and, and the slum clearances of Liverpool. But they were, I think, someone's doing a family tree or something and I'd love to do um, Who Do You Think You Are? They asked me to do it when I was a player but didn't want to do it because I thought I'll have Jack the Ripper or something in our family. <laughs> Still know my love. Yeah. That's the last thing I need to get the media already on my case. The last thing I need. I seen Danny Dyer pull out Henry the and I thought, oh God, they'll, they'll pull some right hair out of my family <laughs> line some somewhere. Case. Some barn pot. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, but now, like, the, I, I'm, in, I'm interested in it, you know, since I've had kids and that, I'm like, I'm, it's actually fascinating to understand where you come from and, you know, is the die kind of cast or how much can the environment and the nature uh, change, you know, the, the nature? Um, and, and as I say, you know, my grandmother gave me that belief that greatness is for you if, if you want it. You've got to work hard at it. But if you, if you truly dedicate your life to whatever it is that you, you're passionate about, you're as capable as anybody else. And as I say, there wasn't a lot of people around me at that time saying that. Um, you know, there was more people around me saying you can't do it or there was a lot of people with more talent than me that were getting pulled in by the distractions that life can, can throw at you. You know, you, you, you've grown up in, in, in that space. So, you know, when you're a young kid and it's pure, football's quite easy. You become really good at it. Then you get 14, 15 and, you know, a few airs start to spr sprout in different places and it changes your, your focus. For me, it never. My focus always remained football and, you know, Fanny um, drifted into the background. Now, some of my mates who were boss of football, you know, they got that sense and it changed, you know, for, for many young men. I was skinny and small, so I didn't, like, I was in school at 14 and 15 and, like, all oh, your mates have got hairy chests and all that and I wasn't. I was like, God, what's happening to me here? Yeah? So it, I didn't really, I didn't really have an interest in anything other than football. They all started, you know, start to have a bevy for the first time, 
started having a joint for the first time, started taking trips for the first time, you know, started hanging around with the wrong crowd, started trying to get into nightclubs and all that. And I was lucky in terms of, I was unlucky my mum and dad divorced, but, but when they divorced, I went to live with my dad because there was three kids, two, my mum kept me two younger brothers and I went with my dad to my nan's and my nan was a bit of a disciplinarian. My mum was a bit like liberal and whatever goes, goes. And my nan weren't. So if I said I was out at 14 or 15, James, she was like, where are you? Where are you staying? Whose house are you in? Right, I need to speak to uh, their mum. Uh, so I just I had nowhere to go. I couldn't say I'm going to a party like some of my mates could. Mm -hmm. My nan had knock on the door, pull me out of parties. So, you know, the temptation, it wasn't like I was a saint and I had no temptation. It was like I had a really strong maternal um presence in my life who was like you're not you're not getting off the beaten track um she'd take me to football and she just had this belief in me and i thought if she believes in me uh, i can do it do you think that was your saving grace yeah for sure yeah, yeah because I, sure. I never had that discipline my dad was a bouncer so i used to go to the nightclubs front of the queue yeah. tell all the birds i played for the first team i just fucking loved that i loved that that pretending to be somebody when you were how old are you there 15 see we're all like that though everyone wants to be Everyone wants to be that. Everyone wants to be that boss footballer who all the birds love, who can nick any bird, who gets in the nightclubs, who people all think are more mature than what they are. And when when I think about that, I think you're forgetting to be a kid. Like, they're the best years of your life then. I say to my kids now all the time, these are the best years of your life. You don't pay a bill. You just got to get up and go to school and learn. You get your dinner fed for you. Your mum washes your clothes, makes your bed. Yeah. Like, you smashed it. <laughs> so five years time, you're getting a job. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. like, well, I'm like, you're getting a job in five years. Mm -hmm. You start work. He's going, I've got... I went out to work for myself. You have to go, and, to go and work on the roof with me. I my Uncle Peter when I was 16. I was doing a YTS as well. And in the summer, I'd have to go and get on the... on on. And this was before they had bumpers. And they were all roofers, so you're having to sling the tiles on. I thought, after about a week, I thought, fuck this for the game of soldiers. Get me a footy. I'm having a game of footy. Fucking doing this for in, in the winter. And I was doing it in the summer mm -hmm. to supplement my YTS wages. And honestly, after three weeks, my hands, like, my hands are like silk purses. My hands were cabbaged. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. I thought, fuck this, I'm not doing that in the freezing cold. And that, that for me, I thought, right, I'm getting in the gym, I'm doing my extras. If I need to not go out on a Friday night, if I need to stay out of nightclubs. And when I seen all the good players who I'd play against and I'd hear, he was out shagging. He was out larging it. I'd just be sitting there going, I'm getting ahead. And I'd just seen it as incremental steps of getting ahead because I thought I'm not the most talented kid. I knew I was talented, but I knew I wasn't the, the most talented. And I thought, I, 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 I've got to do everything right here. And I'd had an uncle, Tony Kelly, who'd played all the way up to Division One for like Stoke and Bolton Wanderers with like John McGinley when he went on a couple of good cup runs, but he'd never played in the Premier League. And he was an incredible footballer but loved the ale the mad bastard stopped fucking playing and went sober I went you've done it the fucking wrong way you crap boss you should <laughs> you'd be a multi-millionaire yeah. now you've done it the other way but mm -hmm. like you know and some lads are like that I see lads now I played with who weren't the great, greatest pros who are now into all mad weightlifting and all in like ridiculous body and I'm like if you'd have done that when you played you'd be you'd have earned about another 15 million that. quid there but, but life doesn't unfold for you the way you're you know you, the way it's meant to go everybody's life is unique to them as i said to you you know for me i always remember listening to to morris he was a big influence on me as a kid and i always remember the song and in the song it's you know irish blood english hearts which obviously the, the northwest of england is very much um you know i think i'm a quarter irish a quarter jewish definitely a quarter english and somewhat me, me granddad's Sad, I think there's a bit of Spaniard in there, so I'm like, I'm a proper mongrel. Like, I don't, I don't, <laughs> no wonder you know, you're yeah. a bit, you're a bit tapped in terms of you know, that's a combination of all different um people and, and all different belief systems. But the one thing all of those communities share is is, a, is an honesty and a um a fairness. And and I think if if you have your life a different way, you might have grown up in a, in a better house on a on a more affluent part of of Britain, but 
would you have had the same principles? And, you know, when I look at it, some of the greatest people I've ever met with, with the, you know, who you'd stand on are off them council estates and, and uh, you know, people have met in prison who you go, what a, what a, what a human being that is. Um, some of the biggest pricks I've ever met in my life are people who are meant to be, you know, people who are smashing life's head in with a few quid who've got yeah. a couple of plums in the mouth and a, and a few titles behind them and they're the biggest ball bags you're, you're ever likely yeah. to come across. So, if you, if you, I, I just travel through life that open minded. I think there's good and bad people everywhere. Um, I don't see, you know, you know, people's religion or football team or race or I just think it's a nonsense. Like, surely with what we know about the world, you know, what we've watched in, the history of, you know, what, what's been recorded for us, you know, the documentaries about what happens if we don't get on, you know, whether that's the troubles in Northern Ireland in my lifetime, you know, I can remember Northern Ireland, the Falklands, uh, Bosnia, Iraq, First War, um, Second, Twin Towers, to, you know, to them Iraq into Af Afghanistan, Syria. Now, you, I'm like... When, when, you know, when I grew up reading George Orwell, I'm like, when does this ever stop? In 1984. Like, you know, you're from Glasgow, you understand yeah. that, you know, that 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 religious nonsense. Mm -hmm. Because that's what it is. Um, you know, seeing kids being killed and, you know, I'm, I'm going, I've won the birth lottery, being born in, in Aiton, which is, I think, uh, Labour heart, heart, heartland, but it's got the second highest unemployment rate in the country, no sixth form provision. So once you're 16, you've got to leave the borough to get further education or, or a different uh, chance in life. And these these have historically voted for Labour. You know, Harold Wilson was prime minister of the country and he was, um, his local constituency was, was heightened, was Knowsley. And it, they've been, you know, left behind. And then we get into Brexit and we leave the EU. Well, Liverpool, the city centre of Liverpool has been massively regenerated. I don't know about Glasgow, but, but certainly Liverpool and Marseille, where I spent time, been regenerated from the EU money and now we're out the EU what what you know I'm lucky I'm a multi-millionaire played footy it's life's great for me but what chances have the other kids got sorry mate um and society grows great when men plant trees of which the fruit they'll never ever get a sample everyone's just take take taking like this crew who are in government now no one's voted for them his own par party didn't even vote for him They've robbed the working man and, uh, uh, of this country, you know, of, of, of the British Isles, blind. And there's no comeuppance for it. You, you, you do that in, in the business you work in or you do that in, uh, in your local area, you're going to jail. You know, they've, 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 you know and these are people who are pontificating about how we should live our lives. And, you know, they've been telling people you know, what, what, what vaccinations they need to stick in the body. And, you know, it's, it's tough for kids growing up. And I think, you know, I see the work you're doing, trying to highlight different opinions, different voices, and think it's admirable. It's admirable now to take a stance and tell the truth, you know, because if, if, if we all don't and we all just sit in silence, like what, what are we going to leave for the James Englishes who are out there now growing up or the young Joey Bartons who are out there on council estates who are looking for role models. And as I say, I think... What you do is great, mate, and and um, yeah, I appreciate that, brother. Raising awareness to kids and and um, you know all the different options and things that are out in the, in there in life, because you know for us, I think <clears throat> once you think everybody thinks the same way as you, um, you know you you start to become a little bit closed in your mind, and yeah. I think the more open minded you remain, I think I think the better. And I'm lucky, it came from a city of that like the Beatles were big growing up, listening to the Beatles and. Obviously, what they got up to in terms of, you know, and, and then my grandmother saying to me, I could be something and having a talent and nurturing that talent and, and having a bit of, bit of luck. Um, mm. And I think we should be out there saying to loads of kids, hey, you, you can be well better than me. You, you should be. Kid, all kids out there are capable of brilliance. Like they, are, they just are. The, the problem that you get is teachers and people going, you can't do this, you can't do that, you're not good enough. Who, who, the, who the fuck are you to tell someone you're yeah. not good enough? I remember a career advisor in, in my secondary school said to me, I went in, she's like, what do you want to be? And I'm like 13 or 14. I'm like, you know, you can have a crisis of confidence at that age. I said, I'm, you know, I'm going to be a footballer. And bear in mind, I'd been in Everton's Academy from eight and I'm 13, I'm still in Everton's Academy. I, I almost, I got down to the last trial for Lilla Shaw for the national school. And, um, 
I've said to her, I'm going to be a footballer. And she laughed in my face. And she was like, people from around here don't do that. And I just remember thinking, you cheeky cunt, like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> who the fuck are you? You're working in a fucking secondary school in the middle of fucking Aiton. And you tell them, you're pissing on people's dreams. And luckily, I had that mindset. But I think of how many kids who'd gone, oh, maybe I'm not good enough, like you said yeah, you did. I thought, I thought that, yeah. Um, because but that's what people need to understand. People's opinion of you doesn't have to be a reality. Because other people are living shit lives and they only see one dimensional, it doesn't mean you have to. And it's so important for your nan to say you are good enough, you can be anything. If people could just understand that, people can be anything. James, any age, Steve any religion, Jobs whatever famously you do. said, those that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who fucking do it. If you just think you're going to work in the, in the nine to five job, then you're probably going to be right on that. Steve Black, one of my great mentors, um, if you think you can or you think you can't, you'll invariably be right. Mm -hmm. So I knew I could be a footballer. Like, it's just a mindset. You, you know, some lads, again, you know, they, they need an influence around them, a coach to take them under the wing and go, you're not doing that. A parent to go, no, no, I'm, I'm, you're not getting off the, 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 the straight and narrow. Look at Jude Bellingham. He's, he, I think that this kid's going to be up there on, on, in the pantheon of, of footballers, you know, I, I, I would imagine he's going to be in the kind of soonest category. You know, look what he's doing at Real Madrid at his yeah. age. I mean, I've never seen a kid, you know, when he is a kid, he's 18, he's 19. 19. I've never seen a kid, even Stevie Gerrard, who was in Liverpool's first team playing right back at 19, who was a phenomenon. Michael Owen, maybe. Um, Ryan Giggs, maybe. But this Bellingham to go to Dortmund and Germany's a big physical league and, you know, excel. Now he's gone to Real Madrid and you can't imagine that he and, and excel, but it's no coincidence, isn't his dad an FBI, an FBI, a MI5 or, or a police hostage negotiator? You know, so, and his brother looks like he's a hell of a talent as well, the kid who signed for Sunderland. So these lads have had an incredible talent and then had really strong parental guidance that's developed that talent. Not lots of kids get that. Um, and I look at certainly my sport, football, it's historically a working man's game uh, in terms of a lot of the talent comes out of the working uh, class of the country. And, you know, when, when you look at um, the hotbeds, you know, whether it's Newcastle, South, South London, uh, the North West or kind of Glasgow for, for players, um, you know, they all come with, 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 a, with the right bit of fire and the right edge to them. Um, and we've got to be careful that we don't try and sanitise it, you know, Nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Some of the best people I've ever met have made more mistakes than anybody. Some of the greatest, you know, psychologists, drug, alcohol counsellors, are reformed maniacs and, and druggies and, and alcoholics because there's a lot to be said for life experience. And the way we live in now, I think, with social media is, is trying to make, you can only do and say stuff if you're squeaky clean. <laughs> well, there's not many people like that about. Yeah, no, and, no. and that's why I like your like what you're doing and as I say Joe I think Joe Rogan's been a huge influence on popular culture but again you're kind of you, you're the British version of Joe Rogan lad aren't yeah, you so it's, it's enormous re responsibility yeah, but he's left a blueprint and it's only to see what can be done with giving people a voice without trying to fucking talk down at them without trying to put words in people's mouth because I tell people question what I say question what you say just question what you've been taught what you've yeah. learned over the years question you can can you do better of course you can everybody can be better to keep raising the bar and be a better individual no matter if you're stuck in a rot addicted or abusive relationship whatever the fuck it is you can make the changes to better the life than the circumstances that you're in and if you keep telling people that enough then they'll go the light bulb moment will happen and people go well wait a minute you can you can no matter if you're 20 30 40 50 60 i speak to people in their 70s and 80s who are learning new languages playing new instruments just constantly try to progress running marathons your life's not over. If you've got air in your lungs, you've got something to give. Yeah. What was it like for you at Everton? Did you think boyhood, boyhood team? That was that. Was that your whole life? Is that you just for, feel for me? Yeah. Like, obviously, I grew up in a household of Evertonians. Like my granddad Peter, huge Evertonian. E e everyone. My dad, massive Evertonian, uh, but obviously played, so it didn't really go the game. My granddad would 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 have gone the game, um, and was brought up on the kind of golden vision. Obviously. Um, you know, Harvey, Kendall and Ball, um, you know, the School of Science and, you know, Everton were a, a, a big side in my granddad's era. And then, you know, they'd obviously had a, a bit of a spell in the 80s under Howard Kendall. 
but I'm born 82. Everton's kind of last great side kind of disperses in around Heisel, kind of 85, 86. So grew up with DVD, well, DVDs, we weren't DVDs, they were fucking VHSs. Yeah, I'm actually yeah, that old yeah, lad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, VHSs of like, you know, the glory teams of Everton, you know, your Sheedies, your Linekers, um, um, you know, Andy Gray, all, all that kind of era, but never actually seen it. By the time I can remember Everton, kind of, 7, 87, 88, 89 it's not a fantastic version of Everton and then you know you bang into it then I remember the Italian 90 World Cup vividly getting a sticker book you know, obviously Toto Scalacci Roger Bad Miller Joe. Bad, Joe. Bad Joe was more 94 for me uh, it was Scalacci for me 90 yeah. Um, Roger Miller, I remember the RGs got beat by Cameroon and Maradona um, was he was he in that World Cup? Maradona, yeah. Was he in that um, World Cup? Yeah, Maradona. He famously Last scored World the Cup. goal against Napoli, didn't he? Uh, against Italy in Napoles in the semi final, and, and it, the ton against the Napoli. Yeah, yeah, he didn't. Yeah, it changed his life that that mm -hmm. goal. But if you remember, they played Italy in the semi final. England obviously lost on pens to West Germany. Mm -hmm. Chris Chris Waddle and Stuart Pearce, um, Gaza. Um, my bastard. I know, and 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 then I didn't even watch the final. I was that, but that was like I remember. So I can remember um, the struggles in terms of England not being that good, and it was only watching the Bobby Robson film about his life that you realised how much heat Bobby was getting before the tournament. Obviously, Gaza became a, a, a huge figure in in English football after that tournament. But but I always remember um, Toto Scalacci was like. The, he scored, he just came from nowhere. He was like a periphery figure in the Italian squad and just scored loads of goals. I think he won the golden boot in it. But it it, it was um, Germany won the won the World Cup, didn't he? Low time, the Mateus the beat the Argies in the final. And um, obviously there was a lot of anti argy feeling. I can't remember 86 Mexico, but obviously that was under God. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, you know, I don't, I don't remember 86 World Cup. I can't remember any of it, you know, I'm four yeah. at the time, Jay. So I used to remember the wee Italian guy running across it when there was a goal. He yeah, he was like a mad thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like but a matchstick but, man and do yeah. somersaults and shit. So I had the stickers and all that. I used to get the, the book as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and my half fellas mate. I've them. Well, my half fellas mate, Chrissy Dryerst, used to do the paper deliveries now in the morning, his mm -hmm. tranny van. He'd drop all the papers off to the, to the news agents. That was his job. And he used to get the stickers. I used to always say, fucking rob us a box of stickers. <laughs> and every six months yeah. or whatever, a box of stickers would fall off his wagon mm -hmm. and you'd go into school and it was like you'd won the fucking lottery because it was like... The badges were the silver ones. And that, yeah, like, yeah, swat, you could, yeah, yeah, Honestly, you could... And, 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 and swat, the thing yeah. was to complete your That's stickers. That's what I used to carry on. As soon as you got your pocket money off your ma, Straight we had the shop the at the top of our road, Max. And so it was 10 like, pens, 20 yeah, pens. five packs of stickers, yeah. bang, fit, yeah, bang straight away. And you're like, go, go. But then that's how you build your football kind of knowledge. Because, mm -hmm. I, you know, you go, oh, I had fucking Ken Moncow about 38 times. He had every pack. I had Ken Moncow. Or Steve Potts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Ian Dowie. But obviously the shinies and all yeah. that. And then swapping them in school. And that's your first real learning how to deal in currency. When when my brothers were growing up, that was all Pokemon. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? Yeah. We were all stickers. Everything I can remember, James, was football, football, football. So I'm at Everton then. Um... In the round, Italian 90 is, is about eight. I, I've realised six, seven, eight. I'm decent at footy, you know. I always I always remember saying to Steve Black, who, who's a great mentor of mine, um, who's passed away now, God rest his soul, who, who, who was quite close with Johnny Wilkinson and loads of other sport, sporting organisations, but renowned for the work he'd done with Johnny. And I said to him, how do you become the best in the world, Blackie? Like, how the fuck does Johnny become the best fly half in, like, world rugby? And he, and he said, steady, easy, Joe, actually, when you think about it. And we just sat over the coffee and he went through the seven stages to become the best in the world. And afterwards you were like, yeah, it actually isn't that hard. You know, all right, it, 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 there's going to be, there's moments where you might need a load of talent here, no matter how much you train, but actually you're still going to be really good there because he was like, well, first you've got to be the best footballer in your street or rugby player in your street. Then you'd have to be the best in your school. Then you'd have to be the best in your borough. Then you'd have to be the best in the side that you get selected for. Then you'll either get selected for like a, a representation or a regional team. Then that'll get you selected for your country. Your country then gets you to a European Championship. And then a European Championship gets you to a World Championship. You win that, you're the best in the world. Kind <laughs> of like, fucking hell, yeah, he's right. And and meeting people like that make, make you realise how capable everybody is if given the right exposure at the right time. 
for some people, their talent might be collecting stamps. For some people, it might be podcasting. For some people, it might be teaching. For some people, it might be sport. Um, and, I, and I think it's the adults' responsibility to find what the young people are good at and help them on the way, not the other way around. Tell them all the stuff they can't do. You shit at that, don't do that. Well, that's not good, is it? Tell me what I can do. Tell me what I can be good at. Mm -hmm. And I think back to the old youth clubs I went to where you played all sports and they were encouraging you to canoe and kayak on these council estates. But you realised I'm not just good at footy. I'm actually good at climbing. I'm good at navigating. I'm good at leading. I'm good at being in a, in a canoe and getting a canoe organised. And, you know, we, we had the kind of, you know, that exposure. And I can build a tent and I can... And then, you know, you, you realise that there's more to life than just just the council estates and, and as I say then these Tory governments and etc come in and they shut down all these community stuff and, and just take people away from it and then you know what what options do the kids get and um, it must be a really tough time now to be a young person not just social media and um, the challenges of that and the challenges of having to be perfect and, and I always say um, I can't imagine if I was 15, 16, 17 and you had Instagram and Facebook you know I was I didn't get spots till I left school um, and I used to laugh at everybody because I didn't hit puberty till quite late and I'd, all everyone was getting all beards and spots and all that and I'm buzzing off them and then it, they got me about 17, 18 I became like one of the world's most clumsiest beekeeper, beekeepers after uh, 18 I just had this mad outbreak and I can't imagine if that's getting recorded in a, you know, you've got to then put a filter on if you want to get a beard it must be an, in, an incredibly yeah. um, think... pressurised situation for these young people Um yeah, you've, you can pull beards now from Argentina or you can meet friends from, you know, Australia in a heartbeat. But also, you know, you're in a global market and you're constantly under this pressure where when we were kids, we were just, just left to your own devices. Like you, you kind of had enough space to grow up and make mistakes. And I wouldn't want to live in a world now where my thoughts are being recorded from, from being a young person. I mean, I cringe sometimes at some of the stuff I said in the early outset of Twitter when I was like 23, 24. <laughs> so I can't imagine what fucking barmy shit that yeah. they've been saying at 15, 16. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? What was it like getting released from Everton? Tough because I'd gone from, um, as I say, when you get to like 13 or 14, and you, you start to get like schoolboy forms. Don't know whether you'd have that in Scotland. It's the same north of the border. So yeah. you get schoolboy forms, like 12. So you're signing one-year deals from like eight yeah. One year, one year, centre of excellence, <clears throat> one year extension, one year extension, and you're evaluated all the time. And then about 13, you get your, you, they give you your first two years. It's called the schoolboy form in England. Um, so they have to make a two year commitment to you. So I would kind of sign schoolboy form. So that takes you from 12 or 13 to 14, 15. Then 15, 16, they work out whether you're going to get a YTS when you leave or a pro. If you're good, you get a YT, two year YT and a two-year pro or something. That's like a Michael Owen will sign a one-year YT. But you'd have to sign YT until you're 17. You can't sign pro, I think, until you're 18 in England. So they obviously just give you the YTS up until you're eligible. And then once you hit 18, you're right into the pro deals. That's if you're, if you're mega talented. So I get to Everton, 14. Um, they sign this contract, I think, till like 14. And then I go to the national schools trials. So they have a Northwest trial in... I think we played at Edgeley Park, Stockport County. Um, and I played up front in that game and scored two for the northwest of England. Um, and then I got to the north of England trials. I played up front in that game. I think that was our crew scored again. Didn't, um, then you get to the national trial, which was now at Lillishall in, in Shropshire. So I think it was like 60 of us, um, our age group, from like Arsenal, Chelsea, like Defoe and uh, Leon Knight. I can remember all they all came came in in these blazers and shirt and ties and all that big purple blazer. I always remember we were in England under 21s. I always remember saying to Jermaine, I can always remember he turned up with a black shirt, black tie and this big lime green blazer. And obviously the North and South's a real big split in our country in terms of flash, flash southerners and obviously a little bit more humble origin kind of northerners. And we were all in our Everton trackies or Liverpool trackies or whoever you were, Blackburn trackie or whoever the Northern lads was. And then all these flash cockney cunts are coming in <laughs> and these fucking big lady blazers. And you're like, right, this is on. And you're competing. You're going to go from 60 of yous down to 18 outfield and three goalies. So it's going to be, and it's on. And, and they're mixing your teams and it's like games, games and the scouts are all there with the notepads evaluating. So 
you can imagine at the time. Pretty sure. Yeah, but I didn't even feel it. You just like, you know, for me, I was just looking for verification. Hey, am I one of the best 18 players my age group in the country? I don't know. Um, but at that point, I'm the last one from Everton. So there was me, two scousers in there, Neil Dans, who's Tony Bell, who's mate Danzy, who was at Liverpool at the time, and myself at Everton. I never got from the 60 to the 18. I got from the 60 to the 30, and then I got cut 30 to 18. So I've missed out on it. So I go back to Everton then thinking, well, I'm the best. From I got the fair to start of Everton. Danzy got in, in the school and was at Liverpool and he ended up leaving Liverpool and signing a two-year YT or, and, and a three-year pro with Blackburn who'd, who'd given him a right few shillings to turn pro because he got to the national school. And then I think it only ran for one year after us or we might have been the last year of it and then they shut down. It was almost like France's version of mm. Claire Fontaine. I don't know whether you got a yeah. north of the border, you'd have like a... Um, Kind of, it's like a centre of excellence for the for 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 the international team, um, and go back to Everton. And in the midst of that, the Ray Orr was running the academy. And uh, when I was a young kid at Everton, we had a, um, a, an academy director who left to go with the FA. Someone else had been in his spot. In the midst of coming back from Lilla Shaw, the academy director had changed back to the fellow who'd, who'd been with the FA for four or five years, and he'd come back. Um, and there was a different philosophy in place. And within six six months, I'd gone from the last Everton lad to get to the national trial to getting told, yeah, you, you're too small, you're not good enough, and uh, we're going to release you. And I always remember the phone rang in my nans. I was living in my nans at the time. And um, you, at that time, there was a phone upstairs. It was the landline. No one had to on mobiles then. So it was a phone in the kitchen and a phone upstairs. Um, but obviously, if someone picked it up in the kitchen... And someone picked it up upstairs. Yeah. You could listen in. You have to say, "Fucking put the phone down." Whoever's on there, mm -hmm. and but you're there, the nosy bastard. Sometimes listening <laughs> to your phone calls. So the perks of living in the council mm -hmm. council house, lad. And um, uh, the phone goes, and you know, you just get that feeling in your stomach. It was like, right, we're going to have an evaluation, and we don't want any of the kids to go. It's just the parents, and you go, "Fucking something shady is going on here," and um, but never ever thinking what was coming. And anyway, me, me nan's gone with me dad to Everton to meet the coaches, and I've been released. But there's been, I think, 14 of us got released out of 18. I think they kept four lads on. Um, so there's been a wholesale uh, changing of the guard. So obviously my nan's uh, phoned me. As soon as she's come out, she's gone to a payphone and thought, I need to tell this kid like right now. So she's phoned. As soon as the phone rang, my granddad's picked the phone up. And I've picked the phone up upstairs. And I've heard my nan say, is Joe there? And I've heard him stay on the line. And I've spoke to my nan and she said, listen, lad, they, they've released you. And I just remember like going, oh. like, like a, that was like crushing. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm like an Evertonian. Like I'm, I had to play for Everton for nothing. I, did, I, I was on the terraces, uh, junior Evertonian on the Gladys Street, trying to bunk in, trying to, any way I could get in games, bunking on the trains to get to like Sunderland away with my mates from school um, just to watch Everton. And then I thought, I'm going to play for Everton. Like I'm definitely, I'm, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm not good enough. And then I just remember thinking, they're fucking wrong. Like, the the minute the phone went down, I just remember this, you know, the the, the weight of like, oh, I'm not I'm, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, like Everton have told me that. I just remember thinking, I don't know what came over me, but the, the wrong, these are fucking wrong. Um, and it was me lack of respect for the people who'd made the decision. I thought, these are fucking shit, he's shit a footy. When he does his demos, he can't kick the fucking ball. He's a fucking PE teacher. He doesn't know football. If I asked him to do keep-ups or if I had to play him now, I'd fucking empty him and he's a man. So why you listen to this cunt? He's, he's nowhere near as good as you. He doesn't know his ass from his elbow and he's fucking made a mistake and you can either sulk here and prove that he was right to get rid of you or you can prove this cunt wrong. And I just remember, I didn't say anything to anyone. Went downstairs and my granddad's not a, um, he's not a man of emotion. Do you know what I mean? If he, he's old school. no emotion at all, like yeah, old school. And he he he'd been for he, he kind of formulated differently. Me granddad, he'd been smart enough to get into a grammar school at a young age, but he come from like seven brothers, and as I said, they all worked in the abattoir. And you know, a bell would go, get rung in the morning, and all the lads would have to get up and go out to work and come in and give me granddad's dad the wages. And then the house was looked after. Very very old school working class family. And um, two of the youngest brothers, my granddad. Peter and his, his, I think his brother Terry were clever enough in the schools they were in. They got selected to go to grammar school by a, the, 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 whatever tests it was. So they went 
away from their siblings to this grammar school in Prescott. But obviously they were from a really poor family. So the teachers would go, right lads, we've got cricket tomorrow and you need your cricket whites. Well, obviously my granddad and my uncle Terry, the mum and dad haven't got a pot to piss in. There was no cricket whites. So they'd have to make an excuse to not, without getting ridiculed by the other kids. And my granddad was a clever man and grew up hating anybody lifting their head above the pulpit. He was like, keep your head down. Like he didn't like, but even when I became famous, he didn't like, like everything that came with it. He was very much, I, I always, I tell a story, James, my, my nan's the opposite. She's like, fuck everybody. You're as good as anybody. Very proud woman, big matriarch. Very like, if you work for it and you're proper and you're principled, don't li don't take no notice of anybody. Like she's someone you want on, on, on your side, side, my nan. Like she's, and if she sees an injustice, she takes it on. She won't, and she doesn't even have to say something. She just looks at you sometimes, or she's just got that presence, as all great matriarchs have. And my granddad was, so my, my nan tells a story that she wanted to learn to drive. And this is, this will just give you some picture to me, to my grandfather. She wants to learn to drive. And my granddad's like, what, why, the, why the fuck do you want to fucking learn to drive? Like, what, just fucking be happy getting a bus? He'd walk everywhere. Get... So she's like, shut up. She just didn't listen to him. So she starts getting lessons and all that. And he's going, fuck sake, fucking... She's going out now doing the driving lessons, pull up and they live in a close, small new close. And he's like, all oh, the fucking neighbours will be looking out the window and all that. So he's giving her a tie for these driving lessons. Ah, fucking. She ends up passing a test and all that, my nan. Gets a little card and all that. And so she can take the kids around and all that because she's a cracker. And um, I won't be going in that car. Everyone will be looking at me thinking, we're selling drugs, he was saying to me, nan, because she's got this white um, maestro. She bought this white maestro. And he's saying to her, everyone will be thinking I'm selling drugs. He's just a fucking crackpot. <laughs> And then um, I won't be going in the car and all that anyway. Two weeks after me, I'm passing the test. There he is, fucking couldn't get him out. <laughs> about 20 years, you couldn't get him out of the bus. You see, he got ferried uh -huh. everywhere. Uh -huh. um, but that was his mindset. And she was the same when he got the telly, because she got the telly. But these were the days when you couldn't afford the telly and you had to sling a pound note, uh, yeah. a pound uh, coin in the back of it. To, you know, remember the boxes? Yeah. To keep it going. Mm -hmm. So you'd only watch a telly for like a, an hour and 20 or something if you slung a nickel in the back. And obviously, scousers being scousers, you'd always find a get few ways. There was a few ways to get in and yeah. out of it, lad. Do you know what I mean? You know, where um, where there's a will, there's a way. We survive more my, my nan weren't like that, though, but do you know what I mean? But, like, mm -hmm. obviously, that, that, was the, that was the mindset. And um, I always remember um, he kicked off about this, this telly. He was like, fucking big, fucking flash telly. And fucking everyone would think we're fucking drug dealers and all that. So all he used to, all he used to care about was what the, what the neighbours thought of him. I mean, I would say, don't care what anyone thinks. Who cares? Like, why, why shouldn't you want to do well? And as I say, she went out and got extra jobs she she worked for for jobs me nan to make sure her kids had everything they wanted in, in the life and and then she did the same for us as as a, as, a, as a grandmother and as i say um she just set you on that course grandfather was always trying to like play it down and didn't and i was never like me and my granddad never were never overly close me and my nan were always mega close and i think she's nurtured um, that kind of headstrong, self-determined mm -hmm. um, personality in me. She's seen something in me and nurtured it. And as I say, I think you know I'm very, very fortunate to to have had that that influence. And I think I think we all need that in our lives. Yeah. You know, certainly if you're going to go on to fulfil your potential. And I think the more of that we've got, and that doesn't always have to, for me. That doesn't always have to be family members. Like I see, I call it fake fake book, but like. Instagram of, oh yeah, I'm having a fucking great day today. Look at these fucking sick pictures of me, yeah. And then them pictures get sent in and then they're just sitting there thinking, right, I might have to slip my wrist here. And it's just this nonsense world people live in. The good stuff is now loads of people are doing, you know, these podcasts and, and, and people are talking like openly and honestly about the life experience. And I think the more people do that, it just brings down barriers. Everyone mm. realises they're as troubled as anybody else. And if you don't pay the rent on it, you know, for me, my mental health is massively intertwined with um, having a purpose in the morning, keeping myself active, keeping myself fit, learning, trying to learn as much as I can, whether that's reading a book, watching a documentary, tuning into um, all the different various media sources that are out there, or actually getting out and just meeting people. Like Steve Black always said to me, you know, smile at people when you're walking around and watch the world reflected back at you. So whenever I'm out running or mooching about, I just make eye contact with people and, and, and go, all right, mate, you're okay. And you can see. And then you just watch all the other people who are walking around with their heads in the phone or their heads on the ground, taking part in the rat race. 
and and just try it next time you're out and about. Just walk around and just keep your head held high. Be proud of the person you are and just make contact with with, with people. Don't have to say anything sometimes, just a look. And, and you'll get on the people who are on it. And then there's all these other people. And as I say, you know, when life gets hard, what, what do we all do? We all isolate, whether that's with a drink, whether that's with a bet, whether that's with all the other uh, baits that are out there for all of us. And I think if you've got a, a circle of friends that you can rely on, that you count on one hand, I think you smash life's head. And yeah. if you've got a few people who'll say to you, hey, stop being a cunt. You're acting like a cunt here. Fucking behave yourself. If you've got four or five people like that in your life, you, you you're a a lottery winner for me. Yeah. What did you, you went to Liverpool after everyone's like? No, no. Why, this is this Wikipedia shite, isn't it? Well, because it's just. But you went to Liverpool, being an Everton. No. So so what happened with me was when I was thirteen. Um, my nan lived in Molyneux Close. I'm off St John's Estate. My nan lived just off the estate on mm -hmm. on the kind of incident between Moscroft and the Johns uh, called the Hag, it's kind of near Highton Village, and there's a. Our school, Thomas Beckett's the Roman Catholic school, and there was another big senior school there, Seal Road, Nosley Hay. And that Nosley Hay, the secretary um, of the school, was uh, the wife of, remember, Steve Highway, who played for Liverpool, mm -hmm. um, who ended up being Liverpool's academy director, obviously brought through Fowler, McMahon, I and mean, I think Michael Owen and all that, Carragher, uh, Stephen Gerrard crop. And she'd, their school used to play on a Saturday morning and we'd play midweek. We didn't play in a Saturday league, so I played Saturday afternoon for the team, Sunday morning for the team, Saturday afternoon, uh, Sunday afternoon for the team, and I just wanted a game of footy. Our school played during the week, I had a Tuesday or Thursday, that was just the Roman Catholic schools. Um, so, um, we they had a good footy team, and it was lads from our road who were really good, who were like playing for like crew, uh, Liverpool, it was none at Everton with us. But, but in our school team, there was only me who was at a team, there was loads of other lads who played good amateur footy, but they weren't that signed up by clubs. Um, and our teacher wasn't really that bothered in the seniors, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Lally, about, about football. So the other school, their teacher was bothered about footy and they used to play like blue coat and all the boss, like uh, Cardline and all the really good footy schools because they were in the Protestant league and they were all like more difficult leagues. So my best mate was their best player, the other school. So I'd say to him, listen, fucking... Ask your teacher, can I play for you on a Saturday? Because they were getting beat by these big schools, so their teacher's gone. You can play for us on a Saturday. So I used to play for our school um, during the week. I'd play for the opposite school, the Protestant school, Saturday morning. Then I'd play for my own Saturday uh, team, Genoa, and Saturday afternoon. Then I'd finish that afternoon game. I'd try and get to Goodison if it was a home game. If not, I'd try and get to my half fellas game if he was playing for Nosley United. Sunday morning, I'd play a game for St. Anne's Rovers, and then I had another team, a, a team of our estate that was set up by a few of the fellows from the community centre. They called themselves Milan, um, who were played for on a Sunday afternoon. And as I say, like when you think, like, lads have met in my life, you know, Matthew Said, uh, who's, who's a good writer, wrote a book called Bounce, which I think is good for people to read, certainly, certainly young formulating minds. And Matthew had taken a lot of the principles from kind of Malcolm Gladwell's uh, books, um, you know, bastardised a little bit here, James, but but the, the theory of kind of 10,000 hours of purposeful practice makes you elite or world, world class at um, your pursuit. And, and it was a study done on uh, chess players by a, a couple of scientists who ended up having kids. And um, uh, the, at the time, you know, the only thing they could come up with with the test of the intellect was, or the intelligence was chess because it didn't, didn't require your physical attributes. Um, and then he had daughters. So the experiment at that point in, in time, you know, women were considered not to have the same learning capacity as men and that, um, you know, they could never be, at that point there'd been no chess grand, grandmasters and um, he ends up teaching his daughters and I think they become like the third highest chess score ever one of them has got and multiple world level chess champions and and, and again it was a, a, a an, in, an intellectual exercise by scientists to prove that people are capable of anything um and and that ten thousand hours when i think back to it you know the, the, the council of state streets and the youth club and all the football that was going on we were just amassing hours and hours and hours and hours of practice, almost like golfers going on the range and chipping and chipping and chipping. We were just street footballers just playing on the streets. I mean, you know, the prime example of, I think, Liverpool's street football culture 
is 16 year old Wayne Rooney slamming it in off the crossbar against the, um, awesome. Arsenal at Goodison. You know, Wayne is from Croxteth, probably the, the, the best player, natural talent Liverpool have produced. But again, you know, you look at Glasgow, similar circumstances. As I say, South South London's got similar and, and the Geordies, the North East is a, is a bit of a bit of a hotbed as well. So you, you look at it and you go, well, like you haven't been born with all these privileges in life, but how lucky you was if you want to be a young footballer to be born to be eight in, in 1990 when Italian 90 is the first World Cup, then it's 92, the Premier League, and then it's Sky Sports and the big money starts coming and then all the best foreigners come over and he teaches about diet and training and discipline and then to grow up and play in the Premier League as an 18, 19, 20 year old and you're playing against, you know, my debuts against JJ Acocha, Fernando Hierro, Ivan Campo. Next week, then you, you, you know, you're playing at Spurs and it's Gus Poyet and Jamie Redknapp and, and, and then you got to play against Roy Keane, Gerard, Vieira, Machalele, Lampard. I mean, I could be here all day. And I go, what a lucky bastard. Do you know what I mean? In terms of just born at a great time. Yeah. And and actually, the, the, you know, you weren't, but he didn't have everything given to you in terms of the cards. And it was tough and you had to rain your stripes and get out of it. But also, I believe you can make whatever you want to yourself. Like people always say, and especially with my rap sheet, they go, oh, he's done the same again. Leopard can't change his spots. I'm like, I'm not a fucking leopard. You, you know, do you know what I mean? Peter Kay, who's, who's the, probably the biggest uh, influence on my life, who was sport and chance clinic, who was a clinical psychologist really, but became a great friend of mine. He taught me about uh, the brain and, and, and the way it works. And, you know, when, when I think back to it, you know, he was... He told me a story one time. I think he was about 33, 34. And his thing was drinking drugs. And he drank himself to the point where I think his pancreas had packed up on him. So he was on a life support machine at 33, 34. I think he had three kids at the time. Um, and he says it was about the fifth or sixth time I'd been woken up in hospital. He said, but this time, like everyone's faces around me when I came round, wasn't like, it wasn't the norm. And they said, you've, look, you've been in a coma here for like two weeks. You've been given your last rites like four times. Like, if you drink again, you're going to die. Um, and he said, my first thought, he said, Joe, honestly, my first thought was as soon as these leave the room, I'm going the off license and I'm getting back on the scotch. Like, um, And he said, Everyone left the room and he said, this big Nigerian nurse came in. He said, he said she must have been about 20 stone. He said, I'd never seen her before. He said, I'd never seen this woman before. And he said, um, in my mind, I'm thinking, as soon as these fuck off I'm f and I can get out and I've got, he said, I've got the tubes, tubes in my nose, catheter. He said, I, I, you know, but I'm thinking I'm, I, I'm, I'm taking for the drink here. Um, and you've told him you're going to die if you drink. He said, but such is the power of the illness. It's telling him, it's telling him. He said, and this Nigerian nurse pulls him and she says, uh, Peter, she says, uh, I've worked at this hospital X amount of years and I've seen a lot of people come in in all different states. And she said, I've never seen anybody as far gone as, as what you was. And she said, and I don't know how you've managed to, to pull through and, and I don't know how, man, how you're still here. She said, but somebody somewhere wants you to be alive. There's, there's, there's a calling for you. And it's important that um, you get in touch with that. And he said, that was the first time I thought, I'm not going to drink just today. He said, after she spoke down, he said, and then she left the room. He said, and then I just thought, right, I'm not, uh, when I get, I'm going to have one day sober. I'm just going to try for one day sober. I think he had 33 years sober, Peter, and became a drug and alcohol counsellor. I don't know, he definitely changed my life, like, uh, irreconcilably. Like, I wasn't capable of, like, empathy at the level I, I, I now am because, um, you know, it just formulated my personality, survive the rough and ready council estates of, of Liverpool. You know, for me to think about somebody's feelings, um, you know, was was not how I was brought up. And as I say, very, very fortunate through the chaos in my life and being a, um, a young footballer with notoriety that I, I met this incredible man who, who, who changed my life uh, for the better um, because he'd, he'd lived such a colourful life himself. What was it like signing for Man City? It, it was quite straightforward. As I said to you, that story there where I get released by Everton. Um, so the guy who'd left 
Everton had gone to Manchester City. Barry Poynton, who was the scout, when I told you the regime had you changed. Have a good relationship with him. Well, he found he, he'd found out within twenty five minutes. He was he was really good um, scout, really good, and you know, m- massively responsible with a few others. You know, Jim Cassell, Alex Gibson, and Frankie Bunn for the the success of Manchester City's academy. I think we had, you know, from from myself, Sean Ray Phillips, you know, Daniel Sturridge, Steve Yale, and Glenn Whelan, etc. I think we had. 26 full internationals whether England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales who came out of that academy in about a five or six year cycle that we were there so no doubt before the the oil and the Abu Dhabi money came into City you know it was the academy and the City's uh, belief in that academy that kept the club in, in its in its existence and as I say give me a fantastic opportunity but also many other talented uh, footy players and Barry phoned me the phone went down and I told you I had that resolve of who the fuck are these like and I don't know, 25 minutes later, maybe, phone call, Barry pointing. I've heard they've released you. What the fuck are they doing? Come come up to the train at Manchester City tomorrow. Now, Everton were in the Premier League at the time. Man City at the time were in the Championship. And in my time at Man City, they went in, before I signed YT, they went to League One. And I, I remember I was signing, as a, I was starting my YT in the summer of the Gillingham, Nicky Weaver, Paul Dickhoff, playoff final, you know, for City. And, so I was going back as a foot first time, left school, YTS footballer, the first season back in the championship after that mad final. Um, and then I was there then, you know, they, uh, they, they got in the champ and I think they went again, Joe Royal, the next year they got promoted at Black, Blackburn at the last game of the season. Then they went down and they sacked Joe Royal and Kevin Keegan took over, they came back up and then they established themselves as a Premier League club and, and I got my debut off Kevin Keegan in the Prem. So I, I was lucky that, you know, Barry Poynton believed in me at the time and the coaches he had, you know, see your talent. debut though, was, did, were you not getting put on and then yeah. somebody stole your strap? Is that real? Is that true? Yeah, so, um, but my I made my debut at 20 and and um, at 19, I, I was in the first team squad. So six months before I made my debut, or f- might have been five, six months, I'll have to check the, the, the dates I've added too many balls I was at the near post I remember mm. them um, vividly but I, I got put in the squad we were playing uh, Middlesbrough away and now I was the youngest so Sean Wright Phillips had, was the year older than me as he was a, a year above me all the time at Man City and a team right to get in the first team and do really really well and at, at, at a similar time Stephen Gerrard was in Liverpool's first team who would knew I'm from St John's Estate Stevie's from the Blue Bell and as I say, Tom Culshaw, who's Stevie's good mate, I got into Little Shaw, he's my cousin, and they lived in the same road. And I'd seen Stevie get in Liverpool's first team. I thought, fuck me, if he can do if he can get in Liverpool's first team, I can get in Man City's because without being disrespectful to City at the time, Liverpool, Real Madrid, Man United, like it's harder to get in them first teams than maybe it is to get in um some of the first teams. Um so I remember thinking, fucking hell, he's just a kid off, he's a spotty kid off the Johns like me, you know, off, off the bluebell, off the John. It's just, I knew all his family. I'd known Stevie growing up, never played against him because he's three years older than me. But I remember thinking, if he can do it, I can do it. And then I seen Sean Ray Phillips do it, who was a year above. And I thought and he was smashing it in the first team. And I thought, fucking hell, if he can do it, you know, I can do it. And then get in the first team, 19, Middlesbrough away. And I've not been on the bench or anything. And he puts me on the bench, uh, Kevin Keegan, and then we're two 0 down. And he turns around and he says, um, "Get warmed up, you're going on." I'm like, oh, hell, Premier League." And my dad had always said to me, "You'll get one chance at Premier League level. The margin of error is that like you'll get one chance, and you've got to take it. So you've got to be prepared at all times. It, it might be when you least expect it to take it." So I'm like, "Fucking wired in. This is my chance now." Unbeknown to me. A first team player that got injured on the Thursday and put in the squad late. I haven't been in the first team squad before, and the kit man's got to print up a number. I'm fucking 42 or something like that, 41. And he prints up one chair for me, Les Chapman, 41. So I'm on the bench in the game, and I've come out, and I'm watching the first. I'm like, what? I've not, I've not been on the benches as a, you know in the first team. And they all used to carry the pads in their hand and the shirts and the t- tie ups and the tape and that. So I thought, oh, this is what you do in the first team. So I've just copied them. Sat on the bench with me thing, warmed up at half time. Second half, he's gone, right, you're going on. So I've gone out to warm up, come back, got my pads on, gone down for my shirt. I'd left them under my uh, seat on the bench and, and my shirt's gone. Gone. So I'm thinking, this is the lads on the noise up. As you do, you're thinking, fucking hell. So I'm going, come on, lads. And they're going, don't know what you're on about, like, I'm like, come on. They're like, 
Keegan's now going, are you ready? I'm like, I haven't got my shirt. He's like, what? I'm like, I haven't got my shirt. So he's gone. So Chappie, the kit man, fucking go and get him another shirt. So Chappie's ran down into the dressing room. He's gone, where's your shirt? I've gone, I've, I've just left it with my pads there because I thought that's what you do. And I've warmed up at half time and walked up. And unbeknown to me at half time, one of the Middlesbrough fans has leaned over and fucking Billy wears my shirt. And how it's that happened to a scouser. Um, so my shirt's been, so now I'm turning around, pleading to the crowd. Les comes back out the changing room and goes to the manager. Gaffer, listen, I've only had one shirt for him. He got in the squad late notice. I've only printed one shirt up. There's no shirt for him. So he looks at me and goes, sit down, you fucking dickhead. You're not going on. So I'm turning around to the crowd going, look, whoever's robbed my shirt, I'll give you my shirt and my boots back at the end of the game. Gives me fucking shirt back. I'll give you them, not even ask you to suck it. And they're all just sitting there going, I had about six chances to sign for Middlesbrough and I never signed for them because I had a both. Because I got told he had one chance, right? So don't get on. Um, we end up losing the game. So he puts Ali Bernabe or whatever and I'm like, did you throw us? I'm like, as low as I felt since I got released, I thought that's my chance. So at the time, Robbie Fowler and Mac Manaman kind of took me under the wing, you know, looking after me as a, as a kind of young scouser. And I used to sit with the lads and that and I've just sat down in front of the coach on my own I was just fucking sobbing, just going, that that's my chance, that like. And um, no one, like, he didn't even, he didn't even have a go at me, Keegan. Like, he, he didn't even fucking say anything. And then he just left me out of a squad. He never put me in another squad for four months. He never used to speak to me, right? So I look back at it now and I go, and extreme, isn't it? mad, but I had him again, didn't I, at Newcastle? So I, had, I was lucky that we got a second, a second go. We got a second go of it. So, doesn't speak to me. And I'm playing in the reserves now. Now I'm double down. I'm playing even better than what I was when I got the first team chance. Like, cause I'm, I'm like, a, I, I'm at my best when I'm. Were you saying when my chips are down? Were you saying on mid? Saying on mid, yeah. Well, I play anywhere. Because I know you played the game, yeah. Up front when you were yeah, but I just play anywhere, lad. You mm. know what I mean? I just love footy. I play, play anywhere. I just love a game of footy. So back in the resies and I'm captain of the reserves. Then Asa Arf, it's our coach, and Asa was brilliant. He's just like, just keep your head down, keep doing what you've done. That got you that opportunity. If you keep doing it, can't ignore you. So he keeps doing it. And I had a big champion in Arthur Cox. Remember Arthur, the Al Derby County Newcastle manager, mm -hmm. who was Kevin Keegan's assistant um, at England and, and uh, Newcastle and City. Arthur really liked me. Um, and he was a bit old school, Arthur. And he, he really championed my course. And um, then I go out the team, as I say, with the jersey. Four months doesn't put me in a squad. But in about the last six weeks before I go in a the squad, they, they're not playing that well. And I'd come in on a on Sunday or a Monday and I'm with the reserves. And Arthur Cox, would, I'd be passing him in the corridor and he'd go, why aren't you in the first team? And I'd say, fuck, fuck knows, ask your mate, he fucking picks the team. I'm, I'm ready to go. And he'd, he'd walk off. Five weeks out, you should be in the first team. And he'd like grab me. And like try and, and I loved Arthur, do you know what I mean? But like he's, he's an half fella and he'd just grab you, pin you up against the wall, like by your collar. You should be in the first team because he'd been beat. And I'd say, well, tell the manager I'm I'm good to go here. Like I, I'm ready to go. Anyway, this this continues for four more weeks. This to the point where like I'm now going for fuck's sake, Arthur. Like you need to fucking go in and have a word. Like I'm ready to go, and I'd never swear at Arthur. Anyway, he goes. I like make sure you're ready. And then um, I I get put in a squad playing Bolton away in like the April. I always remember it was Grand National Day. Bolton away, and um, I think Mark Vivian Foe or someone had had the flu, and I'd never been on the bench for the first team since the shirts have been robbed. So I haven't been in a squad. I haven't been on the bench. And now I'm in a squad. So I'm thinking, I might be on the bench again here. We've done the team shaping, like, you know what I mean? I'm not in the team. Might be on the bench again here. Get to the stadium and um, he names the team, Keegan, in the dressing room, old school. And I'm gone. To myself, I've gone, I'm fucking sure he just said my name in the start 11 there. But like, no one said anything to me, do you know what I mean? I've gone. So Robbie Fowler's sitting next to me, so I've gone. Nudged him, I've gone, did he say my fucking name there? He's gone, fucking hell, you're starting, starts laughing. So I'm like, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> like, the reality <laughs> just did you, do you know what I mean? So I'm like, oh, fuck's sake, like, this is a sink or swim here. Like, I'm starting, I'm not even coming on as a bench, or, or, you know, to get it, I'm, I'm like in at the deep end here. So I remember, my arse is gone. And it was what we were talking about earlier, the, the, the famous, you know, we got it from Blackie again, uh, the custom auto stuff. Blackie was hugely in, influenced by, like, custom and the old boxing School used to say about the, the the difference between a hero and a coward. Uh, it's not in it's not how they feel. 
it, it's it's like what we, we spoke about your personality. You went towards that negative side. I went towards the positive side. It's what you do with that feeling. Everyone's scared. Everyone's shit scared. Everyone thinks they're not good enough. Everyone thinks everyone's better than them, better looking than them, teeth are straighter, speak better, dress better, cooler. Um, everyone's got that imposter syndrome. Um, some's some's imposter syndrome is is giant. Some's is very small. Some's confidence and egos giants and some's very small and it's 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 finding um what works for you so i always remember he says because you know the hero and the coward in that moment feel exactly the same they're both shitting themselves but it's what they do with that energy that 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 turns the hero into the hero and the coward into the coward so what i find is people avoid those situations where sink or swim putting them people want to be over prepared for everything now they you're a testament to that. What do you? What, what's your schedule? Fuck knows. I'll just get on with it, and I, and I know I'm a good cunt, and I know I'm good at what I do, and I know it'll work for me. And it's boss to see you smashing its head in because you're just following your path. People who succeed, they're the same. They just follow it. You know, you might start out wanting to be a footballer, but you end up being, you know, a lifestyle guru or something. You know, you see, I've seen a story about it was it was a Paul McVeigh who's getting like fifteen thousand pounds to speak. Um, to big businesses now and he starts out as a footballer and I'm like wow what a, what a success that is like you, you're not just a once one trick pony you know yeah you're going to have a short career where you could be a footballer till you're 35 and then after that you've got a you've got a, you've got a big life out in front of you like you're, you're a young man if you if you first if you dream about being a footballer which I did even in your wildest dreams at 40 years of age if you uh, if you've lived like a a, a, a um, a, a, a monk and you've done Pilates and yoga and that tofu and fucking done, done all your breathing and never had uh, 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 the wrong carb in your life and never had the pint of lager you might get to be 40 before you have to knock it on the head but then you've got a huge life out in front of you um, and, and for me as I say you know some, t some days you will act like a coward but that doesn't mean you are a coward you can you know the, the leopard doesn't change its spots you can change your spots I've seen as I say, Peter Kay, great mate of mine, who said I nearly killed myself through drugs and alcohol abuse, become a drugs and alcohol counsellor and changed thousands of people's lives for the better. People who he'll never, ever meet. As I say, a society grows great when men plant trees of which the fruit they'll, they'll never get a sample. Um, and, and I think the world we live in now, um, you know, we've, we've got to do more of that. We've got to leave the world a better place than, than what we found. If uh, it's not ours, like, we're, you know, we're, we're just... We're just passing through. Yeah, we're just in these vessels. We're just passing through. So see when you've then got your debut, see with that fear and the, the one either you push against it or you pull back, did you, was that in your mind just to give it everything? So so this is how I knew it. You know, people talk about, you know, I just knew I, I, don't, I, can't, I can't explain this to you. I knew I was ready. I could play men's football. I knew the bigger the challenge, every time the challenge got bigger for a young kid, so the bigger crowds I played in, cup finals and, I always got better. What age were you when you made your debut? Uh, I was 20. I made right, my debut yeah, at 20. Yeah, yeah. Um, I should have made it at 19. Um, but because my share got shot, Billy Wiz, lad. Yeah, mm -hmm. middle for So, um, but when I went in, I never came back out. So I never got dipped in. I went in and stayed in. But I was a bit older. So you see people get dipped in at 17, 18, 19. And everyone's different. Everyone, you know, Rooney was playing and banging them in. Top bins at 16 <laughs> against an invincible team, David Seaman, you know you know what I mean? But then, you know, when did he retire, Rooney? 31, you know, with Cristiano still going. So, uh, you know, f for me, um, e everybody gets dealt a, a set of cards. It's. It, I think if you get a 2-7 off suit and you turn that into a pair of jacks by the end of the year, no, I think you've done well. If you get a pair of aces and you end up with fucking a pair of sixes at the end, then you fuck the job up somehow. And, um, you know, you, you've just got to make the best of, of the way you see the world. You know, you, you try and treat people how you'd like to be a uh, threat. You know, for me, if I see someone working hard and being a good cunt, I'll try and help them out. If I see someone acting like a cunt, I'll ignore them. Or I might sometimes take them to task because I think, you know, someone needs to re-engineer re, re, uh, re you. You know, every now and again, so, so someone comes along in all of our lives who goes, what the fuck are you up to? Um, and hold up a mirror to you. And I think we all need that. Um, I was a bit disappointed with his stance recently on Israel, but Jordan Peterson's really good stuff uh some really good stuff in, in, in recent years um, in terms of, you know, 
becoming the master of your own destiny. Mm -hmm. You know, how can you do anything if you don't get up and make your bed in the morning? Um, and, and I think the, the more people are out there talking about good examples, like when you're saying you, you're clean and sober and what you're up to and how your life's turned around. And as I say, at some point people were saying, ah, James can't, Leopard can't change his spots and you fucking proved them wrong because, you know, every drug and alcoholic gets up and goes, right, that's it, I'm done. You know, for Peter, it was a massive intervention in terms of he nearly lost his life, but at, at, he got up and said, I'm not drinking again. I'm going to take it one day at a time. I believe you choose to allow stuff in. So offence, I choose to be offended because if someone calls me a fat cunt and I, and I, and I go, oh, no, I'm a bit out of shape at the minute and I, and I accept that offence. If I'm not, I'd go, should be a fucking idiot. I just looked at me like, what the fuck's he on about? But now with social media, people can just offend you. You put a finger up saying, you know, where's my podcast with Joey Barton or whatever. And there'll just be a load of people offending you, a load of people supporting you and just the all gamut in, in between that. Because, yeah. you know, that that is the world we now live in where everyone's got an opinion yeah. um, and everyone thinks their opinion's valid. How long were you with, 35 years? I was with City for nine years, James. Nine? Nine years, yeah. Oh, because yeah. you went after... Everton. So I left Everton at yeah. 14. But you Sign played for professional five years um, in the Premier League. Well, I, well, yeah, I went, um, so I left Everton at 14 and, and I didn't just like make it. I nearly, nearly didn't make it about nine or 10 times from 14 to 18 and a half. I was touch and go all the way. Every six weeks, every six months, I was being reevaluated. Is he going to be big enough? And at about 17, 18, um, I was faced with a kind of life uh, like a crossroads in your life. There's a representational team from our borough, Nosley, that goes and plays in the Dallas Cup. And it's kind of really good semi-pro footballers. Um, you know, lads who will play for kind of teams below the Vauxhall, it's not the Vauxhall Conference, like the National League. So the conference in Scotland, that they probably play in your Premier League because... It's about that standard, isn't it? In the bottom part of the lake. In the bottom part of the same. Yeah. They already yeah. ate me the uh, Scottish son. <laughs> Flop. Joey Barton yeah. has a go at Scotland, they'll say. Yeah. Um, but no, like, so our pyramid in terms of, um, you know, your, your team, you know, full-time professional is kind of Division 2, Division 1, Championship, Premier League. Obviously, it, it, the National League, you get some pro teams with big budgets and some semi-pro teams. And then the next tiers below that, they, 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 my dad kind of played that level. But these lads or go and get a scholarship in America and get a degree and they'll play collegiate football in America. It's just, they just hit the bar. They're not good enough to make it a, a professional level in the UK, but are still good and go and get an education and a different, you know, experience of life by going to the States. Um, and it gets them away from Nosley, as I say, which has got not fantastic career prospects for, for further education. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the Dallas thing for me, I'm not really fancy that city. And I was training with these lads and then I was easily good enough to go with them at, when I was younger and I got selected for their team. And at the point, City are going to release me the saying, well, we're you touch and go. And I remember saying to me, dad, listen, I might as well leave City because City don't really fancy me. They haven't fancied me for the last couple of years. I'll go to Dallas. There might be scouts there from fucking who knows, Mexico, because like Ajax would be out there, you know, Guadalajara. I'm going, I'll do really well there and I'll get an offer of a scholarship and I might get a, a team that really fancy me. So I was like really torn between it. And my dad's like, listen, you can fucking always go to Dallas. Like they're, they're semi-pro. Stay at City till they kick you out. Till, till they say you're no longer any good. You're not good enough and you need to leave. And he said, and use the gym. Because if you leave there, you're going to have to get a gym membership and you're going to have to train on your own. You can't just fucking sit in the house. They only train twice a week. You're training every day a week here, so you're going to fall behind the elite level players. So stay at City until you've ex like you've ex over ex overstayed your welcome. Um, so I remember him going, you know what? He's right there. So we're not back going to America, and stayed at City. And I just I had to get the I I, I wasn't good enough that they would put me up in digs. So I was on a non contract. They didn't even give me a YT because they were so unsure about me. So I had to get the bus in from Liverpool every morning. So I'd get out, I'd leave our house in Eighton at half six. I'd get to Eighton train station quarter to I was like I'd run to the train station quarter to seven, train from there to Red Jill, jump off at Red Jill, run to the National Express bus station, get on the National Express bus to Manchester City Centre from the Rocky, uh, get off there, get another bus to Moss Side, the nine bus all the way through Manchester, all the way through Moss Side to Main Road jump off at main road, get me kit from the laundry 
and then run across Moss Side through the back alleys to Platte Lane, which was in train two sessions, morning and afternoon, five or six o'clock. Say I'd have to run across to put me dirty kit it back in the laundry, back on the bus in the middle of Moss Side, which was tricky at the time. You'd have to have your wits to buy you. Um, and then back to city centre, back on the National Express. So I'd leave our house at a quarter to seven and I'd get in seven or eight o'clock from 16 to 19. So I couldn't get in any trouble. Mm -hmm. So like, but then I wasn't doing football. I wasn't in and I was just about getting by. having my exes. If I could bunk on the National Express and not get, you got like a 10 trip fucking pink card like a, like a zony, like a save away, and they'd clip off every time. And if you could get through without him clipping one off, that meant you got yeah, an extra yeah. journey. And there was four or five of us doing the same journey. And you'd have to, you know, if you could have half inch a paper or a, a chocolate bar on the way back from a news agent, that was not coming out of your exes at, at the end of the week. Yeah. You know what I mean? You were, you were living hand to mouth for like three or four years. And as I say, using the gym. And Jim, I always remember Jim Cassell, who was the academy director, he pulled me in. And he said, um, everyone's telling me I should release you. Like, I've, I've, I've canvassed everybody about keeping you on. And and nobody's in, like, nobody wants to do it. And he said, but I'm looking in your eyes and I can see there's a fire and I see you practicing in the dome and I see you going in the gym and I see you leaving here at half five when lads are getting off at, like, two o'clock. And he said... I'm I'm gonna keep you on for six more six more months, and that happened to me about three times, and then I just grew and caught everyone up, and then I'd had this training habit because I was doing extras, and then me, I, I filled into my size that I was gonna be, and then once I got ahead of everybody, I had the 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 uh, black sheep kind of mindset of out training and being okay with you know in football you're busy cunt. Oh, look at that busy cunt doing his extras and look at that busy cunt going to the gym. I was cool with that because my dad said to me, listen, you're in a team of 20 lads there. If you're a really talented group, one of your lads will get in the first team. So that you might think they're all your mates and all that now, but it's going to be him or you for the first team yeah. jersey. And I came off a rough and ready council estate where I knew it was close margins. See, when you broke into the first team and you established just there was a first team player, because you got yourself in a bit of hassle. What was it? When was the first time you got in trouble? Um, You're not fighting with a team. First pre-season, I think I had a ding dong, didn't I? At Doncaster, did I not start like a twenty-two man brawl or something like that? <laughs> um, so I, came, you know, that summer I played. I made my debut against um, Bolton. We lost two 0 but I must have done well because he's kept me in the starting eleven. So the, the second game I played against Tottenham at White Hart Lane and scored. And my dad's just meant to be this big hard case was at the game and fainted because he'd seen me score. Big emotional fucking soft shite. Fainted in the crowd. So I always say, can you remember my first goal? And he can't because he was fucking unconscious in the, air, <laughs> in the stand at White Hart Lane. Um, and then I think my, my sixth game was at Anfield. First time I'd ever played at Anfield and we beat them 2-1. And I, everyone would tell me, it's mythical, you can't win at Anfield. First time we go, Nicholas and Elsa scores too. We beat them 2-1. I seen Peter Schmeichel make the best save I've ever seen live in the same game from Milan Barros, double save. And I thought, fucking hell, it's easy. I've been to Anfield in the reserves and played them one there and I played against Liverpool's teams all the way through growing up and always had the number. But I'd never played the first team. The first time I ever played there, we dust them 2-1. They don't make the Champions League. I never fucking won there again. I thought, fucking easy, they should crack it. I think the best they ever got there again was a draw. And, you know, I didn't come out the first team, so... I played in all of them games, um, started, played 90 minutes in them all, got to the end of the season and I thought, you know, no one's really spoke to you. It's not like now where people are talking to you at all different levels. Signed a new deal, went from like 600 quid a week um, playing in the first team to the end of that season. I think they put me on like six grand. So that's like life-changing money for me. You know, I'm like the highest earner that's ever lived in our family. You know, I can think about like buying a house and like moving out to me, me nan's uh, spare bedroom and all that and um and then you know Keegan signs Claudio Reyna that summer and I funnily enough he's just texted me this afternoon Paul Bosfeld so Claudio Reyna centre midfielder American captain and Paul Bosfeld who'd 
two years before, was a Dutch international and was captain of Feyenoord and lifted the Europe, uh, UEFA Cup as it was known then. I think it's Europa League now. So I thought, this fucker doesn't fancy me. He's fucking bringing in these cunts to replace me. Unbeknown to me, I got Keegan a second time at Newcastle when he came back to Newcastle and he said, no, no, you were a young lad, you'd only played seven games. I didn't know whether I could rely on your body for... I said, well, why don't you fucking sit me down and tell me? Because I thought you didn't fancy me and I fucking hated you because I thought you're bringing in these... But I just seen it as a challenge and, and to be fair, I played over all of them uh, um, that, some, that, that season and that pre-season... <laughs> I was fighting for my existence because they'd come in. We played Doncaster in a friendly and I don't do friendlies. I don't do anything. For, like, I, I play to win in, in, in everything. If I, like, play my kids on FIFA, I, I can't let them win. Like, I, I go, no, if you beat me, you, you're better than me. So I'll, I, I, I have to have competition. Um, and, 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 you know, the pre-season friendly, um, you know, sometimes when you're a Premier League club and you play them, kind of League One championship clubs, a few of the... F- the, the 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 knobs get carried away, don't they? You know, especially if you're a young player, like you know, grace respect to them. Like they, they try and mark the territory. Certainly, they did in them days, and especially in central areas. So I always remember, I think the striker's name, and he was about six foot nine, Leo Fortune West. Um, had gone in for a ball, but it was like a, just a ridiculous tackle for preseason. Do you know what I mean? Like really high. So I remember giving it to him, like saying he was fucking massive. Like he was only spotty twenty year old. And he's six foot nine, man, thirty, and I'm giving it to him, saying you fucking big shitbag. And um, the next tackle, he's come in and he's he's properly tried to do me, but obviously being as cunning and as I was, you know, I grew up in a rough and ready part of the world, and certainly playing football, you've got to be tough to survive. Fucking seeing it coming, especially a big dope centre forward like that, and 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 managed to ride his tackle, and you know where you just land on them. So I've landed, landed on him and anyway, the captain or something has, has flew in anyway, separated. Five minutes after that, there's a centre mid for them who's, you know, looks like the milky bar kid as I'm pressurising him and he's done that one, you know, where they fall on the ball and they put the ball in between the legs so they're like obstructing you but it's not a foul. And instead of letting them get up or letting the ref stop it, I've just continued to kick through the, him and the ball while the ball's on the floor. Obviously, it's on now. So all, all players are having it. And obviously, I'm, I've started it. Um, and I think their, their captain's got, there's a famous picture of him, like, gripping me round the neck. But, like, I'm like, he's like a 36-year-old fella. I'm 20. And he's waited to, like, have, like, you know, a pre-season friendly to grip up a young kid. Like, I'd never think of doing that as a 35-year-old senior to a young player. I'd be like, come on, kid. But, obviously, you know, everyone's different. So, I get in the dressing room at half-time, pre-season friendly, and... Kevin Keegan's the manager and he absolutely gets like right after me just like fucking takes me off starts having a go because I've started the 22 man fucking scrap in a pre-season friendly pretty much and then after that James the die was pretty much cast that was Joey Barton pantomime villain and then every story that came after that that was the narrative like that was like that's the caricature you're going to be there's good cop and bad cop you know Batman and the Joker and and that's 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 where we're going with you, like, and and then obviously you know the, the stuff you get into afterwards uh, becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. In, in Did you way. feel that though? As soon as that happened, you had to play up to that character Did you, because were you like that before any of that stuff happened? Yeah, yeah, I've always have been rough and ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always been rough and ready. Like even as a young kid, before I was, you know, that, that just my personality. I've always been abrasive in terms of I stand up for what I believe in. As I say, I come from. Liverpool come from Heighton, which is a, 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 a set of very, very principled people. Grew up in um, a time where, you know, we, we were coming off the back of, you know, Thatcher's Tory austerity in, in, in our area. Coming into, you know, I'm, I'm seven years of age when, when Hillsborough happens and, and seeing the, the aftermath of that. So you grow up very anti-establishment and very anti um, um, authority um, and, and, and you, you, you form your own... Um, view of the world and, and you know, as I say you know some of the greatest people I've, I've ever met come from that area really principled you know fantastic people um, and again you know you, you know the difference between right and wrong and you know for me you know it, it is a there's a little bit of an area Liverpool certainly our area where you know if you act like a cunt um, you know you, you, there's a ramification of that you know you, you're not allowed to just behave and say what you want and saying to you on the way in you know the world's gone a bit weird because um people have forgotten what it's like to get punched in the face you know they think they can just say whatever they want to people online and in these different things and um you know where i grew up if if you had a 
um, very very strong opinion and um, you wasn't able to back that up um, then then you wasn't able to have that opinion see when your your brother as well was involved in a murder how did that affect you did, was, did the media come after you for that because we can't stop yeah. or affect what other people do in their lives but being a professional footballer known as a hothead did they use that against you was that a moment where they yeah, came look, they came for you things happen don't they like you know I look back at it and you, you can't chart your course like it's so haphazard like it's so you know you try and make plans and these people and, and I'm, all, I'm doing my pro license by the end of this week and they talk about planning into the future and I'm like I'm 41 here but like it's so tough to plan it it's such a random um, journey and you know highs and lows and everything in between um, f f for me you know the the, the area I grew up in, as I say, I can remember, you know, my mum's side of the family with, you know, my dad's side of the family, not crime orientated and you know, quite working, you know, working collar and working, always working jobs and roofers and abattoir, um, you know, butchers, etc. cetera. Um, my nan always worked. And then me, me, my mum's side of the family, slightly different, um, you know, uncles involved in, you know, robbing post offices, robbing banks, led them into, you know, I think becoming heroin addicts. Um, you know, certainly as I've got older, you know, they've had struggles with heroin. Um, and just life of crime. So I've seen the, the contrast of both, both sides. Know, a family Same. trying to yeah, yeah, yeah. work their way out. Hey, you know, it's a huge life experience. I just put it down to, you know, it's a fantastic tool, tools to have available to deal with, you know, the world as it presents itself to me now. Um, so I always remember being in ours in the school holidays and we used to have a sliding patio uh, door in Boundary Road and um, my dad would never let any my dad didn't really get on with my mum's family particularly well I know why now and it's not for hearing in, in this podcast but I didn't understand it at the time but he wouldn't let, let like my uncles come down the path and all that they weren't allowed near our house if they came to see my ma they'd have to shout from the end of the gate they'd have to shout Rita my ma's name and my ma would come out and she'd sometimes let them in but if 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 my dad found out he'd been in the house, there used to be fucking murder. He'd be like, don't have them fucking... And for whatever reason, he just never got on with them. As I say, I understand why now. And um, I always remember this afternoon, school holidays, and I was checking the fucking teletext because that's how I used to uh, find out what was happening before social media. You had to sling the teletext on to see if Evan was signing anyone. And you'd have all the rumours in the paper, so bang, got the teletext on. I just remember this banging on the patio fucking... Uh, window so I've opened the patio it's my uncle Eddie and uh, he's flustered and that so I've let him in and as I've opened the door I've heard like you know, like the helicopter I thought the f so I've real I've, he's come running in with all these things he's only based at, I think a post office and he's had all this so he's upstairs now in ours and I'm, after, I'm having to follow him because I'm thinking I'm only about 12 at the time I'm thinking fucking half hour's going to kill me here because Eddie shouldn't be in ours so I've gone upstairs and that and he's obviously got this bag with all notes in and he's like listen I was into Sabutio and stickers at the time. And he's gone, listen, don't fucking tell your dad I've been here. Um, I've had to say Chase from the busy day. I've just robbed a post office. I'm keeping all the notes. He kept all the notes and he said, if you don't tell your dad I've been in here, you can keep all the um, coins. All the coins. So at the time, you know, 12, it must have only been about fucking 40 quid in, in, in coins. But that was like winning the lottery. So I thought, fucking hell, right, I better keep your stomach here. So I've obviously got the, the coins and obviously allowed me to get a few new Sabutio teams and goals and that for me Sabutio or get uh, stickers or whatever I was into, Shoot Magazine or Match Magazine. So I remember that at a young age, you know what I mean, in terms of like crime was just around us, you know, as I say, um, there was kind of, smackheads were kind of forbidden on the estate. So as kids, we'd had carte blanche to kind of attack any smackheads we've seen. So have you seen anybody toot, like tooting up or whatever? And, and there was flats and all that by ours you know you, you could throw bricks at them or they were like a subspecies of 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 creature on our estate and like the, the brown was just forbidden on St John's there was other estates where that happened but heroin was just a no-no and that was the, the local art cases who enforced that you know the police didn't really come on our estate if they did you know they were made unwelcome relatively relatively quickly i mean i remember finding uh, an, a, an undercover we used to climb in the flats above the shops where where, where our school was and you know, obviously make dens in there and we, we'd knock through wall after wall you know just kids playing in the in the, in the school holidays or whatever and i remember we broke in broke in through a wall into one of the flats and there was a, a full surveillance kit set up and geared pointing out the windows at um 
one of the houses of someone we knew. So obviously we didn't touch it because you know you you wired in at the time. You you know the difference um, between um, being a grass and not being a grass. Uh, you know from a from a very young age, and um, obviously when I made you know the fella whose house it was pointed that away. And obviously, I remember them coming around and giving us all the dropsy, do you know what I mean? But they went in and obviously, um, mm -hmm. you know, took all the equipment out. Uh, you know, I remember seeing a kid getting stabbed at 17. I remember my half fellas mate, Ago, getting murdered at uh, 14, 15. I remember my uncle Joe got murdered in the Bluebell pub, got hit over the head with the pool queue. I must have only been 10, 11. So, but you thought it was normal. You thought, oh, everybody must be seeing this. And don't forget, on TV at the time, we're watching the Iraq war, we're watching Kosovo, we're watching Serbia, we're watching Sarajevo be bombed. So you're going, Canelo, it's rough on the Johns, but at least we're not fucking getting bombed. You know, you didn't know that this this other world was out there. And I presumed it was, we're thinking kids in Glasgow are the same. They love the footy and it's rough and ready. Kids in every other big town in the city are in the same boat. And, you know, for us, it was perfectly normal. You know, it's only when you look back at it now, you go, fucking hell. Yeah. Like, we must have been traumatised yeah, getting yeah, through there, yeah, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you know no different, James, do you? You just fucking mm -hmm. make the best of what you've got. And listen, you know, who knows if the cards have been dealt enough away. You might have, you know, you might have turned out to be a fucking right wanker. Yeah. What happened after Man City? Why did they release you? Zizzy didn't release me. You signed for Newcastle 5.8? Yeah, so I went to City, why, why got in City's you, why first why did you, why did you Well, I had um, I had a few scrapes, didn't I? So I had, um, I had... Were you becoming a problem because of all the shit that you were causing? Because like I say, it never affected your football, but when you seem to have lost that, you fucking lost it. Nothing you, nothing could really, you couldn't really rein it back. See, I don't think I did, you know? That's that's a scary thing about it, isn't it? That That's the perception of it, buddy. <laughs> I, I did yeah. like you yeah that that's not so obviously because you've got to have that clean cut I mean to be in the Premier League you know that yourself maybe now but you look at all now the, you do yeah. clean now cut you where do, yeah. you rein it in where they're speaking properly you never re seem you seem to have stayed Liverpool mindset you seem to where you grew up where I'm fighting any cunt who says anything or goes against it because obviously the trouble outside that must affect you as well because you're getting the, getting the jail getting sent off and then yeah. causing fucking riots like did nobody ever say to you, look, you're just young, fucking screw the head, or was it just a case that he can... Listen, if you're playing good football, as long as you're playing well on a Saturday, I mean, a little bit less now because you've got the old cancel culture, you know, I think just seeing that with the um, kind of, you know, footballers step out of line now, it's there's a different tolerance level from when we were young. You know, obviously the media introspection into your life is completely different with social medias, you know, put a huge magnifying glass on the lads. Um you know, for 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 us, it was kind of like they're just young lads being young lads. You know, and young boys, young men act like dicks sometimes, especially if you've put in a right few shilling in the pocket and a bit of fame and a bit of notoriety. All of a sudden, you know, they, they just, you know, you, you start to believe that you are the reincarnation. You know, you are sent from the gods to, you know, mm. you know, own the world. You know, we all get this megalomania kind of, I'm the centre of the universe kind of mindset as a young person and then obviously your wings get clipped because you make a few mistakes or you get in a few scrapes and as I say then you make your way through life and then you know the the, the more and more I live life the more and more I realise that oh I'm having I'm not having the same life I'm not having the same life experiences as other people like most other people don't achieve everything they've dreamt of achieving by the age of 23 24 like you know most people spend their whole lives chasing something and, and then changing the and then changing and changing and changing but when you do something and you set out on a course and there's all sorts going on around you all kinds of different things going on around you and you manage you manage to stay steadfast in that when you're 15 16 17 18 and there's women and there's drugs and there's all them temptations and you manage to go no not for me i know where i'm going or your mates are going to parties and they're telling you all these great stories and you're in the house and you're watching Match of the Day and you're, you're having tea and toast with your nan and you're going to bed at 10 o'clock on a Saturday and on a Friday night and you know, and you're going, is this going to pay me back? Like, I'm no guarantee to make it. You know, is this going to pay me back? And then and then you do it and you make it and then, you know, you want to play in the Premier League and then you play in the Premier League and then you want to play for England and you play for England and then you realise, not only do I never have to work again, my kids are never going to have to work again. And even their kids might, you know, keep going here, you know. And then you just think, wow, the cards I was dealt and the tools I was given in my toolbox, 
and now I've, I've smashed it. I remember signing for Newcastle, signed, signed a five-year deal. What was that decision for to leave City? City, I'd just outgrown City at the time. I'd got really frustrated. I, I was trying to, you know, I, I had Frank Lampard, Steven Gerrard ahead of me in the England national team and I'd, I'd kind of been captain in the February. Um, five or six teams had tried to buy me in the, in, in, in the kind of summer and the window before that. You know, City were kind of fighting to, to stay up. Um, John Wall, who's a great guy, was the chairman at the time and he was keeping the club going. The sale sale of Sean Wright Phillips kept the club going. The sale of like, lads who were coming through the academy were keeping the club's head above the water. Then we started trading in, you know, everyone was buying foreign players, but when you, you're then getting the shit, you know, the, the, the shitty end of the stick, you're not getting the top boys. And they were good lads, but there were some maggots in there as well. Um, and then the, the culture just started slowly to, to erode and... I just thought if I want to further my career selfishly, I need to leave Man City. I, you know, I want to get in the England squads. Frank and Stephen are ahead of me. Uh, you know, they're playing for Chelsea and Liverpool respectively, scoring every week. I've got fucking no chance if I'm happy to. You know, I was City's top scorer the season before I left with nine goals. Like I'm not I known for scoring goals, James. And we stayed up comfortably in the Premier League, which is bonkers when you think of it now. Um, and you know, I had a ding dong with Usman Darbo. Um, I'd had the first, so we had the, the pre-season friendly with uh, Doncaster. Doncaster. That was the kind of uh, fuse was was lit after that. Um, the cigar then, in the eye. So then, uh, what was I, 21, 22, we've had, I'm in the first team, we had the Christmas party. So the lad who, who that happened, Jamie Tandy's the year below me, we played in the same FA Youth Cup team. So I knew him all the way through. He's a Wivenshaw boy. I'm a Liverpool boy. Withenshaw's, I think, the biggest council estate in Europe. So, rough and ready. I'm from the Johns, rough and ready. Um, I'd always got on all right with Tandy, but he was a bit leery. He was like a little bit of a beefcake, a little bit leery, but didn't really have, as I say, you know, I grew up not not into boxing, but Peter Coleshaw, me, me second cousin, is was strawweight world champion. My granddad um, was, was one of the key um, people in starting a boxing club in, in the area I'm from, um, Heighton. Um, my granddad was Navy boxing champion so I'd, I'd kind of been even though I played football my uncle Paul was, was a good ABA boxer I mean next door one, one, uh, but one neighbour Frankie Lachans half fellow was a good England schoolboy boxer we always so you know and, and you were fighting every day in school you are fighting in the, you know rival fucking estates you you know as, as well drilled as you were for the game of footy 10,000 hours of purposeful practice we probably had a good 8,000 of them you know had the fighting amongst ourselves or you know fighting you know, in that young youth space and in, in, in the rough and readiness of, of, of working class Liverpool at that time. You know, you had to defend the space that you stood up in because if you got yourself caught on the, in the wrong part of town at the wrong time, you got taxed. Whatever you had on you, got so off you, you know what I mean? And we didn't have much, but, you know, it still stung if you got filled in and got taxed, you know, got your gear took off you. So you had to have your wits about you at all times. And, um, you know, the, the, the toolbox you, you're developing for it is is to survive. You know, my dad was teaching me how to survive in the rough and ready world he was surviving and he didn't ever think I was going to be a footballer and, you know, have to um, behave in a, in a different way. Um, and, and then obviously you get that exposure and as I say, the Tandy one, we're in a nightclub in, in Manchester. I think we were dressed as the Beatles, you know, the old Sergeant Peppers. There was four of us, me, Les Chapman, James Black and someone else. Robbie Fowler, Mach and were army men, if I remember I can't remember what Tandy was dressed as, but like all the players were there, fancy dress. And we were on the booze all day, Sunday morning. So all on the booze. Um, and then I think Paul Bosfeld or Fowler started it, but they were all in fancy dress in this bar and they started setting each other's costume alight. So it was the seniors who started just burning the edge of it or whatever. And it quickly, in five or 10 minutes, it went round the whole group and then it stopped. And then there was a karaoke and people were singing. And then... I'd burnt Tandy's costume. So someone had got me and I'd ended up getting Tandy back. Not No malice in it. He didn't have the opportunity to get me back. So the, everything gets calmed down. Lighters are confiscated off everybody, right? By the security. We have a karaoke, carry on drinking. This is like three or four in the afternoon now. Six o'clock, we've all gone, we're going for a team meal and you had to go and change out your fancy dress to get changed into your smart casual. So we go back to the hotel, change out the fancy dress. That's meal, still boozing. Seven or eight o'clock now. We're in a nightclub. Now, Danny Mills 
who was our right back at the time, had gone as Jimmy Savile. So I was walking around dressed as Jimmy Savile. <laughs> un inappropriate now, as you can imagine. Me, you wouldn't yeah. do it now. But loads, <laughs> loads did go as Jimmy fucking Savile in the fancy dress, didn't he? Fucking crazy nonce. Um, <laughs> and um, um, so we're in this nightclub at eight o'clock, all in our civvies, and Danny Mills is still smoking a cigar. So we're just sitting at the table talking and all that. And I always remember they had this like white nylon fucking Prada t-shirt on. Like just dead plain t-shirt. I just remember sitting here talking like across the like a glass table like this and had an ashtray in and I thought the ashtray moved, but it was actually stuck to the table. Mills is sitting here smoking a cigar show and I fill up somebody else here and I'm sitting here. And like everyone just mingling around in this bar. And I just remember thinking, what the fuck's that? And I've looked like that, and it's just a light here. And my t-shirt's on fire. Like it's like obviously flammable material, it's on fire. Like, so I've had to like rag it off and stump it out. And as I've looked like that, Tandy's, Jamie Tandy's standing here. Now I know I've set fire to his fancy dress costume four hours earlier. So he's obviously got me back. But I'm in my normal clobber. So I'm burnt now, got my top off. It's burnt my whole top. So I'm now needing to go home and get changed. And there's, a, there's an ashtray. So I've gone for the ashtray. And I couldn't get the ashtray off the table. So I've managed to take Millsy's cigar off it. So as I, as I've, turned Tandy's standing right next to me but he's looking the other way as if by the way I haven't done that so for some bizarre reason unknown to me to this day I thought it'd be a fantastic idea as a payback to him to stump the cigar out on the back of his head right that was my logic makes no sense now but at the time a burn for a burn he's getting this on the back of his head as I've gone like that to stick it on the back of his head he's naturally felt me coming and turned towards me and it's managed to graze his eyelid right He's gone down, as you would if somebody fucking grazes your eyelid. I haven't, think how hard it is. If someone moves towards your eye with the finger, you're moving. But anyway, grazes his eyelid. Stupid thing to do. Tandy's in this all players party with his brother. He's brought his brother to the party. So Tandy and his brother scarper off to the toilets. He's had this cigar put out on his head. Danny Mills is going to me, what the fuck have you done? Macker and uh, Fowler now, like, what's going on? We're all bevied. I'm like, listen, he fucking set fire to my shirt. So I've just fucking stumped a cigar out on him. I don't know, I've coughed him in the eye. Because I've just gone like that and as I've done it, he's turned. So, Sylvan Distan's our captain at the time. Big Sylvan's come over and I got on great with Sylvan. He's gone, fucking hell, what have you done? I'm like, I think I'm in the right here. So, I'm half fuming. I'm after filling Tandy in. I'm still after punching his head in for setting fire to me. So, he's gone, you better come and sort this out. So, I'm like, the, the red mists now come down and I'm like, fucking hell, something, something serious must have happened here. So, I walk along with Sylvan to go and make sure Tandy's all right. To, he's gone in the toilet so as I'm walking and I get to the toilet there's like a walkway of about 20 yards from like the toilet walkway to the toilet door and but it was like lit up it was fucking let me think back to it now it's like it was almost like it was meant to be so it's like lit like dead glamorously and um, there's just nobody in this 20 yard space and Tandy's brother comes fucking steaming out the toilet door where is he I'm gonna fucking kill him right because he's obviously seen his brothers had a cigar put out on him so as he says this and opens the door, I'm walking along the passageway with Sylvan Distan. So he sees me and he's older than Tandy and comes steaming towards me. Obviously, you know, I disarm him relatively quickly. So he's faster kip. And after him, Tandy comes flying out now. So not only have I stu stuck a cigar out on him, he sees their kid faster kip on the floor. So loses his head, comes flying at me. So obviously he gets another couple. Distan and the lads jump in between it. And that's the end of the matter. So Tandy and his brother, the rest of the lads get together and throw Tandy and his brother out the do. You've been acting like fucking cunts all night. You tried, the, the light has got fucking put away four hours ago. You've acted the cunts. You shouldn't have been here anyway. You've both been filled in. Get to fuck. So Tandy and his brother are launched out of our players do. Macher and Fowler and they're like, lad, you're all right. I'm like, fucking hell, they have done what done, what's happened there. But it's kicked off. But they're like, just sit there, have a bevy with sound. John Macken, Trevor Sinclair, you're all, every, everything's sad, calm down. About two hours after this, the most violent bar brawl I have ever seen in my life, like the OK Corral takes off in this bar. Our goalkeeper for the youth team at the time was a Danish kid called Kevin Ellegaard. Six foot four, six foot five, built like a brick shit. I was taught he was hard as nails. Lovely kid. You wouldn't want to mess with him just on pure bulk alone. Ends up in an argument with someone next minute. This Elegard snoozing on the floor. This lad hits him with one dig and he's fast to kip. There's chairs going, bottles. Nicholas and Elchus is, is there with all his mates. The most violent bar fight I've ever seen. The whole bar gets smashed up. 
I'm nothing to do with it. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. I'm sitting in the corner. I've got, I best get out of here. I've got home. So I'm thinking, next day in the Manchester Evening News is this bar fight. Nicholas and Elgar, he's the big star at City, this bar fight. So I'm going, fucking hell, I've got away with that. You know, I've had to fight myself in there with Tandy and his brother, but I've got away with it. So that's the Sunday. Monday, we're back in training. So I've phoned Tandy to say, listen, I'm playing in the first team every week here. You shouldn't have even been out here. I'm not going to fucking... For me, it's the end of it. You've had a crack. You shouldn't have set fire to me. I shouldn't have done that. You've had... That's the end of it. And I was prepared to square it off with the kid. I weren't going to go and say to the manager, which I could have done. Listen, he's a fucking dickhead. He ain't training with us. I'm first team player. So I was going to be dead sad. I get in, unbeknown to me. He's already sold the stories at the papers on a Sunday. <laughs> fucking snitch. Right to the papers on a Sunday. Uh, so it's out now. So yeah, he's getting the eye patch in. and that one, isn't he? All that. No, no, that was Darbo. So that, that came afterwards. So Tandy's gone fully in and obviously the manager's put me in. Keegan, what the fuck's happened? So I've told him what's happened just as, as I always am. Dead cards on the table. and he, So... Anyway, Tan, Tan, Tandy ends up getting loaned out. We're fucked off, and he, he was a bit of a bit of a mad kid. Anyway, he wasn't um, no angel. So now I've I'm, I've I've started this twenty-two man brawl. Now I've put a cigar out in somebody's eye, and obviously the story about that was incredible. You know the, the fucking traction it made, and then the next one's Darbo. So at the back end of that city cycle, which accelerated me in in terms of leaving, we signed a few foreigners who were, you know, as I say maybe not doing everything right, you know, smoking in the training ground and they had a fucking smoking room and not, not turning up to training in the correct uh, spot, not doing what they needed to do. And then, you know, the manager was not great at the time. Pierce, Stuart Pierce, Keegan had left. There was a bit of a bad feeling in the, in, in the club. Pierce had gone in and was acting a bit weird. And then, you know, Darbo and me ended up having a war of words on the training ground. And I'd kind of got on, as I say, his, his good mate was Sylvan Van Disten, who's a good pal of mine. And um, we were in competition for places and we weren't overly close because I never, ever respected his, the way he trained or the way he prepared. And he, he'd had a good career, played for Inter Milan and I think Lazio and France. And, but he'd just come for a payday, I think, and was acting a bit of a bit of a tit. Um, and then it, it just went off in training one day where, you know, he's left a bit on me. This, this is two, three days before the Manchester derby at, at Old Trafford. Back end of the season, April. Not you know we're safe. We're not going down. Not really to play for other than pride. And he's lamped me in training, or I've lamped him or something. And you know, he, uh, one's lamped one. You know, I've passed the ball and clipped me a bit late. So next time he does it, obviously I'm leaving one on uh, tiff for tat, tiff for tat, and it just escalated in terms of no one's safe in the back foot. And then it, it ends up in a war of words where you know I was a young kid. I'm only 23, 24 at the time, and he's 28, 29, and he's obviously. Um, start having a bit of a verbal and before me I'd seen Nicholas and Elke punch Steve Jordan who's a year above me four times in the face on the training pitch and, and scarred in his face and the manager do nothing Stevie Jordan just had to take his stitches because and Elke was his top player and I've seen Paul Boswell throw a dig at somebody so Paul Boswell had slapped me sorry on the training pitch I'd been arguing with Boswell and just had the blue he just slapped me across the face and by the time he had a chance to respond everyone's in the middle of it and I was fucking fuming thought you cheeky cunt but he done me on terms of I never thought anyone would fucking raise their hands on the training pitch and he fucking caught me and I thought, you cheeky cunt, yeah? So this Darbo one, two years after this, is going on. We're having a war of words. I'm, f I'm saying to Darbo, you shit, you fucking crap. <laughs> you don't, you can't even get a game, you fucking crap. You know, that, that's the, and he's blah, 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 in French and all that. And as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fluent in French now. <laughs> <laughs> Put a words at the time, a words at the time. <laughs> so he's fucking giving me down the banks in French. So we're walking off, the training session's finished. Do you know what I mean? We're walking off. He's fucking giving it to me in French and I'm just going, I just keep saying, you're shite, you're fucking crap. Which to a footballer, if you're not playing in the first team and someone who is playing saying, that's here, that's the worst insult you can get. I'm going, you, like, you know, heavy on the, your shit a footy, you're fucking crap. And he just lost his head. So we're walking off and the verbals are going and from nowhere, he's flipped over. So he turned round and he sprinted towards me. So I'm thinking, I'm getting a crack here. Because the way he run at me, I knew he weren't coming for a fucking f to tickle me. So he's, he's turned and ran 15 yards across the train of pitch. He, bear in mind, he's ahead of me, so he's turned and ran backwards towards me. He gets a bar fucking within range, two, two foot away from me, three foot away from me. So I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? And his arm comes back. As soon as his arm comes back, 
I don't know what's happened after that. You know, your natural instinct kicks in, this fight or flight, and my instinct is to fight. Um, and my natural instinct kicks in there and I disarm him relatively quickly. Um, but unbeknown to me, I've knocked him out. So he's out on his feet, the first punch. He, he's gone like that. He says to slap me. But as that's, you know, you, you don't wait till I'm ground where I'm from. And I've the first jab I've hit him with right on the money. And it stunned him. The second one I've hit him with put him, put him away. So he's on the floor. Natalie, as, as a scrap entails, I, I'm down with him. And I ain't coming off yet until... Some the referee off. stops the contest, you know, you know, what am I going to, oh, you're all right now, get up and you fucking kick fuck out of me. Like you can't take them chances. So within a few seconds, it's over. Bang, bang, bang. And um, obviously Usman's had the shock of his life because he's bigger, bigger than me. Um, and he thought he was uh, capable of um, imparting his belief system on me. And obviously he's had a, a reality check. And, you know, for me, that was the end of the matter. You know, we finished saying and we go in um, after he's been woken up and, um, told what's gone on. You know, I went in and said, look, do you want round two here? I'll, I'll, I'll end round. You, we'll get on the Astro turf again if you want to sort this out. Um, he didn't want any part of that. I'm sent home then. No problem. Shouldn't be having a fight with your teammates. Um, and then next minute, he's gone to papers the next day with a fucking big piece of sticky tape on his finger, got his beard to take a picture of him. The fucking, you know, and, and then, you know, uh, it, it, you have to defend yourself against that there but but again I, I said to him loads of times like I, I I was 23 at the time I'm 41 now like you know if someone had filled me in and he went and said to the police and that I did something from behind and that which was fucking lies absolute lies you know, why were they allowed to go to the coppers that it both of them <laughs> and other teams listen there's always scraps we've had scraps and seen lots of them in, James, in yeah, the pitch yeah, and it's done them, shake yeah. hands sorry cuddle that's it but why was those guys allowed to go to the papers I don't know. Because it was you, so, maybe? Someone goes to the papers or the authorities where I'm from. You're a, you're yeah, a snitch. Like, you get them off the team like. as well, so, yeah. You know, for me, it says more about him than me. If he'd have filled me in, I wouldn't have gone to the papers. I wouldn't have gone to the busies. If he'd have filled me in and I felt it was unjust, I'd have, I'd have, got, I'd have done a bit of training and I'd have come back and gone, come on, you bollocks round two, me and you for a straightener. Yeah, That's how it's sorted by yeah, ass. Yeah, yeah. If, if someone says something about you or, or caught, you know, you're not on, come on. You know, no weapons. Which is the way it should be. Yeah. No weapons. Get yourself in the, in, in the car park. Get yourself in the back garden. Get yourself on the bowling green, where, wherever it is. And, you know, sort, sort your differences out. I grew up in that world. My dad taught me. My dad was, that's how my dad solved his problems. That's how his, his dad solved his problems. That's how my granddad solved their pro problems. And then all of a sudden, I'm the first generation. That's like, no, no, there's a, you know, you have to solve your problems in a different a different way. Was that the um, final nail in the coffin, though, City? I, that was for me, though. I decided to leave. So City suspended me um, and then just the, the way they supported Darbo, who for me had done nothing for the football team. Um, and I thought, I just didn't li like the way uh, they behaved in, in the aftermath of that event. And I thought, no, that, that's me done. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't owe you anything. You give me a chance. I, I think I've paid you back with four or five years as a senior. You're going to command a, 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 a a decent transfer fee for me. You know, I had a clause in my contract for five and a half million that I'd negotiated two years before. So I knew they were going to get, you know, that clause activated. I'd already rejected Everton, West Ham, overtures of other teams, you know, in, in the two or three years before that. Um, and I just thought, you know, no, I'm, I'm not going to stay on. And, you know, at that point, John Ward Chairman was phoning me, asking me to stay on. I just felt thought, you know, needed to get away from Liverpool and North West. Just felt it was the time for the change of scenery. And obviously Freddie Shepherd and Newcastle United, um, you know, as well as Everton and West Ham, who were taken over, I think, by the Icelandic banks at the time, um, were, were all in the in the market for me. And I, and I thought, you know, you know, Newcastle at the time were Michael Owen, you know, you know, trying to get in the Champions League, you know, some some big names. And, you know, I just thought, yeah, well, you know, I'm going to try something uh, different and, and end up signing for Newcastle. And you played with him for an hour, what, four or four five years? Four years up there, yeah, done four years at, at, at Newcastle. When um, were you in the jail, at Newcastle? Yeah, Newcastle, yeah. I had a uh, first year up there, I got injured, and then the Christmas, um, I'd gone out. Just weren't, weren't going wet, like, weren't going as planned. Like, you know, injury, first time in my career, I'd had an injury which was um, caused by experts, you know, Sam Allardyce's experts, who'd changed my orthotics in my boot when I'd played for... 24 years, virtually unscathed before that first pre-season game. You know, this, this orthotic uh, definitely contributed to, to my foot uh, snapping. 
and then I'd not been injured and we're living away from home, not got, you know, me, me, I'm living in a flat in the city centre of Newcastle rather than with, you know, your family security uh, network around you. You know, at that point, my nan had come to my house and clean my house and she'd make me tea and make sure, you know, it was like a show house, my house. I didn't have any kids or anything at the time. She'd make, you know, you know, me, me dinners for me and made sure they ate healthy because I was a, a professional athlete that was, you know, living, I had to live like a fucking Spartan to, to you know, to play against your Patrick Vieiras and Roy Keynes and Stevie Gerrards and Scholzers with the ability I had. You know, I couldn't be eating shit food and not training properly. And, and again, the great time and I have coming into football, you know, you live through this foreign invasion where they bring some incredible habits, you know, about the way we should eat, the way we should train, the way we should prepare, pre uh, prepare for professional football. And they were, you know, fantastic influences on me as a, as a young player. And as I say, for, for me to go to Newcastle then, and, you know, it was a first time I'd knew I never had to work ever again in my life. I just knew I'd signed a five-year deal. I knew the numbers involved and I'm like, that hunger, you know, I'd had holes in my trainees as a kid and, you know, just, you know, being rough and ready. And that hunger for the first time, it was like, it was just that, the injury and then the ability just to take a breath and go, I, fu I fucking, I, like, this is done. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't have to ever work again. Like, it's a fucking mad feeling that, especially for the kid off a council estate. And then you're like, okay, right, let's let's set some new goals. What are the new goals? Right, I want to do this and I want to do that. And... But playing in the Premier League, playing for England, and becoming a multi multi like I always remember being in Iton Village as a 16 year old, when you're a 17 year old, 18 year old, and I had to run to the Lloyds Bank to get me wages out the bank before me overdraft kicked in and they taxed me. You know, they used to tax you like 60 quid, and that was like whether I had a decent week or not, and I'd have to sprint to the bank. And then I always remember thinking, one day I'd fucking love to come to this fucking cash machine and bang it in, and I got a million pound in my account. So, I kept the bank account night in Village until I got a million pound in the bank accounts, printed the Fingio statements off and was like, right, that's me out of this bank. But like, that was like a 24, 20, but you know what I mean? That that was like, you know, little goals to yourself to go, wouldn't it be fucking great? And night in Village is, you know, a lot of great memories, you know, ducking and diving as a kid and where like, you're still all in, you know, you're 12 and 13 dreaming about being something. And then, you know, not having any money in the bank when you first after earning a wage and then it, learning how hard it is to just survive and then, you know, having those goals to just go, wouldn't it be fucking great to be here one day due to your hard work and your sacrifice and be able to see that number? Because that number for me wasn't for me. It represented, I could buy my nana house, I could make sure my half fella and my ma and every, all my brothers and everyone was safe. safe because I'd grew up where I'd seen, you know, heroin grab people and drugs grab people and crime grab people and, as I say, you know, you know, Newcastle for me was a chance as well because don't forget the back end of the city coincides with my brother being involved in in a, in a murder in Liverpool and getting 17 years jail at 17. It was me, obviously, me, me cousin who'd killed them. And and when I talk to you about my belief that brilliance is in everybody, the lad who killed Anthony Walker, Paul Taylor, is probably the best finisher of a football I've ever seen in all my time on the planet. Like the the most talented finisher. Better than Fowler, like I always say to Fowler about it, same left foot, was at Liverpool, 11, 12, 13, 14, but just couldn't stay out of trouble, was just just too far gone. And then when you learn about like what happened, his environment, you kind of go, did he have a chance? Do you know what I mean? He had talent. And how many of them kids are out there in all these major cities, mate? And as I say, if, if we can talk, yourself and myself, different ends of the, the spectrum, and that helps some kid who's who's out there now who's you know just maybe second guessing himself. Yeah. You know you can be whatever you want to be in this world. No mm -hmm. one can stop you. It's only you can stop yourself. Same way if you want to drink and drug, you can do it. There's only you can stop. Yeah. You're, you're, no one can Definitely diagnose yeah. you. And if you want to be a winner and you want to achieve in life, you can do that. Even you see how many people just say, go back to school at like fifty and go right. You know I'm going to get a degree and I'm. Blackie always taught me, Steve, always taught me, always be a student, always be learning, never fucking think you know everything or every uh, everything about everybody. And it's your job to find out about people, find out what they're good at, sit and talk to people. People don't talk to each other anymore. Yeah, but that's why we're lost. There's no communication. So a kid then from Everton released, Man City, debut, England, you become a millionaire, you've been through all this shit, you're in the papers, you're known as a hothead, the bad boy. 
brother and cousin done for murder you go to Newcastle get injured you're a millionaire life's going sweet you've kind of overcome all the obstacles but then bang you end up in prison but you, st you still got those th those fears you know all them insecurities are still there did you oh, have right, that so, so, co but what was your triggers you. what was your triggers to be so fiery what was it what, um, where does that stem from do you think now that you're older and understand life a bit more I've got a huge trigger for injustice so when I see an injustice so like somebody using an advantage to put somebody else down I've always struggled with that even in school I didn't like to see Brilliant. I didn't like to see people picking on people I didn't mind a fair fight if someone wanted to have a fair fight or a disagreement no problem I have no problem with people resorting to violence as, as a means of uh, solving conflict. Sometimes it is the only way get out in the fucking car park. And, you know, I, I think if, you know, Tony Bell used to doing, I think a good thing in Liverpool now, this knives down, gloves up thing. Yeah. About Tony's a legend show. Great, Tony. great fella, yeah. Love Tony. And, um, you know, you know, if people went out and had straightness now, listen, it's not great, James, but, you know, this knife crime that we've got running around where we are at this moment, London, you know, getting a fat lip or a cut nose, you can come back from that. You can, you know, you a couple of weeks, you, you scab zeal and you and, and you learn your life lessons. Someone's sticking a blade in you, or a, you know, as I said, my my brother lost seventeen years of his life from seventeen because his mate, who's his cousin at the time, thought it'd be a fantastic idea when they were having a fucking scrap to pull an ice axe out and swing it into somebody, and it stuck in his head, and he ruined not only his life. Um, but lots of people's lives off the back of that fucking stupid decision. Um, you know, they, they were charged with racially aggravated, you know, and, and, and again, I think if the lad wasn't black, it, it, may, it may not have happened, Anthony Walker, and he was a fantastic kid. I always remember seeing him on our estates because there wasn't many black people about where we lived. Um, and, and to see the way his family and his mum and all that have conducted themselves in the aftermath of it, you know, I, I mean, I'd struggle to do that. You know, I'd want an eye for an eye. If someone killed my son, I'd, I'd want to see them... Um, 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 how do I say it? Um, yeah, revenge. Not, not revenge. Yeah, you know, but, yeah, but you say that, but again, it's family. I've got family, kids. You've got yeah, kids. Yeah. Do you but mean? If an eye for an eye, the whole world goes blind. But again, if it's if it's your kid, like I say, I've had women on this show who've their sons have been abused. They've got mm. blades, went around and killed the cunts. Do you know what I mean? So it doesn't matter who you are. You can be the softest, most gentle person in the world. Everybody's got that trigger when it comes to their kids. And this is the environment we're in where, with, listen, picking up knives and guns, it's not you. You've been blessed and hard work to then make a life for yourself. Other people's... I played with a kid, Alan Monaghan, unbelievable. One of the, the best players I've ever... He played for Celtic. I played for Hibs. And we were friends back in the day. Unbelievable. We end up, we end up drunk one night and he kicked a bit of glass through a fucking door. And then cut his Achilles and it ruined his career and he's kind of went the other way in life. I've not heard from him in years, but unbelievable. But you never know what's planned out for you. And no. when you're going down that path and revenge, listen, it's easier to try to forgive and forget. We can go through all the artifacts and shit, but it's difficult. But when you're seeing people die and left, right, and centre of the drinks, the uncles being robbers, it becomes normalised. But then when you're going through that, great football player, hothead, people use all that against you. As if it's all well, your well, problem. Well, the fisticuffs for me is that's that's not big news where I'm from. It's kind of fuck all. It's just the weekend, like, yeah, 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 that's yeah. just people resolving conflict on mm -hmm. on our estate. Was the fisticuffs? You know, it's only when you look back at it now and I think about you know it's having children. It's, for, for me, you know, you travel through this world on your own journey, and then you have kids, and you realise how unimportant you actually are. Up until that point, you think you're the fucking bee's knees. Selfish, you think, you you, of selfish, course, yeah. you're self-centered, and you know you 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 know you have these things that, that come out and you just love them unconditionally and you just and it just throws your world and your whole belief system that you've formulated before that completely to the wind. And then you piece it back together because, you know, you want to give them a, as, as great of an opportunity as you can. Now, that's not giving them everything because I don't think that necessarily helps you become uh, the best version of yourself. Um, but But that's trying to help them not make the mistakes you've had. Like, my kids know I've been to jail and they don't know my brothers, who's now out, has been to jail. And my mate too, again, another story, he's out on a night out and there's a fight and fella falls down and, and's dead and he's an off-duty police officer. Like, just mad stuff that happens. Like, you're saying your mate there puts his foot through a plain glass window and that's the end of his footy career. What people forget is your one stupid decision, especially now, 
in the modern world from irreconcilable damage to your to your, your life. life because it's all recorded. You know, you're one mad tweet away from you, know, you lose cancelled. your head. You yeah, say yeah, something yeah. mad online, and all of a sudden you're cancelled, lad. And mm -hmm. you know. The world, so we're going to end up with this world of perfect people, which we all know to be bollocks. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's got something that they're not great at that they could do better at. And, you know, the, we, we try and create these um, perfect people, but surely now, I mean, I'm only 41, but the amount of people we've built up in this country or in, this, on the, in the British Isles to knock down, you know, the stuff that's going on now in the Middle East, you know, the stuff that, you know, I've lived through, the IRA being a terrorist organisation, never bombed Liverpool, but bombed the Arndale and, and obviously Warrington, Tim Parry, um, to Sinn Féin being the, you know, the government in Ireland and, you know, you're seeing what's happening now in the Middle East, you know, strange old time to, to, to be alive and, again, have we not learned that killing each other is just not the answer? Like, if it's not Catholics and Protestants, it's, it's Muslims and um, Jews. Jews. You know, it's Ukrainians and Russians. It's and we're we're getting into the realms of you know World 1984, three, George Orwell. Yeah. There's just always a war. Like, would we not be better than building missiles and aircraft carriers and fighter jets and uh, ammunition and guns and tanks in spending that money on the schools for the kids that are going to live in on this world that we're going to uh, leave very shortly? You know what? If I do great, you know Bobby Charlton's gone it's a couple of days ago. You get three or four days newspaper coverage, you know, they'd speak favourably of you. Um, you'll get a minute applause and then in a week's time, Forgot about and he's won a European Cup, Ballon d'Or, you know what I mean? So people go through the world and life trying to please all these people and make all these people like them. And that's just, for me, I learned, and it may be being a bit of a pariah, maybe having all those things happen to me where people, you know, people think I'm a Neanderthal and, you know, they've got a certain perception of me. Um, and I kind of developed my personality then as a little bit, of, a little bit of a black sheep away from the kind of normal, conventional um, mm. person in the spotlight. You know, I remember first going and doing articles, and when I'd walk around like an art gallery, and I first started using Twitter, I was just different, and just the furore it caused. And you know, then for me, I just enjoyed poking the box, and then I realised I was like, this is dead easy to manipulate this this uh, this algorithm. It's really easy to manipulate, um, certainly for someone like me, uh, who, who's no, not afraid to be outspoken. And then I just thought, this just ain't for me. Uh, for me, I get a lot more out of helping people. And I never, never, I, un, until I had kids, I never, ever realised that. I, I was very, very selfish, very, very low in empathy before um, I had children. And it, it just fundamentally changed um, the way you see the world. Yeah, just, just completely change it. Because I think of everyone now going, even like people I've hit and who have sparked in the past who have gone, he fucking deserved it. I go, that could be that could be my lad or my daughter on, on, on the end of that and now with that. You know, it just changes the way you, yeah, you know, you just mature as you get a bit older and you look back over the stuff you've done. And at the time you felt it was the right way to solve that problem. You know, with the power of hindsight, you, you wish you'd have done it completely differently. And as I say, I go back over my career and I think I had a great career. I, I overachieved from a 13, 14 year old who's told he weren't good enough to play for England, even if it was for a small period, you know, I overachieved. And, you know, f for me, you know, I'm now on my second dream. I always wanted to be a footballer, wants to play in the Premier League, play for England, wants to play for Everton, never managed to do that. Um, and the next thing for me was, I always knew I'd be even better as a coach working in a team. And I'm now on that next journey. You know what I mean? I've got a, a, a lovely wife, lovely family, um, got some great mates around me who've been my mates since the Johns who are uh, unafraid to tell me when I'm acting like a prick which is what we all need um, and you know life's getting easier it's not easy it, it, it has its trials and tribulations you know I always think the secret of life is rented and you have to pay that rent on it all the time and the minute you think you've got it um, it usually has a way of kicking your square in the bollocks and putting you down a few pegs so as long as you stay humble as long as you stay honest, uh, you don't have to always agree with everybody. Um, as long as you're a, a person who people can trust, um, I think you'll do all right in life. Yeah. What was it like being in the Jew for a Premier League player? Uh, I, I don't mean this to sound blasé. Obviously, it's shit because you're like, I'm playing in the Premier League and now next minute, I mean, I, I, all the lads 
bear in mind, I know because I've been on remand and I got out and I'm on bail conditions, I'm playing now in the Prem, come back and I'm playing sound because I'm all right when I can play through chaos. I have this way of operating through chaos. There was part of me that I think induced chaos when I was younger because I actually did well in, in, in that space. So me and Peter K used to talk a lot about whether I actually had a self-saboteur inside that actually purposefully, you know, there'd be 18 nice things said about me and I'd focus on the one that said I couldn't do it. So I created this me against the world mindset and, and I felt really comfortable delivering, um, you know, performance in that space. And then, you know, when Pete passed away, I realised he'd been telling me for years, you don't need that energy. Like, you, it's, life's even easier when you don't need that chaos. It, you can do even more good when you haven't got that chaos in your life. And, you know, as I say, it was only a couple of years after he passed that some of his teachings when you sit and reflect uh, as you do with great people who, who are in your life who, who pass away you with and think about them more when they've gone you know they have more profound the words and the conversations have a more profound impact on you long after they've uh, passed on into the next life and you know some of the stuff he he, he, he taught yeah or, or things he said um rang true and and you just decide look there's there's a different way of doing this and as I say, I think he used to always say to me, through your vulnerability, you become closer to people. So when everyone thinks they've got the answers to everything and the fucking know-alls, no one wants to listen to them. But when you say, hey, listen, I'm massively flawed here. Like, I haven't got a fucking clue what I'm doing. I do not know. Can you help me? All of a sudden, people want to people wanna help you. And I think if you're in a, in, in a set of circumstances where you can encourage that out of everybody and make everybody feel valued, um, life's great. Like you can, you're a billionaire. You know, if, if your missus loves you and your kids love you, and you've got four or five mates that have been on your journey for over ten years, and someone in your life who you know will fucking turn around and tell you you're acting like a gobshite, you're you're a billionaire. You know, there's people with loads of money and tokens and coins in the bank who fucking don't know whether the wife loves them because they love them or because they've got a mega yacht. You know, look at Jeff Bezos. I go. Is that, is that bad with him because he's on the growth hormone or because he's the richest man in the world or because he's fucking shined his head extra, extra shiny today? <laughs> she, you know what I mean? If you're Jeff Bezos there, you've got 78 houses. You're thinking, what the fuck? Are they? Imagine the paranoia about the security guards having a fucking a drug orgy in me, in me fucking villa in Hawaii. Like, with more money, you know, B-I-G, B -I ain't it? Yeah, more yeah, money, more, more problems. problems. Like, that, yeah. you know, there's, there's a simplistic way of really enjoying life and, I, I, I think that's attainable in this world we're living in, this social media, this materialistic world where you've got to have all the mod cons and, you know, the iPhone 14 is not good enough. You need the iPhone 15. If you haven't, you're a fucking weirdo. And that moves on six months later to the 16. You know, you're just in a race to the bottom for me. And, you know, for, for me, you have to find real value in, in life. And, and I find that in, in interacting with other people, trying to help other people. In, in the midst of that, they help me. But Peter used to always say to me, you'll realise when you're in a role of service, because I used to always say to him, what the fucking hell do you get out of teaching me and helping me? And he'd go, you'll realise one day. And I'd go, well, what would you get? Like, you not, don't get make loads of money. And he'd say, listen, you, you, you remind me of me when I was younger. So I, I, like, and, and now in the job I do and the people I interact with, I see that every day. And Blackie's stuff I spoke to you about earlier watch the world reflect back on you. Next time you're out walking, look for the eye contact. Next time you're out jogging, say good morning, smile at people. It fucking takes them aback. You can see them like, what's going on here? And they smile back at you. Very few people, if you smile, say good morning to somebody, or smile back at you. Uh, don't smile back at you. They don't even want to, and they do it. And you think, do you know what? For whatever reason, even if it's only for four seconds there, you've just elevated, because as soon as you smile, serotonin, dopamine, chemicals are released in your brain. People have got to help people more. Like the where yeah. we live in now, the government ain't helping you. Social services are being pulled away. Like everything, they're going to take the NHS away from you shortly. They've already forced vaccinations on fucking loads of you that are going to have long-term complications with a, an experimental technology. I mean, I'm not anti-vax. I've had flu vax. Listen, I'm off the Johns. I fucking used to drink out of puddles when I was about six because I wouldn't run home to get a drink. It'd be raining. I'd go, fuck, I'll have a drink out of the puddle because you wanted to carry on your game of footy. So I'm not against putting stuff in my body. You know, I've been to Glastonbury, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm no saint. 
for me, there wasn't enough information on it. I thought vaccinations usually follow a real clinical uh, period of um, testing and seeing what the consequences are, usually over a clinical setting and over about a 12 year. And when they started offering you burger and chips for the vaccine, and when they started saying you couldn't go on holiday, and when they started, I thought, oh, fuck this. Fuck, what the fuck are these up to here? And the Republic of Liverpool, you know, the, the rebellious, don't trust authority, certainly not a Tory government, question everything, mindset, anti-establishment, maybe black sheep mindset kicks in. And that's probably one of the single, single greatest decisions I've ever made in my life because my missus was pregnant at the time. And we just looked at the information. We were like, what are we going to do here? You know, because public noise was noise. And and for whatever reason, we, we we decided it wasn't for us because we caught COVID quite early. Um, and I can't imagine if she'd have wants to be vaccinated and, and there'd have been consequence with my youngest, Etienne what that would have done to the family unit. Do you know what I mean? This is what they've done to people. They've yeah, no, fucked people's that lives up with pregnancies. it. See me go, what happened when you get out the jail? So uh, when I went into jail, I, I bear in mind I went for six days because I got nicked in on New Year's Day or Boxing Day or something. So they put me in because the courts were closed. I'd done like six days in Walton. When I went into Walton, I had, I think I had four or five cousins in there. Um, I had like five or six lads I knew from our estate, six or seven lads I knew from other parts of Liverpool. So, you know, you don't want to be in jail and you know on a remand wing, but you know, it didn't it isn't, you know, prison break and people getting bummed and all that fucking nonsense that you you know, think people think it is. You know, you, have you been in jail? Yeah, do you, yeah, do you yeah. get it? So and and if you've if if you're from a rough and ready part of the world and you're a good cunt and you've got your wits to buy you, you'll be all right. Yeah, Listen, there'll be a few um air to try it on because you know it's a higher um environment where people are petrified and when people are scared. They, they, they front that up with aggression, don't they? His, uh, his, you know, so I'm in there, and you know, I'm, I'm a Premier League footballer, and I'm fucking training every day of the week. I'm running massive distances every weekend. I, I, I hadn't lost the fisty cuffs in in the area I'm from, or or in in any walk of life. You know, I'm, I'm not the hardest fella in the world. You know, I'm no fucking Conor McGregor, but I'd always been able to look after my own space. Um, you know, even if that was strategic, you know, knowing what fights I could win and what fights I couldn't win. Um, so when I get in there, you know, it's like being the first day at senior school, isn't it? When they're trying to work out who's the cock of the school and you've got to have your fucking wits about you. And I get in there and know a few people, so that settles you down. And then obviously people talk to you and you come up and you know, everyone's testing you out. And then they realise, well, he's all right, Tim. And I was fine. And then I'm out of there after six days and then played the Premier League here and all the lads are going, where are you going on all day in the summer? And I do buy in Seychelles and Marbella and fucking... I'm like... I think I'm getting fucking six months jail, you know. <laughs> Michael Owen's like, what am I? I fucking told like I'm fucking getting a bit of bad here, like, because it's about the third skirmish I've had. Um, and I think they've just had the fucking enough of me and they're gonna teach me a lesson. And you know, bang to lights have thrown 14 or 15 punches here. Um, even if the first two or three were justified, I'm way outside the um the threshold of self-defense. Um, so preparing all that season, playing great footy, you know end of the season comes and um, they give me six months so I'm into Walton then and again you know I knew a few lads from when I was there on the remand knew, so I was sound no problem um, and then because I'm a notorious prisoner they don't want anything to happen to me so I get put on the drug free wing uh, which I think was fucking J wing or something like that at Walton um, and then you meet a few characters in there and it's sound you got your gym knew the gym all the uh uh, Kenny, good, good mates of mine now, Sam. So I'd get Jim every day. Kept out the way. Walton was 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 you know quite easy in terms of you know you were left alone. It was not easy because you're fucking banged up and you have to go and work in a wood. It's like going back to woodworking school. You do need mad jobs and you know when you could be playing footy, it's and you'd have you know the life I had. It it, it was a kick in the bollocks, but I'd fucked up and I, there was a price to pay and that's what the court and the law of the land had decided and I had to fucking pay me price for being a dickhead um, so I'm in there and, and getting on with it and then in the midst of that because Darbo Darbo got in the papers there's another court case coming for the Darbo one which I was fighting I was like no nah, no nah, that was self defence you came at me pulled your hand back slapped me and just because my my two put you away that's your fault Like I was defending myself so I was admin and I was fighting that so that's going to court in Manchester as I'm in jail for six months in Liverpool so I now get moved from uh, Walton and 
they're taking me to strange ways because the court appearances in Manchester and I'm under that jurisdiction. So it's like pack all your gear and I've got a cushion, got a fucking PlayStation, everything. Life's good. Me half, a couple of me half fellas mates and that are there. So any they'd be saying, Do you want a phone? I'm like, no, no, because my dad said if you get a if they fucking give you the phone, you get an extra 30 days. So I was like, nothing. And obviously, you know, people think jail's this sanitized place. It's fucking you get anything. It's just like being on the council estates, you know, within reason. Um, you know, and then the, and the, and the characters you meet in there, the the you know, some of the smartest people you've ever met, like some people who've just got incredibly unlucky life stories. But you'd expect to go in and meet the dregs of society, and they are in there, and you see them. But then you see people in for like white collar crime and frauds and lawyers and you know mad stuff. It, that was in Walton, which was Cap B. Then I get shipped for this court case in Manchester. So now I'm in strange ways. I'm not going back to Walton, which is double cat, eh? So you're carrying, you know, I think Kenny know you know all that, like proper life is it in there. Like, I'm like, what's going on here? Because, you know, relic, you know, prison's a scary place, but cat beat a double cat, eh? You know, you're going from a yard where there's nothing on the top to like cage where you're like, what's that there for? They're like, so no helicopters come down to like help people who are doing life tariffs abscond. People walking around in multi, uh, two-tone boiler suits. You're like, what are they doing? They're like, they're the lifers. They have to be visible. So a huge culture shock. And then when I go in, I didn't get... I got looked after in Walton, really, in terms of... They, ju they just made sure I was all right. You know, didn't give me any mad perk, but made sure I didn't go on B-Wing, which is like the council estate wing where all the bagheads are. They put me on J-Wing, I think, which is like a drug-free wing. So I was kind of... You know, because they didn't want anything to happen to me either. Otherwise, they'd be in the shite. You know, if I get in a fight or someone slashes me or something mad, you know, that there'd have been uh, chaos for them probably. So I'm probably a governor's fucking nightmare. They don't want me in there, but obviously, you know, the law of the land and the judges give me the sentence. I go to strange ways, and again, I'm on, I'm on the cat, but they put me on the rough and ready wing. So I, this is a fuck. I'm, I'm moaning to try and get back to Walton. I'm saying, send me back to Walton. Like you're not going back to Walton. So I'm like, I need to see the governor. They're like, you're not seeing him, the governor. So I knew the only way you can see the governor is say, I want to go on protection wing. Because the lads have said, if you ever want to speak to the governor, just say you want to go on protection. Because if you want to go on protection, the governor has to come down, speak to you, and you have to sign yourself on protection. So I'm like kicking off like a prima donna, trying to get back, from, get me jail changed. And they're just fucking buzzing off me like, who's this tit? So I end up saying, listen, and the governor comes down, do you want to go on protection? I'm like, no, no, I don't. But like, put me on a drug-free wing. Like, I don't need to be going in with the bagheads here. What happens if I fucking... Again, a scrap with one of them. So he's like, no, no, if you go on protection wing, that's it. And once you sign on the protection wing, that's you for life, innit? You can't come off them. So if you ever go back into jail, you're always with the nonces and you go on the nonce wing, that's it. So I'm like, I don't really, I'm not doing this. So I've gone, no. So that he's fucking sent me then back onto this rough and ready wing, the landing wing. So I'm, I've had like a few, like I'm, I'm now, I'm now worried because like I'm now, like I don't, I, I don't know whether... The way they've been with me, I'm like, are they going to fucking stitch me up here by putting me in a, you know, my paranoia is kicking in that they're going to fucking put me in a pad with someone and this is going off and it's all, it's part of their plan to, you know, to keep me in here forever, Charlie Bronson. I'm going, he's going to fucking, Bronson only done a fucking bank robbery, he hasn't got out, do you know what I mean? Like, the paranoia kicks in. So I walk into this cell, it's strange ways, and there's a lad lying on the bottom bunk and notoriously you don't want to be on the top bunk do you because you get kicked out of the top bunk so the bottom bunk's the, the hierarchical position and he's about a six foot two black lad I'm like fucking hell it's going like it's just like what the fuck's going on so I've gone alright mate it's about eight o'clock at night by the time you've been processed come out the court and he's just he's just watching the telly he's just blanked me doesn't say anything so I'm like bear in mind my brother and cousin have been involved in this racially aggravated murder so I'm like this is fucking going off here, like, and I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get fucking bummed here or whatever, you know what I mean? It's just thinking the worst. But I thought, fuck it, I'm, I'll just have to go down fighting. So I've gone, tried to talk to him again, again, he's fucked me off. So I've just got, I haven't even got changed. I've just, I haven't even got under the, the fucking cheat. I've just lied on the top and you've got your bag of belongings, which had a couple of tins of beans or whatever in, and I've just gripped two tins of beans and I just thought, if this cunt kicks me out the bed here or fucking kicks off, I'm just going to have to fight for my life. And if I get fucking bummed, then at least I've gone down fighting. I can say, I went down fighting. He was a big cunt. My arsehole's a bit mm -hmm. sore. But <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't just... So like that. that's what's going through your head. So I'm lying on this bunk. Turns the telly off. Then he does about 10 o'clock, whatever. It's, and then I'm just lying there. And every time he moved in the bed, I'm ready for action. Like I'm ready to go. 
just sitting with these two tins of beans. And I always remember a strange race, which he didn't have at Walton, was dogs barking because they have the, the guard dogs. So as it starts going, like the dogs start barking, I haven't slept a wink the first night. So cell door opens at whatever, seven o'clock, half seven. And this lad gets up and fucks off out because he's got a job. He's, he's already on the thing. So I'm in there now. I'm second day on, on, on the uh, wing. Fella comes along and he's a, he's like a Bolton accent. So I get so and soon it turns out he's a Bolton Wanderers fan. My uncle Tony Kelly played for Bolton. Said to you earlier on. And Kevin Nolan's a mate of mine, played play for Bolton. So I'm fucking right into him then straight away going, listen mate, I need to get out of this pad here. This is going to kick off. If this fella comes back in. It's nearly gone off last night. If he comes back this afternoon, it's, it's kicking off in here. Like, there's just a bad energy. So he's like, I, I, what you, I'm like, we need to sort this out. So anyway, he goes, I'll see what I can do. I go, Bolton fan, I'll fucking sort you some tickets and I'll get make sure. So it drops you an envelope. Just, I've just lit, you know, that's the, you've got to game the system. You've got to use every fucking tool in your toolbox. So I could see he was receptive to it. So I thought, yeah, I've got one here. And all the screws are fucking bent, as you know. I heard the one, was one on your podcast talking shit at Manchester time. one. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a bad yeah. ball desire, him, lad. <laughs> Full of shit, him. I, I think he was in strange ways, but he never had that interaction with me. He's a fucking lying cunt. Big dope, Sam. big dope, yeah, Sam. big dope, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, big ball bag. He said I was like trying to, trying to throw my name around or something for some influence, didn't you remember it? And I was like, I didn't even met him, I don't think. And I think he mentioned something to do with my brother. So anyway, um, worked out the screw pretty quickly. That that afternoon, I'm back in the thing, yo, and the lad comes back from from work. So I'm like, fucking hell, this is, this is on this. So he gets back. As he comes back in the thing, he goes to me, all right, lad. So I've gone, just Jekyll and Hyde from the night before. So I've gone, yeah, you're all right, said. Talking to him now. Turns out he's from Chapel Town in Leeds, where a mate of mine, Michael Richards, is from, who played at City with us. So he goes, ah, oh, lad, my head was kettle last night when you've come in. I'd fucking been arguing with me bed on the phone and the, the, the phone's gone down as it does in jail and I couldn't carry on and I just fucking was going to kill some head's gone and then you've turned up and I've got a new pad mate and I'm thinking I'm getting some bag head and you've turned in and you're trying to be all chatty and I've just thought, oh, fuck. And he was sound. I went, fucking hell, mate. I told him, I said, didn't I kick last night? I had two tins of beans there. I just stole your fringe in if you kick me out that bunk. So we were laughing about it. So we're sound then. Two days after that, this screw takes the bait on the, on the Bolton tickets and I've said, listen, you need to get me I found out there was a lad from Bayars, Longview, who was in for, um, got caught with a boot of AK-47s, running a load of guns for the, for the Lithuanian crew, and was was looking at like a 12-year stretch. So I've ended up getting, a sh and, and there was a lad whose mate was in our our road. Um, his, his kid was mates with me as as a kid, this fella, and he, I think he'd stabbed a copper in the eye. So he's in there doing every tariff, and everybody was petrified of him in strange ways. So I get weird then, he's trying to get in contact with me, so I'm like... He's a boss fella, I won't name him here, but he's a fucking crap pot, you know what I mean? But he's a great fella, heart of gold. But he terrorised everybody when he was out, so I can't imagine what he's doing, you know, obviously locked up. And anyway, everybody in Strange Ways is fucking weary of him. So the last place I want to be is anywhere where there's a tinderbox like that, because I'm thinking, I've got six months jail here. With good behaviour, they'll help me out. I'll be out of this in a couple of months if I just keep me fucking nut down and keep myself to myself. And obviously everyone's wanting to make contact with you and go, oh, I know you're half fella. And I'm just going, fuck, here's a phone. I'm like, no, I'm all right. I don't want any, I'm sound. And um, anyway, Mick gives me a shout and I, I go over. He's on this decent wing and he says, listen, I've got the laundry in that here. He still hasn't been sentenced. And he says, yeah, get padded in with me, get padded up with me, it's sound here. So the screw ends up boxing it. And anyway, I was fine then after that. So we had the gym on our wing there and I became the gym orderly. Got looked after a little bit by a few of the fucking rough and ready fellas. And um, I was sound. I was away then. I'd done, I think, 74 days. Done a month in Walton, about 40 days in strange ways. And then I was out. They offered me my tag a little bit before that, but I didn't want to take it because I didn't want to fucking sit with the tag on. And as it was, you know, got out. And as I say, I, James, I, I met some boss people. Like, when I say boss, that's a scouse word for like brilliant people, like proper, proper people who just fucked up. I met a lad who was a great lad, Man United fan. And when he got the jail, you know, he'd been up to no good. And when he got the jail, his beard had fucked off to Morocco with his fucking kids and set up with a new fella and he could get no visits. And there's me thinking I'm at ground zero. I've reached rock bottom because I can't play footy on a Saturday. And, and it gave me a huge um, eye opener of, I, I felt dead sorry for myself when I got the jail, I thought. And then I realised this is your own fucking fault, you dickhead. And your life's still fantastic. You've still got a boss life if you get your finger out when you get out. Be feeling sorry for yourself. 
there is people in here who've absolutely got a fucking shitty end of the stick. And, um, you know, life could get a lot worse if you don't fucking get your act together. So, you know, jail worked for me. You know, I had something on the outside to work towards, but... Did it make you appreciate life more? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you, you think people in jail, you look down your nose at them, and, and, and the people who've ended up going on the aisle one night and took a load of Charlie and got in a car and crashed into somebody and they're doing seven, eight, nine years jail on a fucking mad weekend where they've had murder with the bed and gone on a bender. Uh, you know, they're not career criminals, yet they are in there and there is, you know, some scrotes in there, there is some dregs in there, but there's some fucking solid people who've just, you know, had life come at them a little bit too quick for, for, for what they were able to deal with at the time. And then the problem for it is, is, you know, your car insurance, all the stuff that's tariffed onto you after you leave jail doesn't give you a chance to turn your life in the direction you want it to. It actually is inclined to force you back into the system. How did um, the media treat you when you get out I, of prison? Or were you just used to it? Yeah, you know, they follow me around and all taking pictures of me doing community service. And it just, you know, the, the, the cunts aren't they? Like, let's be honest, like, you know, they, you know, I... Fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to, to have a couple hundred grand off two of the major publications. One of them, I think, has gone out of business now for hacking my phone and, you know, hacking your voicemails. And, you know, you've seen what they were doing. You know, I think it was the Millie Dowler case that highlighted a lot of the business practices for our, for our you know, media in the country. And, um, you know, I wasn't even that famous, you know, so I can't imagine what, you know, the, the big hitters were, were getting put through. But, you know, for me, I... You know, it is what it is, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It never really affected me. I never really, you know, when you grow up reading um, headlines in newspapers about football fans, you know, two people from our road died at Hillsborough and they said, you know, fellow football fans who I knew it, Liverpool and Everton, Liverpool, Everton fans, uh, you know, Liverpool fans, the Eighton Park always had a famous flag at every European Cup tie for Liverpool, you know, an Eighton flag. They travelled everywhere to watch Liverpool. Loads of them lads were at Hillsborough and to read in the papers that they'd urinated on their own people and they'd stolen out the pockets of them. And, you know, everyone in Liverpool in our area at the time knew that was absolutely lies, but the rest of the country didn't. So you grow up with, that's, that, bear in mind, that's happened to me at seven, eight, nine, when I can really remember. You grow up thinking, nah, there's a load of, there's a load of nonsense in the world. You know, you question everything. You know, if, if you read what you're reading about um, people that you know and you know that to be false um, and, and I think um, you know f from our city you know if you grew up in, in the area that I grew up you couldn't not be affected by um, what the media in this country certainly you know a certain um, a certain um, media which was you know obviously Murdoch or you know state controlled at the time you know the narrative that was set there you know that the families are still uh, searching for justice and um you know as i say once you once you experience that at a young age you know you, you the, the 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 illusion of narnia it, it is shattered how hard was it to get back into the first team after prison dead easy slot slotted straight back in I think how I many weeks to take i managed to get me jail at the end of the season done the two months so i missed pre-season but obviously you can only do so much inside and um you know the, the body weight stuff and the exercises but 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 i managed to keep myself ticking over inside i ended up coming back out so I'd, i just missed the off season and you know missed two months 74 days so missed you know pre-seasons usually six or eight weeks sometimes nine weeks if it's a bit long so i came in and i missed basically all the pre-season and the off season so it took me a little bit to get up to speed i think i came back on as a sub in the emirates about six weeks after i you know got out of jail and I never look back from there. I've got a peculiar personality. Like I don't dwell in the past, like the past, the past. Yeah, you can. can't change it. Um, I, I'm very future orientated. So Newcastle prison, you end up going to QPR, you got promoted to QPR. What was the decision to go to Marseille? Well, again, you know, we had the sending off, didn't I? The Aguero one, it's quite low profile. That. Um, only happened to be the fucking most iconic fucking Premier League finishing goal um, since Sky's inception, I think. Um, with Aguero and uh, that was madness, but mad. yeah, that, but elbowed that, that cunt, knee that cunt, fight me that cunt. But it's, uh, that was you think some I lost game as well, there, didn't you? Like that's that's the common conception. That, uh, what happened then? So QPR last game of the season you used to play with Man City. You get sent off. I think it was just before half time. No, after we were second in the second 55th half, fifty fifth minute, something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, in the second half. Um, 
So I'd, I'd, I'd obviously was at Newcastle, had a great spell at Newcastle, and uh, you know Mike Ashley was doing some mad stuff. So you know, there's a few of us who stood up to him. I think I was the lead instigator in that. You know, there's a few strong personalities, but they didn't they didn't want to get as militant as what they, they did. And I'd come from a Labour city, you know, where where I'm from, Heighton and St Helens and all that. It's, they're all ex mining communities, so when, when, you're not m miners per se, but you know, my one of my best mates growing up, Matthew Machalini, his dad was a, a miner who was given his is obviously redundancy money. So, you know, you grow up in that era of Liverpool was impoverished with, you know, the, the, the austerity that was that was put on the city by that kind of Thatcher, kind of Tory government. Um, so so opportunities in the development of the city, like the city was fucking rough and ready. You know, it's changed a hell of a lot now with you know some of the grants and the and, and the money that's been spent on it for the better. But at the time it it, it was rough and ready. And you, you just kind of grow up with that abrasiveness, don't you? You're like, you know, it's it's kind of anti, as I say, anti-establishment. Um, and f f from our perspective, you know, the 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 opportunities for me, I was like, I'm gonna have to go in the military. Here. I'm gonna have to be really good at sport. And and if if I'm not, then obviously them other things are there. You know, your crime or music or stuff that people get into. But you know, for me, it wasn't a whole host of stuff that I was really interested in. I, I was really interested in football. And if I'd have got an injury or had a setback, I think the military might have been um, something for me because I was kind of yearning discipline. You know, I knew I needed strong structure, strong discipline. I always benefited from having a strong coach or a strong hand alongside me. You know, all the good managers that got the most out of me had that kind of firmness. Um, so when I'm at Newcastle, I stand up to Ashley. Um, because I didn't think his, he, what he was doing was right. And obviously he, he then broke that power structure that opposed him up in Andy Carroll, leaving to Liverpool, Kevin Nolan, Steve Harper, myself, Alan Smith, etc. So then it was the first time we'd thought about having a family. Georgia was pregnant um, with our first child. Newcastle were trying to renegotiate a contract with me. I was 28, 29, I think. And... I was negotiating with Derek Lambias, who was a casino owner or manager who was put in chief exec role and he was a bit difficult to negotiate with. So it got to a bit of a Mexican standoff um, and some um, home truths were, were, were spoken about. The fact that I didn't think he had any credibility to, to make some of the judgments he was making. Negotiations broke off at that point um, and it coincided with Georgia having a miscarriage. Our first child, she had a miscarriage. So... She was up the wall thinking, am I ever going to be able to have babies? She was all over the place. I was having a difficult negotiation with, with the club and I've ended up just putting a line through it and said, look, I'll speak to you in the summer when... I didn't say this is going on in my private life because it's not for them, but I needed not to just have this business negotiation in the midst of trying to look after my wife, do you know what I mean? In terms of, you know, she's all over the gaff here and, you know... With, as I say, it was a first child, so she's like through it a bit. Um, so the end of that season, Derek Lambias had said to me, you know, if we finish top 10, it's a two-year deal. If we finish outside the top 10, it's only a one-year deal. I was like, we're about to start a family here. Me and George are thinking about having another go at having a kid again. And a one-year deal at 29 is no good to me because once you turn north of 30 as a footballer, life changes you know up until in your 20s you can't they can't give you enough mm -hmm. they want extra years on your contract the boot sponsors everyone's giving you everything as soon as you turn, turn 30 it's a very age of sport it's almost like your best years are behind you and you only want to do one year deals and the boot and the endorsements are now for the younger kids it, you know it, it flips over it must be like being an actress in hollywood all of a sudden you're you're getting all the lead roles and then all of a sudden you turn 45 and you haven't got the uh, the perkiness of of youth and, and you get shipped for you know the new the new uh, the new model coming through. So the end of that season, we were 3-0 up in the last game of the season against West Brom at half time, and we'd have finished eighth, first season back in the uh, Premier League. And we end up drawing 3-3. Three, three. Solomon Choi scored a hat trick for West Brom second half, and we finish eleventh. And Jose Enrique, our left back, and Jose Jonas Gutierrez, the Argentinian left midfielder, had been fucking about in the second half because we were three 0 up and they were taking the piss, and we ended up hanging on for a free free draw. So by Derek Lambias's calculations, I'd have been going into that dressing room after punching the pair of their heads in because them fucking about in the second half would have mean I got a three year deal 
or a one-year deal. As it was, the contract got shelved. So I was like, what a fucking idiot. For, he, he could have caused a scenario at the club that he didn't need to cause by trying to be a casino manager, thinking rules of the casino, working Premier League footy. So at the end of that season, um, I kind of thinking this is not going to plan. Mike sold Kevin Nolan to West Ham, who was another agitated in not us. We were the first team in Premier League history not to sign a bonus sheet because he was trying to ram it down our throat thinking we were sports direct and we didn't have it. Well, I took a bridge to it and I knew that everyone had to sign the form. So loads of lads were going, I was going, well, we get paid our wages. What the fuck do we need the bonus for? Just tell him to stick the bonus up his ass because it was just another way of Mike get bullying and controlling people for money. So I thought, fuck you, I'm standing up to you. And I convinced a few of the big, bigger hitters in the dressing room, like the bigger influencers. And then it got to the point where the manager was trying to get us to sign it and the lads, I think, wanted the, you know, the union, a few wanted the fold, but couldn't say they wanted the fold. So I was saying, lads, look, you do what you want. I'm not fucking signing it. And I knew, I was smart enough to know that they needed every signature. One signature on it, left off it, was not enough for them to get it through. So I was going, look, if you need the money, you just need this bo- Mike, Mike Ashley's money and you need to sign the bonus sheets because Mike fucking wants you to, you sign it, but I'm not. So in the midst of that, five or six lads who were proud lads, who maybe wavering decided not to sign it. So we go into the first league game. Bear in mind, we've won the championship at Old Trafford for Newcastle United away without signing a bonus sheet, which no team had ever done to that point. So it got out and was news that there was a rebellion on. So Mike's decision is to, to do away with all the leaders of the rebellion. And he ended up sacking Chris Hutton off the back of it and then broke up the kind of power that had got us it turned the club around that power structure that the lads in the dressing room and he broke it up because he wants to control so Pardew comes in and I've still got a year left and and and, and um, end up having a little bit of a ding dong with Pardew and he shits himself and he said look you, you can go so I end up signing a four year deal then for QPR first decision I think I've ever made based purely on finances and the most ha- most most I've ever been paid most unhappy I've ever been Why? It just wasn't a good environment. Like, it's a great, great club, QPR, some good people there, and I know they're having a tough time at the minute, but they just put loads of money into it. And there was no, it, you know, team, football is a team, it's a culture, it's a, it's, a, it's a working class, collective sport where everybody has to chip in together. Yeah, it's a meritocracy, so the best will get paid more than the worst, but there's a, there's a, there's a sense of belonging for everybody. The superstar in the team can't be a cunt to the fucking, to the lad who maybe does one of the more menial tasks in the team, like that just won't wash in our game. Maybe that washes in the tennis world or the golf world or, you know, in them worlds you can treat the people below you like a piece of shit, but in in a working class sport like football, you can't. And how you treat everybody for me is is important, whether you're the cock of the fucking school or whether you're, you know, you know, one the lot. How you behave at, at all junctions is, is very important. So if you're the manager or you're in a position of influence, I, I think it's very, as a as a socialist working class lad, for me, it's very important. So, you know, as I said to you, all my family have worked kind of working class jobs. You know, my nan was waiting on. So if I see someone treating someone like a piece of shit or not saying please, thank you, or then that really fucking what was triggers it, me. What was it like getting promoted for you? Was that, that was the only season you were there, one year, was it not? Where? QPR? QPR? No, no, no. So I leave Newcastle at 28, 29, I think, and I sign a four-year deal at QPR. And... They'd just been promoted from the championship, Neil Warnock, and I knew straight away with the way that the deal was conducted, I was, you know, it was me and the agents who was representing me at the time. So they went into the Premier League straight away. I thought you joined them championship and then won the no, league. No, I went in. They'd won the championship with the Delta Rapt and all that. And, and a good mate of mine, mine and his dad played together, Bradley Orr, he was mm-hmm. in the team. So... You know, I, I knew I had to leave Newcastle because of the falling out with Ashley and he wanted rid of us all. I had a year left on my deal there and I got offered a three-year deal on, on slightly more money at QPR. And I thought, you know what? I, I was getting into stuff, you know, art and f- culture. So if it naturally fit that London, I was like, this is going to be great. And, you know, I got into kind of social media and Twitter at the back end of Newcastle to manage my, my exit strategy. I was there and it worked fucking fantastically well because Mike Ashley tried to create this media war with me in the local papers, but obviously this new technology was there, Twitter, where I could just search and navigate mm-hmm. the fact that he'd print an article in the Chronicle and then they had to wait 24 hours to respond. You know, I, I could just take it out. Every time he prints an article, I'd just tweet this a load of shit. 
and it was using this new technology uh, mm. quite radically to to benefit you as a, as, as a footballer. So West Ham, I think, had bid for me when the first rumblings of the summer were on and, it, and, and I think they were trying to phase me out and they offered three million quid for me, West Ham. And I didn't want to go. I can't remember who was the manager at the time, but I didn't want to go. So I've dug in and then it got progressively worse to the last pre-season friendly against Leeds. I kind of know my time's uh, up. And I had a bit of a ding-dong and a bit of Twitter going on. And Mike Hastie's just turned around and said to, to the agents, he can fucking leave. I don't even want any money for him. So then straight away, the businessman and me is like, okay, sound. I end up signing James QPR. I go down to meet them. And I always remember Neil Warnock and Phil Beard and the agents. Uh, I, I was... Uh, had sorted the deal out and we were sitting there and just watching the nego negotiation go down and it was, a, it, it was a financially fantastic deal but the way it was conducted I remember being like really uneasy with it and I, but I was like shut the fuck up like you've, you're going to earn a bar to any odd millionaire do you know what I mean just keep your fucking nut down you're getting pushed out of Newcastle they don't want you Ashley doesn't want you so you've got to go somewhere and there's about 22 million quid on the table here forget fucking whether you like people or not so me my gut was not it was just wasn't sitting right me anyway i signed and it, it never sat well with me after that I, sh I shouldn't have gone that that intuition i had that gut instinct i had was correct and as it unfolded after that um i, I regretted it and that's not to say qbr wasn't a great club but it was just the characters i got involved in and and, the, and I, I regretted it um but it, it wasn't going to plan so first year we ended up the manager who signed me, Neil Warnock, got sacked in the January. Mark Hughes took over. We ended up staying up by the skin of our teeth with that famous Aguero game. I ended up copping a 12-game ban out the back of that. Um, and I come back that pre-season and Mark Hughes wants me gone. Um, and then I get a phone call um, saying, Olympic Marseille, you want to take me? So I ended up going out there for the year. I had a phenomenal year there. Loved it. And then in the midst of that, QPR got relegated. So I'd finished second in France. And while I was away, QPR had fucked me off. You know, for my bad behaviour or whatever, which is, you know, and I said to them at the time, look, if you make this bet, I've still got three years left. Like, you, you know, what happened to the final game of the season when you've, so you've cracked, you, you've cracked Tevez, you've cracked Aguero. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so if you remember in the game, uh, if you had VAR now, I don't think I'd have been sent off. All right, sounds perverse to say that because I blocked Tevez from a throw in on the sideline and he punched me across the face. He punched me in the back of the head and punched because as I cut him off. He's now behind me and frustrated because they had the, the title on the table. We'd equalised in the game, if you remember. They were 1-0 up. Zabaleta missed it across. It went over Paddy Kenny. And we'd equalised. Jibble Cissé had equalised early in the second half. And their assholes had gone. They'd fell apart. And now as a player, you can just sense it sometimes. So they're the great man city. We've got a win to stay up or certainly better Bolton's result at Stoke. And we were one nil down, and they thought they had the title. It's party mode, and they had all the bunting and all that in where we. That, so that was like a red rag to me. And we'd scored early in the second half, and about four of their senior players, arseholes, had dropped out. You've seen them go the colour of boiled shite, and, and you can, you can just smell it sometimes as a competitor. That oh, these are done. These are toasted. So it's they've gone, and we're on. We're in the ascendancy, and you can feel the nervousness in the stadium, and. I checked Tevez off a, off a throw, read him, get in front of him because he's not thinking clearly and, and he fucking punches me twice, once in the back of the head and once around the side of the head. So I've carried on moving. When I say, you know, he's jumped on me back and, and coughed me twice. So I've we've kept moving. I've kind of looked around. Lino hasn't seen it. Ref hasn't seen it. And I've gone. I'm fuming. I thought, you cheeky cunt. So as I turn around like that, Tevez is now walking back towards me. So I've just looked around like that and I thought, no one can see me yet. And I've just gone, fuck off and elbowed him. I thought, 1-1, one, one, you know, you've given me a couple. And I've hit him and he's just gone down the fucker. You know, the, 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 the foreigners aren't they? They're well smarter than us. So as soon as I've caught for him, I should have gone down. I've got up and decided to be British and macho and level it up. And as soon as I've hit him, he's bit the dust. And he's screaming. And next minute, Aguero's running over, grassing on me to the ref, saying, ah, he's like, and he hasn't seen anything. So like now everyone's piling around. Mike Dean's the ref stopped the game. Mike hasn't seen it. So there's no VAR or anything here. Just the fourth, no one's seen it. So then he goes over to the linesman. The linesman says he's seen it. And I always thought to this day the linesman had seen it, but now I know the linesman's a liar because 
some people had sent me about six months ago a couple of stills from the game from you know they've been watching the game back and when they when the still happens and I touch Tevez the six people in between the linesmen they've showed me the wide lens the six people in between the linesmen he, there's no way he could have physically seen what happened unless he can see through bodies so he's just taking a punt and he and he was fucking right to be fair because he's gone bar and he'll have definitely done it <laughs> so Mike Dean comes over and there's like a bit he's torn to the linesman and all that and now all the players are on each other and Bobby Zamora runs over to me fucking cracker Bob runs over to me and he goes Joe, Joe, Joe you're getting sent off you're getting sent off fucking take one of theirs with you so I thought that, that's a fucking good idea that because I've made a cunt of it we're down to 10 if I get one of theirs to go it's 10-10 so I've fucked up but I've kind of leveled the playing field here so I just remember thinking at the time bear in mind we're in the heat of battle it's 55 minutes in the game, fucking adrenaline's flowing. There's loads at stake. Us to stay up, them to win the league. There's a ding dong. I've, I've had my collar felt. I think I'm, I'm getting sent off here. And at that time, Bobby's words of advice were really profound. You know, now I realise it was a fucking mad call for him. So I thought, yeah, he's right there. So next minute, Aguero's grassing again to the ref. So I've walked over to the ref. Aguero should be a wreck kicking up. So I just thought, fuck off you. So I've need him. Thought I gave him a dead leg because he's grassing, so he bites the dust, someone else runs in, and I think, I think like, Les Scott or something, and I'm like, fuck off you, you fucking tit, so, I haven't, he said it's tied to their bottom or whatever, but, w once, once I've needed Aguero, I, it, I'm just trying to get any one of theirs, to throw a punch at me, or get involved, because I know I'm, I'm already on my way off, I've either been sent off, or I'm on the way off, so if any of theirs, throw a dig at me, it's 10 men each, it might even be 10 nine to us, so the best thing I could do in that moment is get one of their players to take the bait as it was. None of them really did. And I end up with the fucking 12 game suspension. I think I'm third in the all time list, aren't I? Between Cantona, who's got number one for the Kung the Fu kick. kick. And then somebody else on a drugs ban. I think I'm third for, like they done me for three, three red cards in that. They said Aguero was a red card. Uh, Tevez was a red card, the first one. Then the Neon Aguero. And then they said I've decided to butt Lescott. And the thing that annoyed me about it all was you know, players being players, they won the league and the famous Aguero moments and, and the rest is history. But Lescott was the only one who, when it when they had to go in front of the FA, he was the only player who turned up to give evidence against me in front of the FA to say, no, no, Joey tried to headbutt me. I'm like, Joey, and I'm fucking getting it. I'm getting a ban. I've been, you know, sent off. You've won the league. Why are you turning up to give evidence against me? And as small as the world is, when I'm at Glasgow Rangers... Who turns up to sign sign for Glasgow Rangers with with the, with the cap in hand? Fucking Lescott. So I said, I'm not playing in the same team as that grass and cunt. I'm not playing with him. He's a fucking grass. Can't share the trenches mm. with him. Um, and again, you know, for me, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have gone to Marseille, James. So Marseille was a phenomenal experience. Yeah, they loved you. So you've got 12 game ban. You went to Marseille. So we've done a season at QPR. QPR. We stayed up. Stayed on that up. Game. 12 game ban, Marseille, you've done the interview, we've got to touch on the interview because when you started speaking French, I'm not going to lie, I thought I could start understanding French at that time, I thought I must, I must have took all that and in the fucking classroom. We all learn that, don't we, when we're speaking to waiters and that when you're on holiday, do you know what I mean? But, um, so we go out there and obviously I've got a 12 game ban to negate, so, but the fans took to me straight away. Yeah, why did they love you so much? Just because I was a rebel. I think they just see me as a rebel. And I remember the first game I turned up in, and 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 one of the the ends had a massive like mural of welcome, sweet and tender hooligan, because they knew I was into the Smiths, and they'd gone and read. And I just thought, these are fucking crackers. These like I haven't played the game. I'm getting sent out of QPR, who fucking persona non grata in the UK with this twelve game ban. Like I'm Hannibal Lecter. And these are just having me, and I haven't even kicked the ball. Like, and, and these have had a European Cup win, and Jean Pierre Papin, and Cantona, and Chrissy Waddle, and Abidi Pele, and Dejan uh, Stojkovic, and like, like just, um, in, sorry, Dragon Stojkovic, like just incredible players. Basil Bowley, I can remember them Basil beating Bowley, Milan to win the European case. Cup. I remember watching it on ITV because Rangers were decent at the time. So I remember Leeds v Rangers on ITV. Yeah, and Marcy, Champions Rangers like semis. When it was only like champions yeah, who played in it. 16 Not now or where if you finish, you know, Fifth, you get a game. So, and I remember how good Rangers were and how, you know, don't forget after Heisel, with, you know, we didn't have European football in, the, in England. You know, all the top players had to go to foreign countries to, you know, Spain, Italy, Germany, and obviously Scotland to play in the European Cup or the Cup Winners' Cup or the UEFA Cup at the time. And 
Um, you know, the English game really suffered as, as, as a result of that. And, you know, for me, then the Premier League getting its act together was great because that coincided with Italian 90, which led to the Italian Serie A league was massive and got Gazetta, James Richardson goals on Sunday in the Italian game. So, you know, you grow up with this unadulterated love of football. Like I'm, I'm a football historian, uh, like an anorak, like love the game. Um, and then I'm fortunate enough to be good at it. And then after I've hung my boots up, I'm fortunate enough to be able to fucking coach and help people there fulfill their potential in it. So, you know, you, you look through life and you think, fucking hell, am I right, Jamie bastard? Do you know what I mean? I've been yeah. born in... But you've worked hard as well, mate. I wouldn't say Jamie are lucky that you've you've grinded, man, through all the shit, the pain, the torment, all the fucking hate from the media, and you've still kept going. So see when you sign for Marseille, their fans are fucking loving you. What happened with the interview? How oh, did right. how did that so, happen? So I turn up there, and um, as I say, you, you know, I'm banned for the first 12 league games, so I could play in the Europa League, but I couldn't play in the, in the domestic league. The ban was only for domestic football or something. So I could chip away at these games, but I'm, I'm playing in the Europa League games. And um, they kept me out of the spotlight for a little bit. And then I'm doing my French lessons and all. I had an American uh, lawyer who, used to, who worked for the club who used to give me uh, lessons. So I'm doing my French lessons and that. And you just sound like a fucking idiot, don't you? Whenever you're speaking in a foreign language, in, in initially, you just sound like a, like a space cadet <laughs> to yourself. It's like when you first hear your voice. You don't sound like you sound mm -hmm. to yourself when you hear your voice record or you see an interview on the telly. You're like... What fucking, why am I talking in that voice for? It's like your, your ma or your nan used to have the phone voice, didn't they? They'd be screaming and shouting at you, the phone go, oh, hello, how, how are you? And you'd be like, you don't, you don't speak like that during the week. Um, so you'd have your, your, your press interviews. And as I say, I'm learning, like, I've got the basic understanding of French, but, you know, I, I can ask for something in the shop, but I can't have a conversation. So we're playing, I think, Fenerbahce away in the uh, Europa League, and I get put up for the press. So, um, it, it's a it's a European game, so you get Marseille's a massive club, like it, you know, it's the biggest club in France. It's like Man United in France, so Liverpool, it's it's that big, and the European games because it's the Turkish uh, champions or whatever it is, Fenerbahce. It's it's it, all these foreign journalists. So that the interpreter says to me before I go in, he goes, um, "Can you do me a favour, like with your strong regional dialect? Like, can you just speak a bit slower? Because it's I've got to translate." Firstly, from Scouse to English, and then from English to French, and then back the other way when, when we're doing it. So I'm like, yeah, mate, no problem. So I'm in this press conference, and it was like, a, um, you know, like about five, five rows of about five people. It's almost like a little mini cinema room. And in the back of it was my brother Andrew, my mate Splachy and Tagger, who were overstaying with me at, at the time. So I'm doing this presser, and I'm getting asked questions, and I'm answering and speaking slow and before I'd gone out there I'd seen Steve McLaren's interview I'd fucking laugh my head off laugh my bollocks off going what about fucking that silly cunt fucking Steve and all that you know the and I, so I was fully aware of like how much of an idiot you could look if you spoke in these broken <laughs> tones so I was like laughing going fucking as if I'd do that like I'm fucking way too switched on for that like buzzing off people six weeks later there I am fucking bollock chops thinking I've cracked it in this conference chatting away giving it all the va va and all that, thinking I'm like, I'm keep looking at this um, translator and he's going to me, just keeps doing this, keeps going. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I am fucking nailing this here, first presser. And every time I turn to this cunt, he's going, as if to say, like, you're on the money there. No one's batting an eyelid. And then after about 15, 20 minutes, like, I fucking, bad, I think I'm fucking, like, knocking all these questions out the park here, throwing a bit of French in there, you know, the odd word now, as if to show, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn the language. And then I just fucking look like that. And I can just see our kid. Our kid's got fucking big mad fucking hair, hasn't he? He's like me, hero hair. You can make rope out of our hair. So just see this fucking head going like this in the back. So I'm like, the fucking hell are these up to? So, you know, you try and answer the questions and you remain professional, but like out the corner of your eye, you can... Now, these are serial messes, James. Like, they're always fucking about. The, 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 you know, the, it could be anything that they find funny. They're never serious. So I'm like this anyway. After about... I'm, keep cutting like that. And there's fucking tears coming out their eyes. So I know, I'm like looking at them and they keep looking at me, but they can't look at me. They keep looking away and they're laughing the cocks off. So, and, and I've just had the real, no, you just have that realisation of, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm doing a fucking Steve McLaren here. So I've realised and, and I thought, I've just got to go with this. Like I might as well, I'm, I've made a cunt of it. So my, you know, for me, you've got to laugh at yourself if you, mm. if you make a bollocks of it. So I, I, I then start like 
tapping a bit on, as I say, these are just keep going in the background, going in the background. But the funniest thing about it was there's only the four of us in the room who were on it. Nobody, there's no English journalists in there. Nobody's aware of it. So when I come out of there, they're going, fucking hell, what was you up to? They sound like fucking a low, a low. So they're giving me the, I'm getting it tight. But I'm thinking that's contained to the room. I'm never, ever thinking that's going anywhere. So I'm thinking that's going to be Marseille TV and then fucking Moroccan TV or Algeria, whatever, and Marseille are big. And that'll be the end of that, you know. You know it's, 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 so I come out the room and I'm laughing and they're, they're going, they're saying, we're going to get onto your press officer to try and get the video because they want to show all my mates, go listen what this silly cunt's done and they're dead. And I'm going to the press officer, do not fucking give them that tape. So I think it's contained in that room. So anyway, playing the game, fucking get out. About two days later, my fucking phone just starts going off to you. I'm like, it's obviously, it's Sky Sports I News know. in England. And then the next day, <laughs> fucking history, lad. And then you just got to laugh, haven't you? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're just like, fucking hell, made the bollocks of that. It's a fucking yourself, preach, mate. Mate. I genuinely <laughs> thought I could understand yeah. French. Honestly. That's oh, class. Me. So Marseille, you end up, what was he running with Ibrahimovic? So that was in the game, obviously PSG, and, and again, you know, because you were doing, what are you doing, big well, fucking. Well, I had to mark that? him. So Zlatan's about six or four, isn't he? About he's eighteen stone. So he's yeah. a big unit, and and he's handy with it. I think he says he's karate and all karate that. Expert. He wouldn't want to dust up with him. Like he's he's a big unit, and I've only seen about four centre forwards in my lifetime who actually target the centre half. Usually in my world, the centre half tries to bully the centre forward and kick him out the game. But every now and again, you get like a Luis Suarez or an Alan Shearer or a Duncan Ferguson who actually goes at the start of the game looking for the centre-half to bully him. Well, we're playing, we're second in France and the um, Qatar money's just come into PSG the year I turn up. So you've got Thiago Silva, Zlatan, Motta, you know, all of the, the big hitters. Is Beckham there? Beckham came, yeah, Beckham came. In, um, all the big hitters are coming mm -hmm. and it wasn't them, but like they've got this incredible yeah, uh, spend in, in the last you know 12 months and Marseille are the historic club who's trying to keep pace with them and Leon there was three of us Saint Etienne and Leon us were going at it but we were close to them so I was banned for the first derby at the velodrome and Zlatan scored two fucking crackers and we drew 2-2 two -two. but I was in the stadium and I was I couldn't play I was playing in the Europa League but I was banned for the game and then as, as the season went they were about four or five points ahead of us but we had to play them in the cup Quarter final and in the league in the same week. So we're playing them in the cup on the Wednesday and it, the, the league on the Sunday and the cup on the uh, Wednesday. But that was the if, if they won, they were going, I think, eight or nine points clear of us with seven games to go. And if they beat us in the cup, obviously we were out the cup. So our season pretty much came down to that week. So we played them on the Sunday in, at their place and played fucking great. And they ended up scoring a, a spawny goal. And I think they beat us either 2 0 or 2 1. But we were right in the game. Good account of ourselves. But they beat us. And that was the league pretty much. It was, we, were at, we, we were then focusing on finishing mm -hmm. second rather than winning the title. It was like a six pointer. But then we had to play them on the Wednesday in the cup. But we had to play the same starting 11 virtually. And they made about eight changes. You know what I mean? Nine changes. And Beckham was one of them who came in. So in the first game in the league, um, Zlatan had gone and targeted Nicholas Nkulu, who was a great centre-half, Cameroonian boy. But he just, he, there was Sully Diawara and Nkulu, and Sully was a bit of a warrior, and Nico was the ball player, and Zlatan just pulled right onto him and just gone, fucking, he's getting it, and just started roughing him up. So from every goal kick then, I then get pulled down because he's dusting Nkulu. So I come the front screen then, so, I, so I'm like, listen, I'll fucking front screen him and stop him bullying our centre half. So I'm now front screening him and I'm just standing on his toes, pinching him. And he's massive compared to me. And every time he put his hands on me, I was diving on the floor and going, ah! And the ref kept giving a free kick and it was fucking doing his head in. So he, in the end, he's lost his shit with me because I've won about four free kicks off him now. And he's turned to me and gone, you fucking fanny, you fucking pussy. So he's, so I'm like, so I've, I know I've got him. So I'm laughing at him going, fuck off, you fucking dickhead. So he's going, I thought you were meant to be a fucking English, he, tough guy, he was saying, you're a fucking pussy, he was saying to me, right? So I've gone, shut up, you, you fucking big nose cunt. So I've just gone, fuck off, big nose. So we're just ding-donging like this, right? But it's like, it's like laughing. But he's, no one's ever called him a big nose cunt, clearly, because he fucking, 
he was shocked that it, that anyone had the audacity to say it to him because he was the king of Super France star. at the time. He was the king. I was like, fuck off, you fucking big nose cunt. I was going, you might be boss of footy, but your fucking nose is massive. So, and for a big ego maniac like that, his teammates started laughing at him, you know, like a few, like, and, and his head went. So he, you can see his argument. Now, completely unbeknown to me, they, they ended up beating us in the game. At the end of the game, the game had been on French, like BBC or ITV, and they zoomed in in the midst of the game, stopping, they'd zoomed in and captured that. Like, I didn't know that had happened. So when I come off, we'd lost the game. But my status within the Marseille fan base and with the football fan base in France, I, I, they just loved me because they, they didn't like Zlatan. And they just seen someone taking him on who was smaller than him. And it just endeared me to them. Do you know what I mean? I didn't know it. I didn't even know it was happening. I was just like, fuck you. I've never taken a backward step from anyone. Never mind you, you fucking big nose Swedish guns. So I ain't going to start now. And as I say, it, it just grew this arms and legs to the point where I go back to Marseille. Now I was there two weeks ago uh, to see some pals and people in the street walk past kids and going, hey, big no, like it's just nuts. They don't even remember the fucking game we've played with them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But they remember I took him on. And it's sad really because, you know, you want to be remembered for your footy and your playing, but also, it, you know. Uh, but that's what you're known for as well. Just, being, to be remembered, you know, that people fucking remember you is, you know. So if you're Marseille then, you, the fans love you, you're doing well there. What was the decision to leave? Well, I, I, I was I was going to, uh, so my first, I'd signed a four-year deal at QPR. QPR. I'd done the first year, we'd stayed up. Second year, I get loaned out to Marseille because I fell out with the manager in the 12 games and he wants me out of the club. In the midst of that, he gets sacked because they don't win a game and then they get relegated. So Harry Redknapp takes over in the January. QPR got relegated in that season. So I'm like, well, fuck you, because you wanted me out and look what look what you've won. I've just finished second in France. Uh, fans love me. Living in the south of France, it's fucking 30 degrees every day. You know, I'm treated like a like I'm a, 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 a god here. They want me here. They, uh, you know, I've not done anything great football-wise, but they just love me. I can't do any wrong. Fuck, if I'm going back to fucking England, fuck that. I've got two years left on this QPR contract, but they've just been relegated. There's no way they want me back because I've been throwing bombs at them from France going, I told you you were shit. I told you you shouldn't have got rid of me. News you were shit. I knew you had all maggots in your dressing room. Um, vocally on Twitter, which was probably a mistake in hindsight, but it's the impetuance of, of, of youth. Um, so I'm thinking there's no way I'm going back to QPR. Firstly, the salary I'm on, there's no way they can afford that in the championship. The bridge, bridge is burnt. The fans don't want me back. The manager, I've, I'm in the Champions League here. But Marseille could only pay half of my salary the next year. So I still had two years to go on my QPR deal. And I, I thought there'd be a natural negotiation to you know meet in the middle somewhere. And there wasn't. And then Tony Fernandez is going, this story's written for you, Joe. You can come back and and save the club from the ashes. This is you can. This is a redemption story. And I'm like Tony, look, fuck off. You fucking sided with Mark Hughes and emptied me out the club. You fucking made your bed. I'm playing in the Champions League. Yeah, va va voom. The French love me. You can stick QPR right up your ring piece. I'm away, and he just won't budge. So I'm, he's going. Well, if you want to leave, you have to cancel your contract. I'll let you go, but you have to cancel your contract. So. I done the math on it. For me to listen to the Champions League music and play in the Champions League for Marseille financially, you know, for, for for the money that was at stake, it wasn't worth. Um, you know, it wasn't my future. You know, decisions that you're making for your kids and their kids. I thought, you know what, it's not worth it. You know, Marseille. If Marseille really wanted me, did you know? Then they were going. And then in the interim, in between that gap, Marseille went and signed a load of players, and I didn't become the priority that I was at the start of the summer. And before I know it, Harry Redknapp had kind of convinced me and Tony Fernandez that getting QPR back to the Premier League would be a, a fairy tale, you know, a story. And Marseille kind of younger, more saleable assets at, at signed. And I think, you know, the the, the, the appetite to do the deal had, had waned on their side. So financially, they were never going to be at the level I needed them to be at. And then QPR dug the feet in. So I remember going and speaking to Ari and said, "Look, at this Marseille one's dead. It's, they've signed this midfielder now. It's it, you know I'm not going. What you know if you you're square with me, I fell out with the old manager. If you're square with me, I'll be square with you. I'll do everything I can if you bring me back into the first team. So he brought me back in, and the rest is history. That season finishes with us winning the playoff final. Bobby Zamora at, at Wembley, and, and I like to think if I wasn't there, there's no way that would have happened. What was that feeling? Uh, it was a moment of relief, mainly because of the club was in a, in, in a toxic position, um, and 
you know, myself and Phil Beard had, had pushed really hard to to get Harry to add Steve Steve Black to the to the off the field team, and and without Steve Black, that that wasn't possible. That team was not getting promoted that year. Uh, Black he came in and worked his genius and showed everybody what is capable if you've got a um, a strong mindset and and a desire to to be um, better than what you was the day before. And he 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 showed you know in football in terms of miracle to turn that group round. And you know we get promoted at the end of the season. You know Black he was without that. You know ten men in the final. Gary O'Neill sent off at half an hour to go. Hanging on by a Fred Bobby scores the goal, last kick of the game, and end, end the conversation. And we were getting battered with eleven men. Never mind when we had ten men. But it was Blackie's mantra and the way he'd done with the group that that without a shout, shadow of a doubt set the small details in, in in us getting the job done. That summer we go away and come back, and I'm thinking, okay, we can get cracking here. Back in the Prem, it's the last year of my deal at QPR, but we've got a chance to build on what Blackie's given us a good foundation. And Harry had gone away in the summer. You know, watch the World Cup where Van Aal had played in Brazil, uh, 2014, 16, was it? When was the Brazil World Cup? 14. Van Aal had played a five and got Holland to semi final final. Nigel de Jong, Alonso Tackle was the final. And Chile under, um, I think it was either, it might have been uh, Bielsa or the, the guy who came after him, it might have been Sam Poli, had played 3 4 3. So Harry had been away in the summer and come back and we'd been a 4-2-3-1 solid defence that we just about got up by the skin of our teeth. And Harry's coming back and we've signed Rio Ferdinand on a free and we're playing this back free and we've got Chilean wingers and we're going into the Prem, which is not a fucking a league if you're newly promoted that you want to be playing this open, expansive three at the back. And you stop listening to Blackie, she kind of thought he'd got us promoted, Harry, it was him almost whitewashed Blackie out of history of, of the of the club and then the club just got back into a shitty spot had he, had, had he resigned the day after the deadline had closed in the January or February February the 1st so left us up shit creek without a paddle because he didn't get the plays he wanted Chris Ramsey took over and we got relegated slow painful death and then that was tough to take because I kept my standard sky I was playing some good footy in a really bad team in a really bad environment and I thought the phone would ring at the end of the season and it didn't. You know, West Ham phoned and thought that was done and then the, 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 they backed out at the last minute. And then a sign for Burnley, you know, just late in the window and then had a fantastic year there, won, won the league, won their team of the year, had a great year there. And then came up to your neck of the woods, lad, came across Adrian's wall into the uh, the barbarian heartland that is uh, Glasgow and, and Scottish football. Yeah, what was the decision to join Rangers? Well, I'd, I'd spoken to Daishi at the end of the season and, and at that point I'd had lots of seasons where I'd been in the Premier League and it was just about staying in the league and finishing 16th or winning 10 games and drawing and I just thought, I've, I've got a little bit of a taste at Newcastle, at Marseille and QPR and now Burnley of winning and getting promoted and Rangers made this massive play at me first year back in Scottish Prem you know, the fellow who'd signed me at Burnley, Frank McPartland, had left halfway through the season to go and work with Mark Warburton at Rangers. And I just felt thought, do you know what? I had Celtic kits as a kid, but I'd, I'd love to play for Real Madrid or Barcelona. I'd love to play for Dortmund or Bayern Munich. I'd love to play for Porto, Benfica or Sport and Lisbon. So for me, to play for Rangers or Celtic as an anorak of football, even though... As a kid, I, I, I'm a Roman Catholic. Joseph Anthony, you know, went to St Agnes School and St Thomas of Becky. You were all every third kit I got was a Celtic kit. I always got Celtic's third kit at like Easter. You always ended up with a Celtic kit, and they were always decent kits. Umbro, you know, Peoples Ford, and um, you know, some of my mates ended up on Rangers kits, but we were always Celtic kits. So then, I'd always thought I'd play. I always thought I wouldn't mind having a go at Scottish footy, playing for either Rangers or Celtic. But I always thought I'd play for Celtic. And then, you know, as life comes at you, you know, win the league at Burnley, thinking I'm going to sign a new deal there. And then I love Daishi, and uh, I think I can speak about this now, but it's like it's Daishi's money that he spends, you know what I mean? And that's a good thing for a manager, but I knew what it cost to replace me. I'd done the math on it at that point. I'm 31. I've just come off probably, you know, the most consistent season I've had, team of the year. We've won the league. I think... You know, it was a productive environment for me. I had a good working relationship with the manager. It was it was just what I needed. I was settled. I was living back in the Northwest. Kids, family's great. And I spoke to him and he said, at the end of the season, we'd had a pint together and, and a curry. And he said, listen, I he started talking money and I don't like to talk money. I just said, look, just just when you speak to me, agent, ju, ju, 
you just sort it out. You know, you know, I don't really want to get involved in the nitty gritty. You pay me what you think's fair, and and I'll sign for it. So I go away thinking that's going to get done, and and in the midst of the next two weeks, there's again another Mexican standoff. They're disagreeing on figures, and and then cleverly Frank and Rangers stick the little wedge in there and go, come up, come up and look at this. So I go up to Glasgow. It's June. They fucking take me to Loch Lomond. Andy Black t- t- takes me to Loch Lomond. The sun's cracking the flags. Take me to Ibrox, show me the Sophie room, the pitch. I'm, take me to the training ground. I'm going, what a fucking club this is. Now, Burnley was a good club at the time, but it wasn't Glasgow Rangers. You know, the the impressive, you know, institution of football. That is Rangers and that is Celtic as well. You know, I know, I know your league's uh, different to ours, but still incredible respect from, from the football fraternity. And... And then I just thought, you know what? I fucking really fancy this. I, lo- I love me golf. And I thought, and they were saying, it's like this every day. Take no notice of the weather forecast. The fucking sun, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. They're like, it's like right, this every day. <laughs> so I know, yeah. But I thought, do you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a chance. It's history for Rangers. It's the first season back after the, 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 the problems they had. Um, even if you're shit in Scotland and you're Rangers, you're second or third. So you're going to be competing for trophies, chance of playing European football, which it was going to be difficult for me to do in England with Burnley, who were newly promoted back to the league. And Burnley hadn't, in the negotiation, really shown me as much love as I thought it was going to be shown. So th- there was a crack and Rangers stepped in it. And then I, I, I decided that, that that was my challenge. I weighed it up and everyone was going, you're fucking mad, giving up the Prem to go here. And I thought, you know what, this is a ballsy challenge like to, to overthrow Celtic and be the first Rangers side back in the top flight and, and, and winning a title. It's, it's a historic moment. And I thought it'd be great to be a part of, like it's a real underdog story. Um, so I've, I've, I've decided I'm going to do that. In the midst of that, Daishi gets wind of it. And because he's slightly different motivation to me, he's a little bit more more orientated he's then come over the top of it with a big an offer from Burnley thinking ah, that's the end of the Rangers one and he expected that to be a, a torpedo into the Rangers uh, transfer and I'm like no no I've, I've decided to go to Burnley uh, to go to Rangers he's like what do you mean he's like, we're offering you more money I'm like I, I don't do this for money Like, yeah, I made one decision for money to go from Newcastle to QPR and I swore for the rest of my existence that would be the last time I was ever um ever compromised by uh, financial uh, compensation and he couldn't believe it but mine and his relationship got stronger since because he presumed like everybody or normal people are that if someone offers you 10 grand a week more or 8 grand a week more you're fucking st- in, in, in the Premier League you're going to stay there but I was like no no I, I would have stayed for for that offer at the first go but now you, you've only offered that because a big club's come and my my eyelids have been turned and I really fancy this project. And, um, you know, it was a big moment for me because my little boy Cassius, he's 11 now, but he was starting school. So it was his first school. So he, he started school in, in Bears Den in Scotland and had like a little bit of a Glaswegian mm-hmm. accent going on. So it's not just uh, me who can pick up the languages really easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the genetics. Uh, so see when you're saying, obviously you cause fucking, everywhere you go, you always cause headlines, but you went, oh, Farmers League, Scott Brown, shite, you can't lace my boots. What was that then getting into the Parkhead game? So so I never I never actually said that when I went up there. Obviously, Rangers had been demoted to the to the bottom rung of professional was it league? Did they go to the third oh, division? Third league, man. So I remember Ali McCoyston and all that were there and they were really down in the doldrums. And as I say, I grew up watching, you know, more Celtic than Rangers. I was you know, if if, if Celtic played Rangers, I, w- I wanted the Celtic to win. You know, I didn't really invest mm-hmm. in it because I'm an Evertonian, but I would always um you know, out of the two, you know, AC Milan played Inter Milan. I always liked Inter Milan. Real Madrid, Barcelona. I always liked Barcelona. Um, so I, I get a chance to go up there. Obviously, Rangers' first season back in the top flight, and they'd lost in the Scottish Cup final to Hibs, but beating Celtic in the semi final, if you remember. So Ronnie Dahlia was the manager of Celtic, and obviously Celtic were in, were winning the league and the trophies, but they weren't in a great cycle. Um, so when I go up to Rangers, first year back for Rangers in the top flight, and coincides with Brendan Rodgers taking the job. So in the midst of doing the press, I've just won the league in England in the championship. I've had the the most consistent season I've had in terms of behaviour and process. I had Blackie in my life now, and Daisy was good influence and good group in the in the dressing room, team of the year. And I'm going up to Scotland. I'm like, 
I, I'm going to fucking show these cunts. Like, I, I'm, mainly, I'm going to build Rangers. You know, I'm going to. And at the time, you can't go into Rangers who were, who were first year in the thing. You was the marquee signing and go, oh, and Celtic, great, isn't Scott Gown, Brown? Great. I'm like, in Scotland, Rangers are doing well and Celtic are shit, or Celtic are doing well and Rangers are shit. The two can't cohabituate and, and both can't be doing well at the same time. It's just the country's just not geared on that. One's great and one's shite, and vice versa. In England, there's about nine teams that shared amongst. But in Scotland, the real focus is on the old firm. You know, Hibs, Hart, Aberdeen, etc. But Celtic and Rangers caught most of it. So if I turn up and I'm saying, I'm just here to, oh, I, you know, I just go under the radar. And and that's not me as a personality. And I'm also like, you know, with the greatest respect to Scott, and I've managed against him. You know, he took the job uh, Fleetwood that I'd been there. And, you know, in terms of, if, if you're an elite level player in Scotland, you have to come south. To it, prove your worth. Barry Ferguson, you know, Graeme Souness, I could keep going back. You, you, no leash. matter what, it's the same way the Welsh, they can't stay and play in the Welsh Premier League. You can't. The yeah, Irish can't stay and play for Shamrock Rovers. Northern Irish can't stay and play for Linfield. You've got to come here. The same way in the 80s, our players had to go to Italy or to Spain or to Germany because they weren't seen as the, 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 uh, the hardest challenge. You know, if you want to be a top fighter now, you've got to go to UFC. Bellator, Cage Warriors, one championship, etc. But you want to be the fucking top man and remembered forever. The UFC is where you need to be at. And for me, the Premier League in my era of football is where you need to be at. So if you're anyone who fucking anyone and you think you can mix it with the big boys and you see Patrick Vieira and Roy Keane and Paul Scholes and Machalele and Lampard, Gerrard and all these, that's just a name but a few. And you sit and look in the window at that knowing you could be in that room, then for me, you're a shit bag, like, you're a shite bag. Now, Barry Ferguson, to be fair to him, was the king of Scotland. Barry was the king of Scotland. King of Rangers, that's his club, captain. And to be fair to him, he had the bollocks to come down. He didn't move to Man United or Liverpool or one of those clubs that maybe his ability was befitting of. He had to go and sign for Blackburn Rovers. Then he went to Birmingham City. And I think he won a League Cup. And I think he went back north of the border, maybe not being as good as what he thought he was going to be down here. You know, kind of Graham Sooners category. But I think he certainly went back up there and thought, you know what, I've had a fucking right go. I've captain Rangers, I've won everything I can win at my boy club and I've gone down south of the border and had a right go. And I don't know. I just look at them lads like a Scott. And I've had a pint with Scott, as I say. You know, we've laughed about what went on in Scotland and he's a good fella. He's not a bad fella. A great saving for Celtic Football Club. And I said to him, like, I just, I had no respect for you. If you just fight Bellator, you don't come UFC. I think you're a fanny. Why not come fucking <laughs> UFC? You know what I mean? That's fair enough. Logic, yeah, yeah. You know I mean? so, so. so that was my mindset. And, yeah. and then when I turn up there, I'm like, I'm not coming here to take part. I'm coming here for, to win the title. Brendan's gone in and... He smashed that, to be fair. I, I think Brendan's a, a chameleon. So Br Brendan is brilliant, but there's a sell-by date on him. And, you know, oh, I, yeah. I don't he, want to talk said, badly yeah, on no, but, but he, he says he's going to be here for another three years. But if he gets an offer for a fucking... Um, Saudi Arabia, he'd be off in a heartbeat. But again, you know, they went up there and Celtic, and to be fair to them, Brownie, and uh, I think they had some good lads there, and young, young Callum McGregor, who I think is a good player. Yeah, he's a good captain. Uh, the boy who went to Arsenal, Tierney, you know, the, the, Roger, they had a good little... And Brendan going in, I think, because of what had happened with Ronnie Dahlia, I think Brendan going in had got Celtic standards raised massively. So we were going in... Rangers with a, a championship in Scotland team that thought it was better because it beaten Celtic in the semi-final but it was the, probably a bad version of Celtic under Ronnie Dahlia Brendan had come in and standards had gone north and to be fair to him did he win treble treble or something yeah, free treble. he absolutely smashed its head in and I think the likes of Scott and all that maybe their career and, uh, and time at Celtic was not as professional as what it could have been under Ronnie Dahlia and I think me signing for Rangers and coinciding with Brendan coming in, I think it put a few of them lads on notice. And to be fair to Celtic, they, they got some good players in there and and made the players they already had better. And, they, you know, Brendan's uh, coaching quality, they never fucking looked back, did they? What was the old firm game like for you? The, the uh, atmosphere? Do you, do you know, do you know it, was a, it was a strange one in terms of, I, I'd been moaning at stuff in-house. And, you know, we've had my time Straight again. away? And, yeah, because standards were just poor. Like, now, I went up and I was... I was a little bit behind in terms of my own fitness, so you're a bit frustrated with yourself when you when you when you're looking for your own fitness. And because I'd had such a good season, and I barely by the end everyone listened to me. If I said it was something, they'd go fucking hell, he's moaning, but he's usually right. And I went up to Rangers, and I had no credibility in the dressing room, Why? and and I just 
because I'd not done anything at Rangers and I just start fucking moaning at them. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, and you've yeah. got your Taverniers and Lee Wallace and new lads who've been there, settled for a bit. And I'm just turning up going, we well, don't do that, that shit, don't do that, that's not going to work. But I'm saying that because that's not going to work in the Premier League. That doesn't mean to say it won't work against fucking Dundee or Dundee United. It probably does. And if you're Rangers, you get away with bad habits until you face Celtic or until you face a decent side in, in European competition. So when I get up there, I'm criticising everything straight away out the gate going, that's not good enough, this not good enough. But, so instantly, the, you don't you get people's you don't get people's support because you're just criticising everything. Whether it's just or not, you're just seen as a fucking moaning cunt. So I actually got off on the wrong foot because I was moaning at people and, and I made a huge mistake there. A uh, valuable life lesson. We then get into the nitty gritty of it and all the stuff that I was moaning about not being at the correct intensity and not being the correct way, you know, the way we defended set plays, the way we trained, etc. Didn't really rear their head because you're beating Dundee and you're drawing with some, you know, you're not getting beat. But the seventh or eighth game we were playing Celtic at Celtic Park. So I've been moaning and moaning and moaning in the background anyway. We get to Celtic Park and I've been there kind of two months now, two, two and a bit months. And I just was like, what the fuck have I done signing here? These are fucking miles away, like they're just miles away. And I can't change them all. And I'm moaning. I'm getting more and more frustrated, which is making me even more of a moaning cunt. And it's alienating me further and further from the lads who I need to affect. So we're playing the old firm. And we've done the team shape on uh, Friday. I think it's a Sunday 12.30 kickoff. So the Friday we do the team shape. And me and Andy Halliday are playing centre mid. And I think Nico Crankyar's in the 10. And it's 4 5 one, And... You know, it's a little bit more of a defensive structure and we've got our plan and, and that's the manager's uh, prerogative. And, you know, then we get to the hotel. We think we're staying in Mar Hall on, on the Saturday for the game. And I always remember this, uh, James, because I was sitting with uh, Lee Wallace, Kenny Miller, Andy Halliday. We were all like mad rangers. They're just boss lads, good lads. Love football. So I used to just take it, you know, I, I find it, like when I was saying to you about the air and makeup, I find it's funny just to wind people up, you know, just say mad things and then not say anything so they don't actually know what, where they, so I'd say like, I'd just, just to noise the lads up just for the conversation at the table, I'd say, who do you think the best player in the world is? And they'd go, you know, fucking Ronaldo or Messi or, and I'd go, and they'd, they'd all give the names and then they'd go, in the end, they'd go, who do you think it is? And I'd go like, Thomas Muller. And they'd go, what? I'd go, Fucking Thomas Muller, most goals in the World Cup, and I just, just so pissed, and they'd all be arguing. What are you fuck? I go well better than Messi, just, and I didn't believe it, but it was just to fucking noise them up, just so they're all taking the bait on it. So I always remember being in the hotel, and I always remember winding Kenny Miller up that night about saying Thomas Muller's the best player in the world. He scored the most goals at the World Cup. Was my logic? He's got the, you know, he's, he's more than. Um, um, I was, uh, and the other argument was making was Marislav closest, better than like somebody else because he scored more World Cup goals. Anyway, the Scottish lads in there, Kenny Mill and that, they're absolutely losing the shit. And then from nowhere, Andy Halliday's been part of it and he just goes quiet. So we're all sitting at the table, he just goes quiet and then gets off. Like, then he comes back and you can see he's fucking like upset. And he's, he's a proper staunch kid and he's a good kid. So I'm like, fucking, you're thinking someone in the family or, you know, so he's had some bad news. So he's like, then, then it gets. Out that the manager's changed the team, but he's text Andy to tell him he's not in the team for the old firm Saturday mo or Sunday morning. So I'm, he's never done this. So I'm like, what? What the fuck's this? We're playing the biggest game of the season. He's done the teamwork and he's fucking shit himself and changed the team Saturday night. And he hasn't had the bollocks to pull the kid one on one. He's text him and he's gone. And he's a mad Rangers fan, mad Rangers family. But that's upset the other lads who were quite close to him. So I'm like, fucking hell. Anyway, sleep it off, get up the next day. Warburton's like the leader and he's not the leader. Like I'm like, he's just, his ass is gone. So I'm, I think he's a jag anyway, based on his training sessions and what's been done. But I've had to sit on it because I'm thinking, none of the, I just keep moaning at everything. Everyone thinks I'm a cunt. Like I'm just literally moaning at everything. So I'm like Victor Meldrew and I'm thinking like, just, but I'm, I'm thinking a few things need to go wrong here before they finally go, listen, you were right there, can you fix it? And I'd have gone, yeah, happily. I was, you know, you almost have to, it's like watching your kids fuck stuff up before you fix it. You almost have to allow it to unfold. And in football terms, I'm watching this unfold. I'm going, this is just heading for, like, have they not learned the lessons from the Scottish Cup final? I'd identified by the games I'd watched that they had a weakness for conceding goals from set plays. They'd, they'd conceded two in the Scottish Cup final against Hibs, lost the game on it. And he had, I think, 14 or 16 
instances in, in, in the games that I'd watch where set plays were a huge problem. So I'm getting in thinking, right, first protocol, set plays are dead easy. It's a set piece. You just get organised from, from the start. Um, don't We don't do that here. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, we, we don't do set plays here. We don't practice set plays. And I'm like, well, you fucking shit at them. You lost a Scottish Cup final on them. Why? Yeah, we don't do that here. That's not, that's not what we do. So that's not a good enough answer for me because I'm going, well, I've worked for... Boom, boom, boom! In the Premier League for the last fucking twelve years, I've been on the continents, and this must this must be this mad football club where you're the only football club that doesn't have to fucking practice set plays. And lo and behold, you're absolutely useless at defending them. Can you not understand the correlation? Like sometimes in football, you forget that rep- it's a repetition sport. So if you keep repeating your action with personal mm-hmm. practice, you improve and get better at it. From a team perspective, the more you drill stuff, the the the, the better you get at it. But Mark Warburton, who is Rangers manager at the time, managed Brentford. But whilst I was playing in the Premier League and becoming a footballer and experience in the arena and the, and the challenge of that, he was working as a banker in the city. So, you know, I give I give everyone the respect of the due, but it, for me, I live a life of meritocracy. If you act like a cunt, I treat you um, bespokely towards that. Now, if you act really um, competently and you show your worth on a daily basis, then I treat you exactly... A, life isn't... You just treat everyone great. That's It's not possible. You treat people how, how, how they treat you or, or how they interact with the world. And if I see someone grafting and putting the work in, I go above and beyond to help them. If I see someone slacking or fucking not doing the work, I'll either ignore them or give them a kick yeah. up the ass. That's that's the nature. Yeah. So Rangers then, you've ended up leaving then. What happened with the gambling? Was, it, was that Rangers, wasn't it? So it, it's, it's an interesting one, this. And I've not, I don't think I've said this publicly. So the Rangers one for me was, as I say, I've been saying stuff that was going to go wrong. Team changes. I'm in the dressing room at Celtic Park and... You know, you walk the gauntlet out the stadium like like first old for him and it's hostile. It's you know at this time there was still I think we had fifteen hundred, two thousand fans in it. Now they've they've closed the away yeah, fans 600. off, which is shite, yeah. stupid. Well, None, no fans now, well, yeah. Well at, the, at this point there was still a bit of a crowd mm-hmm. in. So we're at Celta Park and um I remember doing a warm up and that and I said to you, I knew I was ready. Well I'll just go back to my debut and I told you the team's name that turned to foul and I'm, I'm is that my name? I go out for the warm up. My ass is gone. The hero and the coward. I'm shitting myself. Do the warm up. I'm all over the gaff in the warm up. It's not, you know, your touch is not quite right. Everything you're doing, you're getting away with it. But like, you know, you're just not in sync. This is at, uh, the Reebok for my debut, and I, I, I go up the tunnel, and my ass is still going like a fucking butterflies and that. <sighs> Can I swim here? Like this is the fucking. This is sink or swim. This is match of the day tonight. This is goals on Sunday in the morning. This is all the papers. This isn't like the reserves are hide. Like this is the fucking real deal here. Yeah, like this is everything you've worked for, and you're only going to get the one chance. Me half fella ringing round my head, and I remember going up the tunnel after the warm up, nervous, and I remember sitting in the dressing room, and I just remember thinking, "You've worked your co- your cock off to be here. Everyone who sacrificed for you to be here." You've done the training, you're having cut a corner, you're having fucking large, that you haven't been in the nightclubs. If you're ever, ever going to be prepared for this, you're prepared. So just fucking trust yourself when you get out there. And a calmness just descended on me in the tunnel. This is five to ten to three. I just remember looking around and going, fucking, there's Robbie Fowler who grew up watching this, Steve Machmel. I just remember this calmness. And I remember going out in the tunnel and just being cold, like cold clinical. And I speak to people about it and I'm like, that's the moment you know whether you're fucking built for the fucking proper stuff or not. Like when you know when the chaos is there and you're you're going cooler, calmer, more calculated, people usually speed up in that or and I just remember the 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 feeling no one could ever pay me for. Like I'm a 20-year-old boy who doesn't know what's about to come, who's who work for this moment, and just the calmness of knowing I've done the work, I'm as I'm as capable of being here as everybody because I've paid me dues, I've paid the rent and I can't wait to get out here and perform. And as I say, I went into the first team there and I never came out. I, ne- I never came out. I stayed in there till uh, the Celtic um, the Celtic mob grasped me up with the betting accounts, which was Paddy Power um, in Scotland. And then obviously got a one game ban in Scotland, an 18 month ban in England, reduced to nine. So, so how that played out was and I'll come back now, dressing rooms. So I'm crystal clear, calm, making my debut in the Premier League at 20. When I'm in the dressing room at Celtic Park for the old firm, looking around me thinking, standards, you know, not where they need to be. 
watching Mark Warburton. I'm, I, I'm an observer, like I speak a lot, but I also watch a lot. I don't miss much of it. I have an illness that I fucking spot everything. Do you know what I mean? When you see someone acting a cunt in school and, and before you know it, three weeks later, he's, he's someone trying his hand. I seen it three weeks before and I'm like, I should have nipped that in the bud there. I've always had this incredible ability to predict the future because I'm very observant. Um, so sit and watching, feel frustrated at Rangers, but I think I can change it. I'd almost left just before the deadline when they said I had to sign Lescott. I put my body in front of Lescott for the football club, mainly because I knew he weren't good enough. He'd grasped on me in the uh, FA thing and I knew a physio who'd had him at West Brom and I spoke to the physio and he said his knees are dust, don't sign him. And I'd relayed this up the food chain and I said to Warburton, I'm not sharing a dressing room with him, so if you sign him, I'm off. Dead straight forward, but let me know because he's a fucking grass and I don't play with grasses and he's a prick. So, and that was it. I'd probably get on with him fine now, but at that moment in time, that's where I was at with Julian. Um, so Warburton goes, I'm not have a player dictating to me who I'm signing, I'm not signing. I'm not saying, I'm not saying, sign him, don't sign him. That's up to you. But if you sign him, I'm out. Dead straight forward. Now I've been up to Scotland. I'm going to be the best player in Scotland. I'm the marquee signing. So this was the 30th or 29th of uh, September. The deadline is 31st. In the midst of that, Sean Dice just phoned me and said, look, come back to Burnley. It's not working. Get yourself back down here. You're right back in. You shouldn't have gone. Like Our relationship's grown stronger for the fact that I walked away. And because mm. I walked away, I never uh, took the financial. His respect for me, I think, grew because he thought, fucking hell, he's a man of principle. Him, like, fair enough, I'll have that. He hasn't, he hasn't signed for the money or been uh, thrown by the money. So he's phoning me saying, come back. You know, Warb he, he'd actually said to me, Warburton's not for you. He said, he, he, he's not your type of character. You don't, and he was right. He was right on that. And I thought that was because he selfishly wanted me to stay at Burnley, make his job easier, do you know what I mean? Um, and, and then I get up there and, as I say, I'm in the dressing room at Celta Park. I've watched loads of things and he's walking around doing the team talk. I knew the thing that had gone on with Andy Halliday and he's in his suit and Rangers, you travel away in suit, shirt and tie. And he's shaking like a shit and dog, his hand's shaking almost like he's got like Parkinson's or a, a motor neurons disease or something like he's fucking shaking. And I just remember fucking thinking, how am I going into battle for you, you cunt? You're a fucking fanny. Your ass has gone here. You fucking shit yourself on the team. Your fucking standards are shit and your ass has gone here. And I just remember thinking, I'm going to have to go out here and I'm getting my ass handed to me. I knew I'd said I'm going to be the best player in Scotland and now I'm getting, I'm just going to get covered in egg and if we get beat here, I'm getting it. And for being a braggish, um, a bragging English cunt coming north of the border saying you're going to be the fucking main man, this is, I'm getting me licks here and I'm going to have to take it like a man. So I've decided as we're going out, I thought it's going to be tough this game, but I'm not going to get sent off. My standard's going to be sky high and win, lose or draw. Everyone on this pitch is going gonna, is gonna to know and respect me after the game. Because all he wanted, I think, was for me to do something mad and get sent off. That was the narrative. So it was like this tinderbox, this powder keg was building between me and Brownie. You know, the, the, the famous thing with the handshake and that. And I'd looked him in the eyes, but they'd waited until I'd, I'd moved past it and looked down. They were going, look, he hasn't even got the bollocks. Look him in the eye. Look, I'll level with you. If Scott wants to fucking walk in, and you can ask Scott himself, we had a bit of a laugh, as I said, in the dressing room. I think he's had a great career and he was a great player. There was no there was no me and Scott Brown. You know, Rangers and Celtic Football Club are bigger than Joey Barton and Scott Brown. This was Rangers and Celtic being back on the table, north of the border, which is, for me, the Scottish League for the first time. Because Rangers, I don't know what went on, but you you don't want... If, you, if you're Scottish football and you demote Rangers to the third division, you ruin your own product. They ruin the game in Scotland by doing that. You know, the football clubs cook the books. Of course they do. All our big clubs do here. Look at all the... Now, you need incredible lawyers to stop you, you know, as some of the big clubs in our country are fine. Now, if you've got the best lawyers, then you don't get any problems. Rangers at the time was a bit of a mess. And it should have been about Rangers and Celtic, but they wanted to make it about the protagonists in the middle of that, which was me and Scott Brown. Game gets played. We're right in the game. He's got the wrong team selection. We're right in the game. We end up losing. I think we're two one down. Phil Sendros, who we, I don't think he should have played. Phil, he wasn't fit enough, and he dropped early for Phil. Phil Sendros gets sent off, jumps and missed times. Ed and balls it. We're down to ten men, and they score three one. Not long afterwards, I end up playing middle centre back of a back three with James Tavernia right side centre back and Lee Wallace left side centre back. Both can't defend for Toffee. Both fantastic going forward, really good attacking fullbacks, but fucking hell, the, the defensive uh, 
um, qualities that they severely lack. And I'm definitely not a middle centre back um, against Moussa Dembele. So the game ends up finishing and we're right in the game at 2 1, a 3 1. They end up scoring a fourth and fifth quite late, but that's our back three. We, you know, we're down to 10 and we lose 5 1. And, and at the end of the game, I walk around. I thought, now nah, you fucking come up giving it the big and you have to fucking take your fucking licks as a, as a man. I fucking clapped all the fans, shook every one of the Celtic players' hands, told them well done, looked every single one of them in the face, especially Scott, went fucking well done. And I thought, right, that's ground zero now. Now the fucking work begins. Now the venture to put Rangers back on the top of Scottish footy begins. You've had your come up and stay. So the game finishes, that's Sunday night. All my mates are up for the old firm. They all want to go out in Glasgow on the ale. I'm like, I'm not going out anyway. I'm not showing my face in public. We'd be fucking 5 1. Fucking not going out. So they're all out and about. I fucked them all off. Monday, we're off. Um, oh, sorry, Monday, we're back in training. So I'm thinking, right, we need to get in Monday because the job starts here. You know, that's the first game I've lost in Scotland. I only lost one game in Scotland. That was it. All the other games, I had a one or, or, or drawn. I only played seven or eight. I think that was the eighth game. So I come in on the, on the Monday, thinking, all right, right, enough's gone wrong now. Now we can get cracking. Now the, we don't do that here. Excuse has got to wash because we've conceded the goals from set plays in this game. So we'll come in Monday morning. Mark and Davey Weir were notorious for like every game you played, they'd have an hour, an hour and 15 minutes debriefing the game. Played fucking Cowden and Beef in the cup or Peterhead, an hour and 15 minutes, all the good and bad things that you've done. That was like, you know, that, that's their way of coaching. So we'll come in on the Monday morning thinking, right, we're going to get a nitty gritty. First defeat, but it's going to be blood blood, guts and fucking all the, all the gore. But we need it because if you want to overthrow Celtic, you know, that's the team you've got to beat. And we've just been fucking shellacked by them in the first encounter. That's the first game after the semi-final where they beat them, where they thought they had the number again. Brendan's in town, not Ronnie Dahlia. So we realise at this point, fucking hell, this is a different entity. This Celtic team is, is, is under a different steam. Come in on the Monday, no meeting. All right, so there's no meeting. Right, that's weird. That's the first time that's happened. So it's almost like the biggest, biggest defeat we've had. They just pretended that it hasn't happened. Get out to train. Andy Halliday's not happy that he has, has he's been left out of the team. He came on in the game, but he came on with like 20 mi minutes ago or something like that. So he's fuming. So the training on the Monday morning, James, at Rangers Football Club was the best training I was ever involved in the morning after that old firm because people were fucking angry. Proud footballers were really angry about how their football team had performed and the scorn that comes on yeah, in that country if you lose an old firm. And training was at the level I was used to in England because you'd have to train at or above match intensity. You can't train below it and expect to turn on on a match day. You might get away with that for a fucking two, three month period. But at the level we play at, you've got to be on it all the fucking time. So we play that game and um, get in. The training's right on the edge. It's like you've been involved in them sessions where there's a few tackles flying around, but it's fucking right on the edge where it's a good, hard session. Both teams are going at it. But like if the shitbags in the group are on notice going, fucking hell, this is one tackle away from a, f a fisty cuffs. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was right on that edge where the best teams, that, best teams I'd trained in, the uh, best teams I'd played in and been involved in knew and respected that little space. If it bubbles over it, a few years have to pull that back in and get in the middle of it. If it goes under it, a few years have to moan at each other or fucking kick off to get it back in that zone. But it was right in... It, it, was, it was this Mark Warburton fucking academy fucking nonsense stuff that we've been doing, passing off mannequins, centre ass overlapping and putting crosses in fucking academy, you know, nonsense. Uh, now it was hopefully going to be uh, gone. We're saying it properly. And the manager, Warburton didn't like it and stops the session halfway through because me and Andy are having it. Andy's on the opposite team and he's pissed off he hasn't been in the team and I'm on the other team and we're going at it and there's a few players on our team who are getting dragged along in it but me and him are really going hell for leather and the manager's arse goes because he thinks it's going to kick off. Now me and Andy had a great working relationship I really respect him I think he's a great kid cared a lot about the football club and I spent a bit of time with him away from the football arena because he's, he's into his music and his fashion. He's a, he's a good lad. I've met him a few times in Dubai since with his missus. He's a cracker. So we're sound. We, we, we know it's getting tasty, but it, there's no like, it's not going to boil over. Manager stops the session and goes, right lads, we're going to do shooting on the edge of the box here. So goes down and I've, I've gone here. I'm like, what the fuck's this nonsense? So now you've got Clint Hill taking a touch on the edge of the box and having a shot. Someone's fizzing it out to him. That's just nonsense. And I've just walked in. 
I just, I just kept, I didn't even, I walked down to the session, what he was doing, and I just kept walking. I just went, this is a load of shit. This is a waste of my time. And just started walking in. And if you, if you, if you've been to the ground at Rangers, yeah. so the staff thing's on the second floor. So as I'm walking in, Frank McPartland, who's, who's signed me, is looking out the balcony and I've just gone, this manager is a fucking clown. And I've just walked in, gone into the dressing room, started getting changed and I'm about to just go up. So I'm getting changed. The lads have stayed out doing this shooting session. And fucking Davey Weir walks in after about 15 minutes and goes to me, um, manager wants to see you upstairs. So I'm like, why? He's gone uh, He's not happy the way you've uh, spoken and uh, the way you spoke to other players and... Uh, he wants an apology off you. Uh, he wants to see you upstairs in his office now. So I'm like, I, I respect Davey because Davey played for Everton um, under Moyes, you know, so I respected Davey's career and he's a good fella, Davey. I went, Davey, listen, I need to go home here. That, that's, it's not good for me to go upstairs because I, I think I'm going to fucking say what a, what a feel here. And he's gone, no, no, he, want, he wants to see you. I'm like, no problem. So at this point, like I've had enough, I'm, I'm checking out. Like, and it's I, I can't play for this cunt. Like, I can't play for this manager. It's, he's not for me. So, go upstairs. This is, as I say, the um, the Monday or the Tuesday after the thing. Go upstairs and go in. He go. So it's me, Davy, and and Warb's in the office. And he goes, yeah, sit down. So I'm sitting across the table. He goes, hey, I think you need to apologise to the players. So I'm like, what for? Uh, the way you spoke, the way you've spoken to people in recent weeks, the way you think, oh, it's, it's not acceptable. I said, well, look, I'm not going to apologise to the, to the other players. Uh, well, I think you should. Well, uh, Mark, I've just told you I'm not going to do that, so are you going to force me to do it? He's gone, no. I've gone, well, uh, well, it's not happening then. Uh, I don't think I should apologise. I'm trying to raise standards. I want the team to be better. I'm, I've come here to win leagues. I'm the only person here who would think of playing the Premier League today. There's no one else in this team and there's no one, none of you could coach in the Prem, otherwise you'd be there. I've given up playing in the Prem to come and help Rangers get back to the top and all I've seen is, and that's it then, I've opened up subpar standards and I said to him, look Mark, with the greatest respect to you, I've been doing this since I've been consciously aware. You went off in, in, in your teenage years and your senior years, your 20s and your 30s to work in the banking industry in, in London. And with the greatest respect to you, I've probably forgotten more about football than you're ever likely to know. Like, this is my vocation. This is what I do, professional football. So when I'm telling you to do stuff that I know works in the Premier League environment and you're turning around saying to me, we don't do that here, that doesn't fucking cut with me because I'm out there in the arena. Like, sat Sunday, I'm out there getting my arse handed to me in front of 60,000 at Celtic Park and then getting ridiculed by the old fucking country. And the reason that's happening is because your training habits and the way you set your teams up uh, 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 ineffective and inefficient so if you don't fucking like that tough shit but I can't leave because the deadline's passed I can't register for another club until uh, the 1st of January so I'm trapped here do I want to play for you? absolutely fucking not because I don't think you know what you're doing but I'm here so what, how do you want this to play out? I've just joined Loch Lomond so if you want you can just fuck me off and I'll just play golf at Loch Lomond every day but I've come here to be a success and we're now uh in, incompatible he says a few things back I end, end up getting after him a bit more and in his credit Davey Weir fucking stepped up and tried to save Warps Warps just put his hands in his head and just stuck his hands on the table because I gave it to him that tight and he had nowhere to go and to be fair to Davey and I'll always respect Davey off the back of it Davey said to me well, who the fuck have you played for what fucking career have you had because Warps was getting it tight for not having a career now when you come for someone like me you better fucking be Wikipedia because before I, atta before I attack you or have an argument with you, I usually download you. So I'll have gone online and I've looked on your Mars Facebook account. I'll have seen all your cousins. I come armed. You know, I never go to a fucking brawl unless I've got, um, you know, some, some solutions. Some solutions. So Davey, Davey pipes up. He says, who the fuck have you played for? What career have you had? I said, shut the fuck up, you. I said, you've, you, you're a centre-half. I said, you didn't even come through the system. I said, you went out to America and collegiate football and then backdoored and you didn't come get to England until you were 28. I said, and then if you remember where you turned up, Everton, I'm an Evertonian. He's played 5 4, four, four one You never fucking moved off the 18-yard line in fucking four years at Everton. So don't talk about playing central midfield. Central midfielders, as you know, think we're the best players because we have to have 360-degree view of the football pitch where, for me, goalkeepers are last pick in school. Changed a bit in the modern era. Defenders are limited midfielders who actually can't, aren't good defenders are midfielders 
who aren't good enough to play midfield. So you go fucking right back or left back, you have your right or left footed. If you're ugly and you head the ball and you don't mind the, the rough and tumble, send it off. Uh, if you're a shitbag, sweeper, and you'd have a big area to go and do your scrapping. But centre mids have to do everything. Forwards then at the flash, flash Aries, quick, score loads of goals, get all the money, get all the bids. Uh, wingers are uh, f- not good enough to score goals and play as forwards <laughs> and not brave enough to play centre mid and 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 um, a little bit more skillful than the fullbacks. So football for me is a dead simple game. It's the same as the school playgrounds so where me and Davey are having it. And as I say, we have a bit of a ding-dong. He comes over the top. And as I say, I've got enormous respect for Davey. Um, but at that point, what's coming out your mouth and that's your manager and assistant manager, I know there's no way I can take back that stuff. And what I'm saying is quite personal to him. And I know... I can just feel, you know, when you see your bridge just getting burns in front of you. So I'm like, but there's no way I can continue. This relationship is now untenable. So I leave the training ground that day. Um, and I'm thinking, all right, me and the manager have had a full ding dong. He knows what I'm thinking. I fucking give it to him tight. By the way, they give it to me as well. You know, we've we've had a war of words. But where I'm from, my culture, that's that's a that's a cleaning, that's a cleansing, that's a right, we move on now, we move past this, there's no grudges, right? Men and men, we've had our words and we move forward. And I come out of that and he suspends me. All right. So he suspends me from the training ground warburton for four days while there's a club investigation based on what I've said in this office. So Richard Goff and a few senior people in the club, John Gregg. For, so I just tell them what I said. I've said this is what I've said. I just thought I went, this is exactly what I've said. So you can see them going. And he's like half not wrong here. So I've just owned up to it. Then I get a phone call on the f- Friday or Saturday to say, and it's Warburton phones my agent and says, listen, you're not going to believe this. In the midst of me suspending him from the club and this going on, the Scottish FA have contacted us and we've had our allegations. He's got a betting account and, and they need to investigate it. So Warbs then, in the midst of me being off with the suspension, phones me on this. So I'm thinking, a fucking Rangers throw me under the book here, under the bus. So as it turns out, we played Celtic, lost 5-1. Celtic, if you remember, played on the Wednesday or Tuesday night in the Camp Nou against Barcelona. And I knew Celtic was shit based on our traction with them. Even though they beat us, the game was quite close. The sending off massively changed it. And we were massively underprepared and it wasn't much in the game. They were better than us. No, they were ahead of us, but there wasn't loads in it. There wasn't certainly as much as what people felt. Then they were playing Barcelona. So I've gone to all my mates, listen, this Celtic team is bang average. They're not as good as what they are because once I've had a scrap with you or played against you, I'm very good at nullifying you the next time now because I go, all right, that's what he's good at, right? Don't do that. Quite scheming in that way. And play the game and go, all right, Celtic are ahead of us, but it's not insurmountable. We'll get to them, but there's loads of work to be done anyway. I realise Monday, Tuesday with Warps, it's not happening. Then I get the phone call Friday, I think it was, that the betting thing. Unbeknown to me, me being me, I've told all my mates, I've said, Celtic are shite. They're playing Barcelona. I said, they'll get pumped. So you had the over two and a half, over three and a half, over four and a half, over five and a half goals on the Beth Fair Paddy Power markets. So I've said, lump, lump Celtic to get pumped by Barca. Anyway, I think Celtic beat, uh, Barca beat them 7-0 or 7-1 in the Camp Nou. And obviously I'd, I'd had a bet on Barca on all the over goals and told all my mates to. Bear in mind, this was Paddy Power who... I'd had a working relationship with Paddy Power for years where I'd been paid in betting account tokens and to, to you know, to do stuff for them, speaking for them, you know, I'd, me and Paddy Power was the Rainbow Laces campaign. Mm-hmm. Me, Stonewall and Paddy Power started that and obviously it's pe- been picked up by the Premier League now. So I've had these bets on Celtic, Paddy Power. And, and when I think back to it, I sound like a bit of a conspiracy theorist here, but before I signed for Rangers, or after just after I'd signed for Rangers, I played in the BMW at Wentworth, PGA, and I got sat on a table with Dermot Desmond and JP, who I think were major Celtic men. And they were feeling me out in terms of, you know, who's this cocky little cunt? Who they fucking... So I end up sitting with them. And then I go, to, I go to Rangers, I have this bet, and I've had this betting account for, say, eight years. And... There's a whistleblower in Paddy Power who's a Celtic fan. And, you know, I'm like, so for me, I'm like, fucking grass and bastard. <laughs> like, who doesn't have a footy coupon? It's not like we were fixing games, you know, we're having a footy coupon. Like, just seeing the lad there, Tanali, like, you know, I grew up in a betting shop, betting on horses, and Rangers will beat Celtic, or Manuel will beat Liverpool, or Everton will beat, you know. A coupon, for me, was... 
a, what a Saturday afternoon's footy was about. Getting up, your granddad, he'd go to, you know, fly around the betting shop, your granddad would come in with the mirror, mirror reader, and he'd have a couple of betting slips and he'd, he'd be writing his horses out and his footy coupon. And you'd add like your free aways or your, you know, that, that, the that pools for me, it was. The, and you're checking in on teletext, you're like that. Do you ever remember the one you used to have like a stamp and stamp? Or the, the, the pools, yeah, well, that's the Liverpool, ball, Little Woods missed, pool. Missed yeah, the ball. Yeah. Well, it was the fucking spot the ball or something. Well, you used that was to have. more to raise money, when they all spot the ball yeah. where you peeled it off. Yeah. So I grew up in all of that. But as I say, you know, pitch and toss at school, you know, I weren't really into cards. I wasn't really a card player. I never like played cards on the coaches and all that. But Game of head tennis for a fiver, game of table tennis for a fiver, game of FIFA for a f like I I I if I play anything with you, I have to compete. There has to be a bet on it. So I play golf for a fiver. I play at the same intensity I would in the playoff final. I swear, like I swear, like I'm, I'm trying to win as much as I would be trying to win a playoff final if I'm playing for a five or a tenner in a, in, on, on, a, on a Saturday or a Sunday on a golf course. Because I just love competing. And and it's not about the money. It's a more it's more about the challenge of whatever the discipline is you're doing it in. Whether it's snooker, pool, golf, tennis, fucking love all sports, but specifically football. And I owned and had lots of interest in racehorses. And in the racehorse world, I could bet on my horses to win. I couldn't bet on my horses to lose. I could also bet on horses that I had information. I had my mates with jockeys and riding them, or trainers I knew. But I couldn't back my horse to lose in the race, which is makes sense. So you don't want. In football, we went from an era where we could bet on everything when I first started. When I first opened my bet fair, Paddy Power accounts, you could bet on anything. And then they went, right, you can't bet on matches in your league. Now you can't bet on matches in, if you're in the cup and, and that's even if you've been knocked out, then they, you can't bet on anything. So the, 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 the regulation was slowly ratcheted up over the course of my career. But I just kept having a coupon in the background. You know, I've got a five-team accumulator on a Saturday in France, Italy, Germany. What the fuck's that got to do with me? I'm playing in fucking England. And it, it'd been unchecked. And I knew all the lads in the dressing room, everyone was at it. So, and then everyone's getting sponsored by gambling things. We're all getting uh, money off gambling. They used to come to us every finger and say, here's a thousand pound betting tokens if you open an account with us or there's five, grand, you know. So it's like, it's not like we're taking performance and answering drugs. All right, you, they frown upon it, but they're not really going to ban us for having a footy coupon. Fucking lo and behold. You know, the, due to the, the the you know the the draconian rule sets, they fucking the, you know Tenali's gonna miss a year's footy here for what for having a fucking coupon. What did you oh, get? I got eighteen months. I got one match in Scotland. They banned me. The Scottish FA were great, and the Scottish FA because I left Rangers after it. Never ever thought I was gonna go back to Hamden and turn up for the for the investigation. And I remember turning up with my lawyers, and they were fucking delighted I turned up, mainly because I gave them the kudos to go, no, no, you you have you have given me the charge, and I'm not gonna disrespect you by going, fuck Scotland, I'm never going back there. I turned up and went, you know, fair cop, I have had the betting account. I explained it to them, and they gave me one match. I went to England and you know, I'm Jesse James, aren't I, in the FA's eyes, even though I'm a proud Englishman who wants England to do well, you know. The FA, for whatever reason, want me out of the game. They want me out, say and died. If they could, they'd get rid of me because I say things that they don't necessarily like hearing. You know, so when they banned me for the gambling, I wrote an article with a good pal of mine, Alistair Campbell, and, and took a bit of advice off a few people who know who, who, who are creative. And I wrote, wrote um, an article which forced the FA to relinquish the as they were banning me for 18 months, they had a 12 million pound a season sponsorship for the England team with Ladbrokes. So I'm like, you fucking joking. Like, how can you, how can you be so draconian in one hand and yet you're in bed with betting companies and you've got all, I'm like, it makes no sense. If gambling's no good for everybody and we're not allowed to bet, otherwise you're banning us for that long, we'll stop everybody. Stop the kiosk being at a football stadium, stop the advertisement and, you, like fair enough if I'm taking performance enhancing drugs you know I, I failed a nandrolone or an anabolic steroid test I get listen get him out the game he's at it for having a fucking football coupon you know fuck's sake like what was it like retiring well I didn't really retire did I so I got banned for that 18 months so in the midst of what was it like so I got a year yeah. in Scotland signed for Burnley went back to Burnley trained with Burnley November December played again for Burnley first game back I scored against Southampton um, was this after the ban? No, I didn't get. I got banned in Scotland for the game, but yeah, I only lands in Scotland. Oh, the so English you FA is still investigating. Oh, right, right, I right. come back to England, play mm -hmm. as I'm playing. I have to face it in about the and it's going, it's getting uh, protracted, it's dragging mm -hmm. on in about the April. 
I've got to go down to the FA, I go down, do a full day there. I think that's my last game. The game before, as it was, the FA have put off the year in, so I can manage to play on the Sunday against Man United. So I play against Man United. I think we lose two one. I should have took Anthony Marshall out, broke on a corner, and I and I thought I'll get to him. I could have whipped him up and took a yellow card, but I thought I'll catch him. And didn't realise how fast the fucker was. He fucking accelerated away. So my last memory, my last regret is I should have fucking tripped him up. He ends up breaking, passes to Rooney, and Rooney scores. We end up losing the game 2 0. And in the midst of that, the FA come back. I thought I was going to get six months, three months. You know, if I had a footy coupon, they're like fivers and tenors. You know, it's nonsense. They knew it weren't, they weren't match fixing or fucking throwing games. They knew it weren't fucking spot betting or any of that. They knew it was a lad who had a footy coupon. Me 10,000 footy bets or whatever were mixed in with. 10,000 tennis bets, Formula One, because I'm an avid sports fan. I, I'm a footballer with a disposable income. I finish work at half two. I'm coming in. I love me horse racing. I love me tennis. I love me golf. I love me sport. I'm single. I'm sitting on the couch and I go, I'm going to have a 50 quid on that horse, I fucking you talk to say. I'm going to have uh, 50 quid on Leeds to be Castleford in the rugby league tonight. Not for any other reason. And I just love, I'm watching sports anyway and I'd rather have a bit of vested interest on it. They had all my accounts. I gave them every account he had. Pros, tallies, pros and cons. I think I'd lost about over my 12-year, 14-year cycle or whatever. I think I was down 15 grand. You know, I'd put, say, 400 grand's worth of bets on. I was 15 grand down. So I hadn't even... Like, it's just a lad having a punt. Mm -hmm. You know, casual better. Um, and they fucking absolutely threw the kitchen sink at me. Like, they gave me a, an 18-month ban. And at 33, that was like a death blow for me. They knew what they were doing. On re on appeal, it was reduced to nine because no banner. They never. They were outside the precedent. Since I've been a manager, they've they tried to get. They've you know with the Stendhal incident, they've they've helped the police in investigations, which the FA should never be doing. Uh, they've hacked our computers when we were at Fleetwood. Tried to accuse us of being racist on a couple of occasions. So there's this. Uh, thing in the FA that wants me out the game which is fine and I may well be out the game what they don't understand is I'm way more dangerous to them out the game than they am in it in it they can control what I say out of it if I go onto YouTube or in the podcast space and bear in mind I've done the podcast I've done one series eight podcasts and it was number one on iTunes I decided it wasn't for me that because I need to build stuff like I'd love to do what you do I'm naturally inquisitive I can sit and talk all day but football's my real passion, James. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like I'm, I can do loads of other things, but nothing turns me on mm. and gets me at it than being in a football team. What's it like being a manager? Uh, it, it's for me. If you can't play, you know, playing's the best. There's nothing better than playing. You know, you only have to look after yourself. It, you, you know, you, you're the master of your own destiny in, in many, many regards. And you know, as a, as a manager. You're reliant upon everybody else. You've got to get, you know, it's not about you. It doesn't matter how good you are. It's a ma it, 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 it's what you can get people to do for you. You know, you, you've got to inspire or, or motivate or uh, find, you know, the keys to unlock human beings to get them to do the best for themselves. You know, get them out their own way lots of the time. Um, but again, I, I think my skill set, as, as mad as my life journey's been, it's probably prepared me more to excel in this space than it did as a player. Now, it'll take me a period of time and I still don't know whether management, re I, I sometimes think, am I going to be a manager? Because when I look at, a great indicator of future performance for me is always past performance. So I'm an avid historian. Like I really enjoy geography and history and certainly history to, to figure out what's going to happen in the future. I think you need to understand what's, what's happened in the past and, um, even at school, they were my two favourite topics outside of PE. Like I was always fascinated with them. Um, and then the next one was English language and English English literature. I always excelled in uh, I just naturally without even revising. I, I had two Bs in GCSEs and you know got ten GCSEs without even fucking thinking really. And I was most of the time after them lessons, I was building my World Eleven football team or South American footy team or. Italian best of Serie A you know that's all we did and drawing footy kits and planning what kits they'd wear and whether it was Nike or Adidas who'd be the sponsor and what stadium we'd play in and, and then going home and playing championship manager and, and then EA Sports brought FIFA out and playing that and then in the street playing with your mates and then going to footy coaching and football 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 and then Sky Sports it's the telly and match of the day and all like just football everywhere 
And then you realise, fuck me, you can get paid a few million quid to do this. When I started playing, I had to play for nothing. I remember sitting in a science lesson thinking, reading in the paper that someone was getting paid 10 grand a week and going, fucking hell, how do you even spend that? Not knowing anything about tax, national insurance, uh, cost of living. Yeah. I'm just like, how? And then thinking with your mates going, imagine you're making, you get paid 10 grand a week. What would you spend yours on? And then you'd get the Argos catalogue out and you were going, right, I'd have that, I'd have that. You know, just go, it was, mm. that was the dream. You could just open the Argos and just get whatever you wanted if you made it as a player. What's your greatest moment as a football player? Uh, I think playing for England, you know, to walk, to, to pull on your national team's jersey and, and know that for that moment, you're in the best 11 in the country. Even if it's because the lad who was the best is fucking tired now and he's coming off after 70 minutes. At that moment... You're the best in in the country at what you set out to do. What's your biggest regret? Um, biggest regret? I don't. I don't really have one. You know, if I'm honest with you, I don't. I just I move through life just like I don't really stay too long in achievement or mistake. I just think like, like even if you've been excellent here this challenge in front of you, the next day, the next challenge, you know. So that's why when I went into the AA and went into the anger management and I, and I went into the AA meetings, the powerless, something where you're powerless over something was big for me because I was a big megalomaniac in terms of this world rotated around me when I was younger. And you're on that hero's journey of being a player and getting off a council state and all the pitfalls of that. And you create this me against the world mindset and then you have kids and then you do a bit of your kind of psychological work on yourself, with, you know, with sport and chance, Peter Kay. And it opens up a different, you know, chain of thought in your mind. And f for me, you know, there's loads of things you regret. And you could, I, can, I, can, I could be here going back to being eight and punching someone in the face on the playground. And I think I fucking shouldn't have done that. You know, it was a bit quick to go to guns there. and um, Or, you know, a, a million different things I can think of. You know, kicking someone in a fucking fishing pond, you know, with the fishing gear. Or just being a bully as a kid, you know, a 10-year-old. And, um, you know, maybe a tackle where we're losing in the game and I've done a tackle and someone's end up rolling their ankle or breaking their ankle who's a good lad and uh, you know I've not really meant to do it but so th there's a there's a million different things I, I would go back and change but also all of those ups downs and everything in between make sure who you are yeah. um, and I and I do believe you'd have to make a number of mistakes some people have to make more mistakes than others before they get the shit together some people don't have to make many mistakes and everyone's different what's your you biggest know? life lesson you've learned been on this planet I thought you or oh, jeers. I, I I think for me, James, it's the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. So the the more intelligent you get, you know, you get this thing where you think you know everything, and then when you truly meet people and you and you truly um, let go of that ego, you realise you don't know fucking much. And, you know, <laughs> I'm still you, at that fucking you're stage. You're just learning all the time. So for me, like I, life fascinates me. Like there's so much I don't know, and so much to know. And people intrigue me. Like that's when I was talking to you in the car. I'm desperate to talk to you and say, "What the fuck?" I, I had loads of questions for you. Do you know what I mean? I was going to ask you loads of questions, but I thought you need to switch the seats, right, mate? So, again. so for me, that like other people fascinate me, and I, and 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 I think it's because I believe, and and this is just my life experience. As I say, the best footballer I ever seen, the most talented finisher of a football I have ever saw on this planet. That includes. Nicholas and Elke, Robbie Fowler, Andy Cole, Michael Owen, Al, like everyone I've seen up close and personal who I've played with, Andre Pierre Gignac in Marseille, Laura Gretley, was, was Paul Taylor, and Paul Taylor stuck the ice axe in Anthony, uh, Anthony Walker's head and killed him because at 13, 14 and 15, he got into robbing cars and smoking and taking drugs and being up to no good, and he didn't have people around him to keep him on a straight and narrow. Steve Highway was the Liverpool Academy director, and he used to bring this kid in when he was 12, 13 and 14 in the school holidays to, to be at Liverpool's training ground when the first team were there to keep him out of trouble because he knew he was that talented, but he knew he was from a mad um, family background. And he, he emptied the boot room. So when all the first team were out training, he went in the boot room. After about the fourth day, he told his mates, 
off the estate, listen, there's this lamppost and he went in and he just fucking threw all the boots over the first team players, boots over the thing. They've come in, like, where's all the boots gone? He's like, I don't know. And he, he's the best thief I've ever seen as well. Just seen him walk in shops, just pick stuff up and walk out. Like, incredible thief. Um, I, have you ever seen a proper proper shoplifter? I used to do like, shoplifting myself. Proper, proper one? Yeah, see. Like, it's incredible. Yeah, it's like, it's fast, like, it's like a ghost. Yeah, I've done like it back in the so, day, mate. So this kid was like that. He was big for his age, as I say. He was two or three years younger than us and used to jo join in with us. And we were at clubs and he was way better than us. Like, he used to join in with us and not bis miss a beat. 12, 13, 14. And then just fucking fell in with the wrong crowd. And then started, like, doing stupid shit to that cool. And he was a game cunt, like. And he could fight like fuck, do you know what I mean? He was a good size. And just that nonsense, that bollocks became cooler than the footy and he didn't have anyone around him just to pull him like I had me nan my nan just was there to keep me on the straight and narrow my arm fell out of my a little bit but more so my nan and you know he'll never get out of jail him he's got a 23 wreck 25 wreck for killing he's not done any of the stuff you need to get he might never get out he's ruined other people's lives he could have been the best striker we've ever seen in this country he was that good James and I like you know talent when you see it like he was that good like ev everything that you need. And, I, and then I watched, like everyone told me Robbie Fowler strikes the best ball everyone's ever seen with the left foot, purest finisher. And Rob was incredible. But he never, he never hit them as clean as this fella. He had an unerring accuracy, whatever he hit. No, they used to just stick in the stanchion. Mm. No, no, like remember the old net? They used to just stick and he did like exocet missiles. And the, the amount of times I've seen him jam it in the stanchion where the ball stuck. Almost like Beppe Signori. Do you remember Giuseppe Signori? Mm. Or like Zola was right-footed, but he reminded me of Signori, the way, like his left foot. And usually people with a great left peg, they have a shite right peg, but the left foot can be like a wand. This was beyond that. And as I say, I, I look at that, and this is why I always believe everyone's capable of brilliance. You've got to get to people at a young age sometimes. For some people, when the darkness descends, there's no coming back. You know, and, and I think prison and, and society is littered with that. But I do think lots of people do have the ability to change. They either meet a fucking good mate who stands on them or they meet a, a wife who takes them or they meet somebody along the journey, a boss at work, someone a little bit older than them. And, and I think males massively benefit from having a fucking male mentor that they can look up to to go, do you know what, I respect you, you cunt, yeah. you're a cool bastard and I'll fucking listen to you because you've lived a good life. I can tell by your, your face and your conversation and... You can stop me making some of the mistakes and give me a few shortcuts in life. And I've been lucky. I met Peter Kay when I was 23, 24. Changed my life incredibly. Incredible man. He passed away when I was 28, 29. And six weeks later, I met Steve Black. And if I'd have met Black, he had 19. I'd have, I think I'd have captained England. Like, I don't think anything would have stopped me because the mindset and the, and the behavioural patterns and the way he was, like, he just couldn't have helped being an, an incredible uh, uh exponents of whatever potential you had. He just, he, he made you believe you could be the best in the world. Not just like bullshit, not like Nanny Pammy. He'd explain it to you and, and then because he'd give you it in common sense, you were like, oh, actually, yeah, I, 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 sh I actually should be able to do that. Like, not like, that's not for me. And, and I say to you, I travel through the world. Now, even when I see homeless people and wrote a column for the big issue, etc., I always stop and talk to them and buy one off them because I'd, I'd, I'd written for them. And, how, what, how's your day been? And, and, you know, they might go, they might take that money and go and have a fucking suit or whatever, but that's not my bag. It's not my problem. That still doesn't mean I can't have a civil conversation with them, smile up and say, how are you? And have, and just be civil for 15 seconds. It's not hard to do. Yeah. And in the world we live in, that's lost because people are more interested in whether you click for a like or... Yeah, it's crazy. You know, it's backwards. Where do you go forward for the future, Joey? What uh, if you get planned? I, I don't know. I'm like you. I, I, I don't really, I don't really chart the course. I'm just like, you know, life's good. Life's you know, you've got your head, your head on you. Got good people around you. I've got a good, good family, good friends. Um, I work in a in an industry I want to work in. It, it annoys me from time to time because, you know, I'm one of the few people who is a master as his craft in terms of time spent. And you know, people turn up and tell me how to do my job better. Like it's you know, I don't turn up to an electrician and say you fucking plug. You could have done that better. But my industry, everyone knows, a better team selection. <laughs> Or a better pass I should have played, or a sh uh, you know, you know, you know. So, but on the flip side of that, we get compensated there uh, fantastically well financially to to do a, a hobby because that's what football is. You know, if you'd have said to me as a as a kid on on the council state in St John's at twelve, listen, you're going to be a footballer, 
and you're going to be doing a podcast with James English at 41 and we're going to give you 100,000 pound for those 20 odd years I'd have gone fucking sign me up wow 100 yeah I love that now obviously it, it's paid me back in, in, a, in a completely different space to that and you know m- my true call and I think now is to, to help people not make the mistakes I've made so that I, th- I think we've got to, you're, you're the same you've got to help put good cunts in the world now if they're your kids that's easy because you love them and they're there and that's, that's your job but also what, wouldn't it be great like if you could do that for other people as well like Steve Black done for me and Peter Kay done for me and countless others and great youth youth workers I had in the community centres on St John's Estate Dave Cuddy when I was a kid who'd get all the kids in the minibus and go come on and fucking take news to white man damn canoeing because he knew if we stayed on the estate we'd be fucking robbing cars or getting in mischief and he'd give up his Thursday or his his his, his uh, Tuesday uh, evenings to take us for a game of table tennis or a game of five a side or to a footy tournament to, just to keep us out of trouble was he getting any fucking dough for it no but he he knew this, these kids are fucking good kids and if I, if I showed them a different way hopefully a few of them will turn yeah. out alright some turned out doing you know half of that group is killing killing and murdered or been killed selling drugs and half of that group some of the lads have got out and had a go and if it isn't for these great examples or good examples People think everyone's got where they've got on a shortcut or that they're mega talented. Nobody's fucking mega talented. Everybody's a prime uh, total of the work that they put in on a daily basis. You want to be the best stamp collector in the world? You fucking can be. It's easier now in the modern world to be a world-class person because you've got these smartphones, you go on YouTube, now you've got a global audience. When I was a kid, you only had the morning papers and the local fucking paper that came round. There was no fucking social media or YouTube or you want to be the best. If I want to I get into gardening, I'm dead. I'll go through phases where I'm into Ray Mears for like six months and I'll buy fucking all gardening, um, all hunting stuff and be in the back garden trying to make a fucking fire out of a fucking splint and all that. Do you know what I mean? I'm just like dead inquisitive. I, just, I, need, to, I need to understand stuff. Do you know what I mean? Or how to like catch rabbits in snares. And I went through a, a, a space. My missus is like, oh, there's another phase you're going through. <coughs> where I'm thinking about breeding like peregrine falcons and getting an aviary in the back garden. She's like, oh, don't, don't, this is another six month fad or a year fad that you're going through where you get into something, you know, jujitsu, whatever it is I get into because my mind's very active and I need it to be uh, working all the time. Otherwise it gets into stuff that is not productive. You know, I can very easily Mm -hmm. with my addictive personality get into uh, stuff that's bad for you. So I have to constantly focus it on stuff that I know is beneficial for me as a person or people close to yeah. me. So we'll get into um, these little, these these different spaces where, and, and I got it from George Harrison, like my granddad's Beatle, favourite Beatle, you know, everyone's Paul or um, John. My granddad's favourite Beatle was George Harrison. And he, you know, my granddad, I was lucky, got me into kind of Bob Dylan, I used to have Bob Dylan on tapes, you know, Desire and... Um, all the old albums, like, so, I, you know, grew up and, you know, you forget how influential pop stars and sports people are. You know, Mama Dali and, as I said to you before, Custom Art, like, there's such a, an eclectic version of these influential people all around us. And, you know, my granddad, George Harrison, and, and he said, people are always telling you not to change and, you know, the Beatles are arguably going to be the biggest thing that's ever come out of Liverpool ever no matter who comes afterwards no one's going to be the Beatles and George's approach was when people say you're fucking changed that's a badge of honour you should try to change as much as you possibly can to be a completely different version of the person that you was you know add all these different tools to your toolkit if you can speak a foreign language fucking speak it as you've seen with me <laughs> but, <parlez-vous français. laughs> but you know what I mean like yeah. people say don't try and play the piano don't do that. Don't like they're always telling you, like my careers advisor, you fucking can't. I'm like, fuck off, who are you? Fucking working in a yeah. fucking council estate. For anybody watching Joey who's maybe want to be something in life, footballer, artist, tennis player, what advice would you have for them? Work at it all the time. Work at it absolutely all the time. Like make it the pure reason that you exist. You know, you you can't half ass elite performance. If you're want to be a footballer because you're going to get a Lamborghini and you're going to get a load of page free beds and a load of money stuffed in your pocket, you won't get there. You, you, when the tough 
moments come and the injuries and the loss of form and the setbacks and the shit nights and you've got to get your ass off the couch or your mates are going out because there's a 17, 18, 19 year old bird babysitting and there's a party and there's a bit of Charlie knocking about. And if you don't love the game and you aren't there for its purest reasons, that, that, that bad wolf, that voice will, that'll be, that'll be loud enough to, to capture your attention. If you truly want to be something and you set your goal to it, like the world is, it, for me, it's never been simpler to be an elite level performer in the world. If you want to be a podcaster, you can become the best in the world. You know, whether you're from Glasgow or fucking Los Angeles, you know, if you want to be a stamp collector, if you, 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 you want to collect fucking action figures or Comic-Con, like it's just there for you now. There's no excuse. If I want to learn, as I said to you, getting into garden or I go, right, I need to plant this tree. YouTube, bam, bam, bum. Right, now, now within 15 minutes, after watching a tutorial, a video, I can find Monty Don. And before you know it, I know how to plant uh, a, a tree, like an expert. I couldn't do that when I was a kid. I had to go to the library, check in, get a book, read the book, come back home, try and apply that. Now, you've got an, an encyclopedia, a library at your fingertips. Um, don't listen to anyone. All these people who tell you what to do and, 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 and who to be and how to behave, fucking, who, 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 who are they? Like, you've got to be your, yourself. You know the difference, right and wrong. You know when you've done something that's wrong. You know when you've, you've cheated yourself, which is the worst thing. Um, and if you're prepared to cheat yourself, well, you're going to cheat every other cunt around you because if you fucking let yourself down, you have to... I always say, and I, I, I remember, there's two things that happened to me, James, where, where uh, I, my mindset just flipped over. Like, COVID was huge for me in terms of... I, I studied, as I say, history. I always thought, how did the Nazis end up doing what they've done? And COVID made me realise very easily, like, just to see how people behaved and what they got up to. I was like, fucking hell, I didn't think we could do this, but we are crackpots. And then, as I say, you grow up with, you know, the, the things that happen to you and you end up just being a pariah by, you know, behavioural patterns or, yeah, he's a bad guy, he's a bad, you know, bad actor in the, in the, in the showbiz nonsense of football. And, um, and then what happens is, from a distance, naturally, I wanted to fit in. I wanted the papers to like me. I wanted the people to like me because we all do. I want to be in with the in crowd, but I'm not allowed in. So I'm over here. And in the end... You observe them and you think, they're fucking nuts. Who wants to be well thought of or well liked by these? They're all fucking nonsense, pretty much. They, you know, they've all been Harry, but, you know, up to no good or, you know, the, the, the veil of their nice guy exterior has, has been lifted. And I'm sitting over here just laughing my bollocks off going, fucking hell, who, who wants any part of that? And again, all these people... Um, are these people who are exonerating that they've never made a mistake and that they're this perfect person and that they're family people. And I'm like, my experience of life is everybody's flawed. Um, everybody's talented, brilliant in the same thing. And it's your job, not their job to tell you. It's your job to find out. It's like a treasure hunt with every person. Now, if that's your mindset, think of how many good treasures you're going to uh, find on your journey. If your mindset is you're the man and you're better than everyone and everyone's a silly cunt and you're just fucking, you're just jockeying to have them off at some point or fucking, you know, get in a position of power and be their boss, then life's tough. Life's, life's really hard. And I, there were two things that happened to me. I'd, there'd been an episode and I'm getting the fucking down the banks from everybody and, you know, they're, they're fucking calling for me to be lynched in the Tower of London because I fucking told someone to fuck off or give someone a fucking crack or something, you know, the, the hysteria that goes with being a footballer. And I was walking my dog through uh, a graveyard. So I remember walking through the, this graveyard and I'm reading the headstones and it was like, Brian Smith died age 62, love and father, love and husband, but boom, goes to the next grave, fucking Rita fucking Johnson or whatever. And it was love and mother, love and left by. So after about a 74th gravestone I read, I just remember thinking, where do all the cunts get buried? Because everyone in here is fucking sound, love and father, love and husband, and the world as I know it, there's loads of pricks. Most people are fucking pricks rather than sound. <laughs> so is there a separate graveyard for them? Where did, where did they get buried? Where did they go? And then it had the thing of people only remember you, either you want to remember you either favourably or, you know, and then 
within two generations, no country remembers you, no put no one puts fucking flowers on your grave. You know, their kids' kids look at you on a photograph and you know, the, the, you, you as a thing, you, you're all, all your medals and all, your, it's gone. No one gives a fuck. No one cares. Now, if you've done a great job and you've, you've done the right thing, you'll still be having an impact on them people. Them children will be getting an education or have principles or have behavioral patterns in their life that you instilled through, through force of nature in your life that your kids wants to be like you and their kids want to be like them, which is a, in essence, the, the key you get, a, you, you get, a, for, you live forever. Great people live forever. Steve Black will live on forever through me. Peter Kay will live on forever through me. And I will impart my wisdom on everyone I meet to say, these were great men. This is what they taught me. So they, in essence, by being a good cunt, not, not the billions, by being a good cunt, you live on forever. You can probably remember the people who had a huge influence on you as a kid. You can't remember what they've said, or, but they, you can remember how they made you feel. That might be someone just having your back, a teacher, maybe not fucking coming down on you like a ton of bricks that he could. And make, you know, I had Mr. Mitchell in our school. He just, he just let me off a little bit. He, he understood I was a bit of a toll rag, but I had a good heart and he'd give me a bit of a joggy. And I can't ever remember anything that I'd done, but I remember thinking, he's fucking all right, him. And, and in his lessons, I give him way more than I give any of the teachers because I thought he was all right. And Black used to always say to me, people can't remember um, anything other than how you made them feel. Like I think back now to games I've played in, managers, coaches, I can't remember them, but I can remember certain things that happened and how it made me feel. And, and the reason that is, is adrenaline and, and that nervousness tattoos stuff in your mind. Yeah, definitely. So you can't forget it. Yeah, Joy Boy, listen, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on today, brother. I think that's one of my longest podcasts. I've been fucking four hours. Is, uh, would you like to finish up on anything? No, mate, I've really enjoyed it. As I say, I think I could sit, I'd love to sit and ask you a few questions. Yeah, anytime, man. Anytime, yeah, listen. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable career, like I say, you've, you've been fucking hounded by the press. And listen, rightly so with some of the shit you've done, but you're still doing it, mate. You've changed your life. You're trying to see the world differently. You're trying to educate people as well. It's a beautiful thing, but would you like to finish up on anything? No, mate, I really appreciate it. But it's, as I say, you've you've um, you've been smacking the head and I've been watching you growing from a distance, honestly. like I felt like I've known you for a long time in terms of I'm going, go on, lad, and then I see your guests. <laughs> I go, go on. Yeah. And again, you know, for me, I, I, I always... I'll always listen to a podcast about 20, 30 minutes. I'll put it on a timer, especially when I'm in Bristol and I'm not with my wife. I'll bang a podcast on and I'll fall asleep to it. I used to do that as a kid with the telly, but I do it with a podcast now. And honestly, the amount of guests you have, I'll go through it. I go, how the fuck's he ended up with fucking mm -hmm. this fella? David Eich, I'm like, how's he ended up there? And then Gaza yeah. and like, uh, keep smacking the head ah, in, lad. It's boss to, to see. Honestly, All the best really for the future, mate. And I look forward ah, to see what man. you do.